It is noon on D-Day. Twelve hours have passed since the invasion began with the airborne assault. Twelve hours of constant action on and near the coast of Normandy. At noon, Winston Churchill gives a long address to the House of Commons, summing up the situation so far. I have also to announce to the House that during the night and the early hours of this morning, the first of the series of landings in force upon the European continent has taken place. In this case, the liberating assault fell upon the coast of France. An immense armada of upwards of 4,000 ships, together with several thousand smaller craft, crossed the channel. Massed airborne landings have been successfully effected behind the enemy lines, and landings on the beaches are proceeding at various points at the present time. The fire of the shore batteries has been largely quelled. The obstacles that were constructed in the sea have not proved so difficult as was apprehended. The Anglo-American allies are sustained by about 11,000 first-line aircraft, which can be drawn upon as may be needed for the purposes of this battle. I cannot, of course, commit myself to any particular details. Reports are coming in in rapid succession. So far, the commanders who are engaged report that everything is proceeding according to plan. And what a plan. This vast operation is undoubtedly the most complicated and difficult that has ever taken place. It involves tides, wind, waves, visibility, both from the air and the sea standpoint, and the combined employment of land, air, and sea forces in the highest degree of intimacy and in contact with conditions which could not and cannot be fully foreseen. There are already hopes that actual tactical surprise has been attained, and we hope to furnish the enemy with a succession of surprises during the course of the fighting. The battle that has now begun will grow constantly in scale and in intensity for many weeks to come, and I shall not attempt to speculate upon its course. This I may say, however, complete unity prevails throughout the Allied armies. There is a brotherhood in arms between us and our friends of the United States. There is complete confidence in the Supreme Commander, General Eisenhower, and his lieutenants, and also in the commander of the Expeditionary Force, General Montgomery. The ardor and spirit of the troops, as I saw myself embarking in these last few days, was splendid to witness. Nothing that equipment, science, or forethought could do has been neglected, and the whole process of opening this great new front will be pursued with the utmost resolution both by the commanders and by the United States and British governments whom they serve. Later in the day, he will add more current information. I have been at the centers where the latest information is received, and I can state to the House that this operation is proceeding in a thoroughly satisfactory manner. Many dangers and difficulties which at this time last night appeared extremely formidable are behind us. The passage of the sea has been made with far less loss than we apprehended. The resistance of the batteries has been greatly weakened by the bombing of the Air Force, and the superior bombardment of our ships quickly reduced their fire to dimensions which did not affect the problem. The landings of the troops on a broad front, both British and American, Allied troops, I will not give lists of all the different nationalities they represent, but the landings along the whole front have been effective, and our troops have penetrated, in some cases, several miles inland. Lodgements exist on a broad front. The outstanding feature has been the landings of the airborne troops, which were on a scale far larger than anything that has been seen so far in the world. These landings took place with extremely little loss and with great accuracy. Particular anxiety attached to them because the conditions of light prevailing in the very limited period of dawn, just before the dawn, the conditions of visibility made all the difference. Indeed, there might have been something happening at the last minute which would have prevented airborne troops from playing their part. A very great degree of risk had to be taken in respect of the weather. But General Eisenhower's courage is equal to all the necessary decisions that have to be taken in these extremely difficult and uncontrollable matters. The airborne troops are well established, and the landings and the follow-ups are all proceeding with much less loss, very much less than we expected. Fighting is in progress at various points. We captured various bridges which were of importance and which were not blown up. There is even fighting proceeding in the town of Khan, inland. But all this, although a very valuable first step, A vital and essential first step gives no indication of what may be the course of the battle in the next days and weeks, because the enemy will now probably endeavor to concentrate on this area, and in that event, heavy fighting will soon begin and will continue without end as we can push troops in and he can bring other troops up. It is, therefore, a most serious time that we enter upon, 
Thank God we enter upon it with our great allies all in good heart and all in good friendship. That's a fairly good summary of the general activity. Yeah, but it doesn't say much about the people actually living in France, though. You know, civilians, the resistance. I guess, though, the Churchill doesn't have a whole lot of information about what's going on with them today. But the British have had the SOE working in France, and they've sure been doing stuff leading up to today. But what about today itself? Well, there's a lot to talk about. After the terrible losses that the Special Operations Executive, or SOE, suffered at the hands of German forces in 1943, it looked as though the embryonic force of saboteurs, guerrillas, and resistance organizers would play very little of a role in D-Day. But we've seen SOE and its allies be extremely busy in the weeks and months leading up to today. But how did they manage to rebuild, and what sort of missions have they been carrying out? It's worth quickly running through the events of last year just to get an idea of the scale of the disaster. The collapse of the SOE networks in France and the French resistance cells they supported began last summer with the destruction of Prosper, a large network centered on Paris and spanning 12 French departements. When the Germans pulled apart Prosper, they also destroyed or severely damaged a whole series of interconnected circuits and sub-circuits. SOE's F section, that's F for France, lost 12 officers, this including Prosper's talented leader Francis Sutil. More pain came in the autumn with the near destruction of the circuit codenamed Scientist, centered on Bordeaux stretching from Paris to the Pyrenees. André Grand Clément, a fiercely right-wing French army colonel and regional leader in the resistance group's OCM, the Organisation Civile et Militaire, turned traitor and helped the Germans round up perhaps one-third of scientists' weapons and members. All in all, by the end of 1943, some 40 of F-Section's agents had been arrested. 10% of all the agents that F-Section will have sent into France over the course of the war. And... That's only the tip of the iceberg. When Prosper and scientists were wiped out, thousands of French allies and helpers were also arrested, with many ending up in concentration camps. Now, SOE's circuits were not fully destroyed, though. But only 20 circuits remained at the turn of the year, many only surviving remnants of damaged circuits. Others, like the Donkey Man circuit, with its small groups from Normandy to Burgundy, had gone to ground to avoid enemy attention. Things were slightly better in the former unoccupied zone in the south. Men like Tony Brooks and his Toulouse-based network of railway saboteurs in Pimento continued to hold much more of a foothold there. To many observers, it looked like SOE's French operations might never properly recover. As 1944 comes around, the regular military leadership are all pretty much hostile to SOE and have little faith in the French resistance. In their view, SOE have little to show for three years of work. Emphasizing the doubters' fears, when Corsica was liberated in the autumn of 1943, the French resistance played little more than a supporting role. So why build on a foundation that's already failing? The British Chief of the Air Staff, Charles Portal, and Head of Bomber Command, Arthur Harris, are particularly opposed to divert precious RAF bombers from bombing German cities to dropping supplies and agents for SOE. But SOE and the Free French have an important ally, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, the very one who originally ordered SOE to set Europe ablaze. Throughout January, resistance leaders and senior SOE officers make personal appeals to him. In February, the Prime Minister then orders the RAF to step up airdrops. It helps that by now, RAF also have a deepening cooperation with the United States Army Air Force and the Office of Strategic Services, OSS. I'll touch on that cooperation later. In any case, after poor weather held back many operations in February, things did pick up in March. By the end of that month, the RAF and USAAF have inserted 114 agents and another 260 follow from April to June. Total tonnage of stores flown in by the two air forces rises from just 139 between October and December 43 to 938 between January and March, and almost 2,700 between April and June. By the time D-Day comes around, SOE has doubled its number of active circuits to around 40. 
One of those agents who parachutes into France in early 1944 is René Dumont Guillemet, who drops into Touraine on the night of February 5th. His task, rebuilding SOE's networks in Paris. After lying low for a time working for a network outside of Paris, he decides to see what he can salvage from the ruins of Prosper. In April, he establishes the spiritualist circuit and works hard to avoid the mistakes made by Prosper. He asks all new recruits to uphold security above all else and to leave behind the French political conflicts that have provided entry points for the Germans. Upon joining, they sign an oath. I pledge myself to reveal to no one that our organization exists. I swear I will hold myself night and day at the disposition of the Allied armies. I swear loyalty and obedience to the leaders I have freely chosen. I know any backsliding will be punished by death. Those who join the spiritualist would be foolish to take these words lightly. Dumont Guillemé means what he says, liquidating double agents as soon as he discovers them, and discovers them he does. He builds his forces quickly and soon has 1,500 fighters outfitted with arms and another 5,000 waiting for weapons to arrive. Another new network benefiting from the inflow of supplies is Minister. Set up in early March, it operates in the département of seine marne to the east and southeast of Paris. SOE send 60 containers in five parachute drops. The contents of these vary, but one of the standard 12 container loads is listed as follows. Nine rifles plus 150 rounds per gun. Eleven Sten submachine guns with 300 rounds per gun. Ninety-five empty Sten magazines and eleven loaders. 13,200 rounds of 9mm parabellum ammunition. 22,176 rounds of 303 ammunition. 140 empty magazines for Bren light machine guns. 660 field dressings. 145 pounds, 65 kilos of explosives. Now... Resistance and sabotage is expensive work, so cash and gold is just as important as lead. By the end of this year, SOE will have supplied almost 280 million francs to its agents in the field. Most of this is carried in with the officers themselves or dropped by parachute, but some of it is raised locally. Jean Savy is dropped into France on March 2nd, tasked with arranging financial and supply contacts with friendly business people. While at work, he stumbles on something even more important. He learns of a secret military facility in the caves of Saint-Leu-des-Serrans, near Cray, outside of Paris. Here, the Germans are assembling the first of their vengeance weapons, the V-1 flying bomb. Savy takes his intelligence back with him to London, and after flying some reconnaissance missions, the RAF will bomb the facility later this month. With... Manpower rebuilt, and with cash and weapons flowing in, there are some acts of industrial sabotage in Paris and its surroundings in the months leading up to D-Day. Some of these sabotage missions fit in with Allied war goals beyond preparing for D-Day. As Indy and I have discussed in our regular coverage of the war, the Allies have identified ball bearings as a potential bottleneck in the German war economy. The logic being that if you destroy the ball bearings factories, you slow the production of tanks, aircraft, artillery pieces, and all sorts of war machines. Now, that has largely been a miscalculation, with production not affected long enough to deplete stores and ball bearings in transit. But unlike the B-17 and B-24 bombers, SOE can target the factories with precision and create more lasting effects. Ball bearing factories in Auberville and Asnières sur Seine are attacked in April and May. In the aftermath, production is cut to levels between 20 and 30 percent. In Auberville, the effect is similar as the bomb runs. The drop lasts for just a few weeks. But in Anières, the workers are persuaded to work slowly in the aftermath, and the factory will never again restore its previous output. Still, the overall scale of industrial sabotage in Paris is limited. After the war, the official history of SOE will record just 10 major acts of industrial sabotage committed in and around the French capital in the six-month period between January 1944 and June 1944. But these numbers are an underestimate. They don't include cases of railway sabotage or cases where targets have been bombed after being identified by SOE. 
Neither do they include acts of sabotage carried out by the RF section. RF is the Gaulliste branch of SOE, which was separated from F section back in 1941 to avoid political bickering between the British and the non-Gaullists. Underestimated or not, industrial sabotage in Paris and northern France pales in comparison to the center and the south of the country. The largest circuit in the south is Stationer, which stretches from Châteauroux to Tarbes. Stationer is led by an RAF officer named Maurice Southgate, who is one of the few SOE leaders to have forged a relationship with the extreme left. He counts members of the communist Front Tireur et Partisans among his numbers, as well as many French veterans of the Spanish Civil War. Already, his forces have been hitting Germany logistics targets, and Southgate boasts that he and his men have rendered 300 locomotives unusable by New Year's Day of 1944. Stationer also goes for industrial targets. Again, many of these targets are linked to wider war goals such as destroying German fighter production capacity. Stationer commits one of its most powerful weapons to the task, a former French POW named Charles Reichenmann. Reichenmann is a Lorrainer, and as such, the Germans released him on racial grounds back in 1940. He swiftly repaid the favor by turning his back on his supposed Germanic allies and joined the SOE in 1942. Now he leads a sabotage team codenamed Rover, with operatives scattered through French industry. In March, he and his men set out to destroy the Hispano Suiza factory in Tab, which supplies aircraft engine components to the Luftwaffe. The first attack on March 29th is a failure. The plastic explosives destroy two transformers, but this has almost no effect. So the team tries again on April 13th. This time, they destroy the casting molds used for making engine cylinder heads and succeed in shutting the plant down for five months. Some of SOE's most effective missions are when they have the factory owners on their side. Since the German occupation, Peugeot has swapped the manufacturing of cars for tank turrets and vehicle engines for fighter engines. The RAF bombed Peugeot's manufacturing plant in Sochaux near the Swiss border back in July 1943, but succeeded only in killing hundreds of locals. Fortunately, Henri Ré and his stockbroker circuit discovered that the Peugeot family are sympathetic to the Allies. After some negotiations, the family agreed to assist in sabotaging their own factory. The first attack went off in November 1943. After playing a friendly game of football with the German guards, the saboteurs planted their explosives and destroyed the power station and the assembly hall full of tank components. That puts tank production out of action until February this year, at which point Re and his men launch a follow-up attack which knocks out tank production for the remainder of the war. After that, in March, they crippled the production of aero engines, bringing output down to just 40% for the remainder of the war. For factory owners who are uncooperative, SOE can summon swift retribution. Pearl Witherington commands a section of stationer and contacts the management of the Michelin tire factory in Clermont-Ferrand. She tells Michelin that they can either agree to surgical SOE sabotage, which will allow the factory to resume working after liberation, or the RAF can flatten the complex. Michelin refused the deal, believing that the RAF are too busy to strike their complex. On March 11th, Witherington contacts London and recommends that the RAF give the management a lesson. The bombers of RAF 617th Squadron deliver an impressively precise strike, destroying the workshops but leaving the workers' canteens standing. French casualties are relatively light at just 36. SOE's attacks certainly aren't limited to military industry alone, though. SOE also hits French power generation very hard, with at least 15 F-section attacks in the first half of the year. These range from high-altitude attacks on hydroelectric plants in the Alps and the Pyrenees to attacks on the coal mining commune of Decazeville in Occitan. Altogether, SOE's F-section records 67 acts of industrial sabotage across France in the six months from January to June 1944. This is almost one and a half times as many attacks as the whole of 1943. 
Alongside this, SOE and the resistance have also been assaulting the French railway system in coordination with the Allied bombing campaign, the transport plan. They've destroyed or damaged 1,600 locomotives and have put 70,000 goods wagons out of action, as well as hitting bridges, marshalling yards, and locomotive production and repair facilities. Last night alone, they made 950 cuts to the rail system in preparation for today's landings. Of course, not all F-section's industrial attacks are successful. In some cases, explosives fail or are planted in the wrong place. Security forces and staff members also interfere with SOE's plans. Other times, the sabotage plans are poorly planned. In the aftermath of a failed attack on an aero engine plant in Lyon, the plant engineer comments that SOE could have done more damage by leaving the plastic explosives at home and simply smashing the engines with hammers. Finally, beyond sabotage, there is also the building up of secret armies ready to rise when the liberation begins. Much of the manpower comes from the Maquis, Young men who have fled from the Vichy Forced Labor Program, the Service du Travail Obligatoire, or STO, and organized themselves into small guerrilla armies. Earlier today, I talked about the Maquis of the Vercourt Plateau, who are currently fortifying their rocky fortress and preparing to declare a new French Republic. There are now some 50,000 of these fighters scattered across France, mainly in the Alps and southern France, but also in Brittany. When Churchill learns about them in January 1944, he becomes somewhat obsessed. He believes that with the right support, the Maquis can rise up and turn the southeast of France into a new Yugoslavia. Stretching German forces in such a way would relieve pressure on the Allied advance in Normandy after D-Day and smooth the way for an invasion of the south of France. The Maquis have actually had priority of supply over the past six months, and the missions to support them demonstrate a new level of cooperation between the British SOE and American OSS. Relations between the two services have improved a great deal over the past year, and their missions in France are now jointly coordinated under the Special Forces Headquarters, or SFHQ. The USAAF contributes some of its heavy bombers to supplying the Maquis. Some of these drops have been more successful than others, though. Some have been tragically successful for the Germans, like in February, when 220 containers dropped through cloudy weather in the Haute-Savoie end up gifting the enemy a lot of new weaponry. But supplies do get through, and the Maquis have made life very difficult for the German occupiers in the south. Trains and railways are blown up, convoys ambushed, and German soldiers and security forces are assassinated. Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt will later claim that the situation is so bad that from January 1944, all commanders reported a general revolt. Cases became numerous where whole formations of troops and escorting troops of the military commanders were surrounded by bands for many days and in isolated locations simply killed off. The life of the German troops in southern France was seriously menaced and became a doubtful proposition. Of course, We have to take Rundstedt's words with a healthy pinch of salt. The truth is that despite SOE's and OSS's efforts, the Maquis remain lightly armed and have only minimal training. An estimate in April concludes that most Maquis have enough arms and ammunition for only a few days of heavy fighting. The Maquis do excel at hit-and-run tactics, sabotage, and irregular warfare, but they cannot match the Wehrmacht in open combat. Hence, why the Maquis on the Vercourt Plateau have pinned their hopes on Allied paratroop support. But... Framing the Maquis in such existential terms is a German justification for harsh anti-partisan operations launched in the south of France. Operations which, just as on the Eastern Front and in Yugoslavia, hit innocent civilians hardest. The Maquis also form an important part of the next stage of the Special Operations War. Beyond Simply harassing the enemy, the SFHQ has tasked SOE and OSS with building the Maquis into a force that can seize territory, guard liberated areas, and provide internal security. To this end, several inter-allied missions composed of British, American, and French officers have been training groups of Maquis, including those en Vercourt, for the past few months. 
The next phase of inter-allied cooperation with the resistance began late yesterday evening, June 5th, when a three-man team parachuted into central France near Châteauroux. They are the first of the Jedburg teams, special forces men drawn from British, American, French, Belgian, and Dutch armies. Each three-man team includes two officers, usually lieutenants or captains, and a radio operator, usually a sergeant. The radio operator is perhaps the most important of the three. He is to use his Type B Mark II or Jed set to keep London in the loop. Unlike the men and women of SOE, the Jeds have been sent into France in military uniforms in the hopes that this will offer them some protection against torture, execution, or other maltreatment in the event of capture. Their job is to liaise with the resistance forces behind the German lines. Although their tasks are quite similar to that of the previous SOE and OSS agents, the Jedburg teams are more explicitly military in nature. Their job is not to take over the leadership of resistance groups, but to coordinate and synchronize resistance activities with regular Allied military operations. The Jeds carry with them weapons and explosives and are to give instructions on their use to the resistance. Their plan is that they will then assist the resistance groups in destroying rail lines and bridges, sabotaging telecommunications and power lines in order to harass and delay the movement of German reinforcements towards the Normandy beachhead. Over 100 Jedburgh teams are waiting in Britain to be sent into action. The Jedburgh teams usher in the next stage of the Special Operations War in France. But how can we evaluate this war effort so far? Well, it's hard to reach a conclusion yet. We'll have to wait and see what SOE, OSS, and the Jedburgh teams and the French resistance have in store in the coming weeks and months. Before today, SOE's industrial sabotage never reached the scale where it seriously degraded the German war production capacity. However, although it is hard to quantify such things, pound for pound, there is no doubt that SOE are more effective than the heavy bombers of the RAF and the USAAF. By the end of the war, SOE in France will have expended just 3,000 pounds or about 1,400 kilos of explosives in carrying out its major sabotage missions. That is less than the bomb load of a single Mosquito bomber. On top of that, Bomber Command regularly loses more men in a single night than the 200 F-Section agents who will be arrested by the end of the war. Significantly, when measured operation by operation, their attacks have more effect and longer lasting effect. And we haven't yet seen the full scope of SOE's sabotage work against the railways and the organization of guerrilla armies now purporting to harass German troops while Operation Overlord proceeds. In the days, weeks, and months after D-Day, as the Allies hope to advance through Normandy and beyond, these groups are expected to interdict German forces and prevent them from moving to the front. Their success, or otherwise, in this will be the real measure of the merit of special operations. It would be nice if we could actually have boots on the ground in France and, 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 and talk to someone who's there. We can. Yeah, I know, but I, I, wanted, to give, I wanted to give a little lead in. Okay, I'll tell you what, you want to do the honors? Sure. Ladies and gentlemen, you saw in the first episode that we have several other hosts today, though you haven't seen them yet, but one of them is our friend and own location expert, Paul Woodage. Paul is a real world-class expert about this stuff. He also runs the channel World War II TV, which you should all check out. Anyhow, Sparty, in your War Against Humanity series, you talk a lot about resistance organizations. Let's hear what you and Paul have to say about the French this day. In our War Against Humanity series, the Sparty series, uh, we cover all the various resistance movements throughout the war. And, of course, the French resistance is no episode. And, uh, obviously, they had roles to play today. Can you give some deeper insight into the French resistance role in the affairs of this day that I might not have got into so deeply in the regular? Yeah, sure. Well, what the resistance isn't here in Normandy is going out, blowing up trains and, you know, doing that active kind of surly men with berets and stubble and sten guns. That's happening elsewhere in France. What's happening here, it's all about intelligence gathering. It's about force maximizing for the Allies to get that extra information about where they're going to be landing. So 
you know, you have these units here, the Century Network out of Koi, it's, very, it's just a few dozen people, but they're monitoring which units are arriving, insignia changes, they're getting access to offices to get plans of the Todd workers, the construction of bunkers, thicknesses of bunkers, all that kind of information there, so, so being sent back to the, to the, the Allies to prepare for D-Day, and the case in point being all the information about the bridge here oh, yeah. was provided by the resistance, so Major Howard had a clear idea of here's the customs office, here's the checkpoint, here's the barrier, here's the pub, here's the Germans did this, and it, all there by the French. And, and we had two people that were involved with that intelligence gathering that were, that were in the middle of the action as well, Mr. Gondry who owns the cafe yeah, behind yeah, us, yeah. and the matron of the maternity ward behind us. I mean, it was a, a pretty intense day for them. It absolutely was, yeah, and, and overlooked a little bit in the grand scheme of things is what these people are doing, and it was a coincidence, really, that the Gondre Café that we're sitting in front of was, was one of the areas where one of these few members of resistance, resistance actually was working, but it, it, it all benefited the Allies. We need the location. There's a guy living there who has all the information we need, so it couldn't have worked out better. But I want to ask you, you know, why, what's happening with the resistance at a kind of a higher level, you know, with the Churchill and SOE and OSS? It's a, because resistance is, can be many different things. So what was happening at that level? Well, I mean, the thing is that this really goes back to the beginning of French resistance. Uh, and it had one problem that many of the resistance movements had that was very difficult to resolve here, and that was the ideological divisions within it. So we had five major resistance movements that could not agree on what it was. But there was a higher level of issues that really impacted the role of the resistance on D-Day. Um, and that was the conflict between Churchill, Roosevelt, and de Gaulle. Yeah. Now, Churchill was sort of in the middle on this, but um, Roosevelt was very worried about de Gaulle uh, coming in and installing a government inside of France that would not have been democratically elected. Churchill was less worried about it, but, and de Gaulle was absolutely furious for Roosevelt for not letting him do that. Not so, even meeting him. Not even mm. meeting him. They, they were, I mean, they, they were really, really at odds with each other. Um, so when they were planning this, there were a lot of discussions back and forth about what are we gonna let them do for the invasion day and for the campaign that happens after it. And the resistance was really champing at the bit to get in the fight, to, to do exactly what you said, to, to get out there and start blowing things up, uh, take their Sten guns out and their Thompson guns and whatever, and just, you know, shoot some Germans. That was, the, that was what they wanted to do. Churchill and Roosevelt said, no, not under any circumstances. The other thing they wanted to do was to do what, what de Gaulle said, install the government. Churchill and Roosevelt said, no, no way, not going to happen. We're going to like occupy France, and then you can have elections, and then you can go on and do it. So what ended up happening was, however, that all of that became kind of moot, because in 43, the resistance was obliterated by the Gestapo, yeah. partly because of incompetence on the British side. You've seen this in, in my episodes a lot about it. Um, and that impacted the day. But they still needed what the resistance wanted to do, which was to blow up trains and do all of that. So basically what they did was to create a big zone where uh, Churchill and Roosevelt said, okay, within this zone, we want no active resistance. Outside of that, they can start blowing up trains. So they blew up like over a hundred, I think it's 130 or so. You, you'll have seen in the episodes exact how many, but they blew up a lot of, of train tracks. And that was really important in supporting the whole thing because there, through that, the Germans couldn't get here. But what's really interesting is that de Gaulle played a trick on them. And the trick that he pulled on them, that is that he went ahead and did what they had said that he couldn't do anyway. And again, as you will see in the episodes later on today, um, the government part of it was already there. So when uh, around noon, when things are starting to calm down a little bit, the resistance goes into action and starts taking over Normandy and starts administrating all of the rescue efforts, uh, governmental issues in general, identifying collaborators, all of those things are actually happening by the resistance. So this conflict that had been going on between the leaders was really taken straight into this day. Mm. And, and, and it, it, you know, possibly, if, if not possibly, definitely it was a tragedy because, and this is the really sad bit about it, because they had decided to not allow the resistance to do any sabotage action, the only option left was carpet bombing. And this killed thousands and thousands of French people. And 
that was the effect of it. At the end of the day, it was the French people who paid for this conflict between these three leaders with their lives. Yeah. Wow. That's something you don't think about often enough, how the power plays of a few people really can affect the life or death of thousands far away. But here today, there's even more of it. I mentioned earlier today that the Germans had been very successful in capturing SOE agents and French resistance operatives through something called the Radiospiel, or radio game. This was the brainchild of Paris Sicherheitsdienst head Hans-Josef Kiefer. Over the past couple of years, Kiefer and his men have induced captured SOE agents into transmitting back to London as if all is well. These captive agents request more agents, weapons and cash to be flown in from the UK, agents and weapons which the Gestapo promptly capture upon landing. The agents held by the Gestapo have tried everything in the arsenal and protocols to insert warnings to the SOE, but these warnings have been repeatedly ignored, while wishful thinking, incompetence and politicking has dominated SOE's handling of their agents inserted straight into enemy hands. But now the Gestapo decide to bring the game to an end, and at about midday, the last message is sent to London from the Gestapo's Parisian headquarters at 84 Avenue Foch. might be wondering why the Germans would bring such a successful counter-espionage operation to a close. Surely, controlling a significant chunk of the Allied underground subversion force would be really useful now that France has been invaded. That's certainly true, but the Germans have decided to exchange this long-term advantage for short-term gain. They believe that revealing the extent of their victory here will unnerve Schaeff and throw the Allies off balance. The ensuing panic might just open up some sort of window of opportunity. It's a vague and desperate hope, but that's what they have decided to do. In any case, the message reads, Many thanks. Large deliveries, arms, and ammunition sent. During long period all over France, stop. Have greatly appreciated good tips concerning your intentions and plans, stop. We had to take under the care of Gestapo your friends of French section such as Max, Phono, Theodore, etc., etc., stop. It's a boastful message. Those names, Max, Phono, Theodore, they're SOE code names. The Gestapo are twisting the knife over SOE's losses. But the truth is, the whole thing has provided almost zero benefit to facing off the Allied invasion. Despite this, the Gestapo try and spark some panic in London. Very pleased to have your visit, for which we have prepared everything. Again, this is clearly nonsense. If the Germans had been fully prepared for D-Day, Rommel wouldn't have been back in Germany at the moment of invasion. German forces wouldn't be waiting in Calais for a non-existent landing, and Hitler wouldn't have been asleep. The message has nothing close to the Germans' desired effect. As of May, the SOE had finally accepted that their agents were compromised. This belated realization is nothing to be proud of given the repeated warnings over the past two years. Nonetheless, SOE's response is almost as smug as the Gestapo's. It reads, Sorry to see your patience is exhausted and your nerves not so good as ours. Stop. Sorry, we gave you so much trouble in collecting containers, but we had to carry on until our officers had been able to make bigger and better friends. Expense and stores, no object. Stop. To try and frame the whole thing as part of some sort of master plan is desperate, to say the least. To write off as no object the cost in lives, money, and material is laughable. More than that, it's an insult to the SOE agents and radio operators, the RAF pilots and the French civilians who have taken on the highest of risks. SOE may like to pretend that they have won the spy war in France, but it's a pyrrhic victory, to say the least. If you've been watching Astrid's Spies and Ties series, you'll know that some SOEs, bright as the most promising agents, have been thrown in prison or transferred to concentration camps as a direct result of London's failures. Few of them will survive to see the end of the war. That's really sad. And, and there was no master plan there. There's so much behind the scenes going on today, so much with civilians and with the intelligence war. And later on today, we'll go in great depth into the deception games and the spies, the actual overall intelligence master plan, things the general public has no idea about. 
And what does the general public know at this point? What's happening in the news story? How is it developing? That's actually very interesting right now. The news by the Allied broadcasters this hour is dominated, of course, by the details given in Churchill's speech to the House of Commons. The snippets released to the press provide the first details of today's operations with numbers, the message that the landings have held and the invasion looks to be a success. The press briefing the Germans prepared last hour, though, goes off at the top of this hour. The reporting that follows contains geographic details that the Western Allies have not released. Most significantly, it stands in stark contrast to Churchill's speech as it predicts failure for the United Nations, and as planned, frames it as Bolshevik orchestration. U.S. radio is quick to pick up on the German broadcasts. The news by the Allied broadcasters this hour is dominated by the details given in Churchill's speech to the House of Commons. The snippets released to the press provide the first details of today's operation with numbers. The message that the landings have held and the invasion looks to be a success. The press briefing that the Germans prepared last hour goes off at the top of this hour. The reporting that follows contains geographical details that the Western Allies have not released. Most significantly, it stands in stark contrast to Churchill's speech as it predicts failure for the United Nations and, as planned, frames it as a Bolshevik orchestration. U.S. radio is quick to pick up on the German broadcasts. Columbia shortwave listening station reports that Radio Berlin's first propaganda comment on the invasion was a flat statement that the invasion was undertaken because the orders of Moscow could not be evaded any longer. Our Columbia shortwave listening station recalls that for several months now, the Berlin propagandists have been trying to persuade their enemy audiences that the Allies would be forced to invade Europe because Joseph Stalin demanded an invasion. There's not much sign that anyone took them very seriously, not even in the countries which are friendly to Germany. Other Berlin propaganda so far this morning is just about what you'd expect. German broadcasters are talking about air defenses clicking into action and about German forces launching effective attacks against Allied formations. However, as you may have heard if you've been with us during this night-long broadcast, Allied correspondents who flew over the scene reported few signs of German resistance So perhaps we can chalk that up as just another German effort to frighten us. While the invasion today is by no means orchestrated by the Soviets, it is a concerted effort by the United Nations Alliance. And as you have seen with us, Neptune launching Overlord is the first step in the pincer movement that will be in complete motion when Bagration starts in the east. While this is not public information, now that the news is that the invasion looks successful, the U.S. broadcasters begin speculating about a possible offensive on the Eastern Front. We've had no word uh, from Russia so far, incidentally. You never know, we might get some word. The Russian offensive, we've all understood, was to be coordinated with the beginning of the Allied uh, invasion of Europe. Of course, coordination does not necessarily mean that the an offensive on the Eastern Front would begin at the exact, de- the exact time and day that the invasion of the West across the Channel would begin. But everyone does expect that some sort of offensive on the Eastern Front and probably a gigantic offensive will be coordinated with the invasion across the Channel. On the Eastern Front, land action is still on a relatively quiet scale. But the Russians are expected to strike out now to renew their drive toward the West, toward Berlin. There's been every sign of late that the Red Army was holding its divisions back, waiting for the opening of the Second Front in Europe. But that Second Front now opened, new large-scale offensive action is expected from the Russians. The latest word we have from Moscow, though, gives no indication that such a renewed offense has yet begun. The Germans continue to attack around the Romanian city of Iasi, and the Russians continue to beat them back, taking a heavy toll of enemy soldiers and equipment. The broadcasters also note that, as far as they know, there has been no reports to the Japanese people or any official reaction by the Japanese government to the news of the day. On the other hand, despite that the news broke in the middle of the night in the U.S., CBS reports on the first reactions by the American people. The morning is very bright now in New York. It's only 17 minutes past 6 in New York, Eastern War Time, but the morning does seem to be well advanced. The sun is high in the sky. And uh, while speaking about New York's waking up, you will probably want to know how New York's famous Times Square reacted to the news that the invasion has at last begun, the news which came in in the middle of last night and uh, which we have been broadcasting constantly since it did come in. 
The news of the invasion was received with calm in Times Square. There were relatively few people, mostly a few servicemen, on the streets at that early hour. Here and there, groups of servicemen and civilians collected around taxi cabs and listened to radio reports of the landings on the coast of France. There were no demonstrations at all. About 25 persons gathered in front of a newsreel theater on Broadway at 4 o'clock in the morning when a radio loudspeaker blared forth the latest bulletins. And for all we know, perhaps that loudspeaker is blaring forth my voice at this moment. In other parts of the city, householders were up and at their radios. We could see scattered lights in apartment houses from out of the Columbia windows here in our news headquarters. And uh, watchers, I might say, along Upper Broadway reported that scattered lights were seen all over town. At the Bendix Aviation Corporation Marine Division plant in Brooklyn, 500 swing shift workers gave a spontaneous cheer when the news was received, but the management said the workers remained at their jobs and not a second was lost. A scene that was probably typical of that in many public places here in New York was enacted at an east side restaurant where about 20 diners rose and listened with bowed heads as the first reports were broadcast on a radio in the restaurant. Mayor F.H. LaGuardia of New York was told of the invasion by police, and he called upon the people of the city to carry on at their jobs, to give the men in the invasion forces their utmost support. Mayor LaGuardia announced plans for a mass prayer meeting at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime in Madison Square, where the eternal light, a memorial for the soldiers of the First World War, is burning. Uh, that's uh, the way New York took the news of the invasion. That's the way New York has taken it up to this moment. At about 21 minutes past 6 o'clock in the morning, New York time, there'll be further reports of how New York received the news as the city wakes up, and there will undoubtedly be further reports, which we shall give you from other cities and places in the country, telling us how the rest of the United States received the news that at last the liberation of the continent of Europe has started. I'd say it's very much more than started. I'd say it's started and heavily contested. Well, things at the British beaches, at the beaches themselves, have quieted down a bit lately, but not at the American ones, and certainly not at the bridges where victory or defeat is still very much up in the air. By about midday, most of 7th Battalion has reported in for duty at the bridges, arriving singly or in small groups. Enough have arrived, actually, that Pine Coffin releases Howard's platoons from duty. Howard brings them to the area between the bridges. Enemy snipers remain active, however, and the moaning minis come in every once in a while. 7th Battalion's D Company returns fire on the snipers, but as one man confesses, we couldn't see them, we were just guessing. But the action around here has been heating up. The Germans are starting to bring in tanks. The first one around the corner, though, is blown up by a gammon bomb since the Piat is out of action. Fortunately for the defenders here, it blocks the road. Nigel Taylor has been wounded in the thigh and is directing his end of the battle from a second story window. Richard Sweeney Todd comments on that. We could hear Nigel's voice encouraging the chaps, leg practically blown off and lying up in the window of a house encouraging the chaps. But they do need encouragement. They don't have any radios. They don't have any field telephones. The battalion sent over, yeah, that was great. But Taylor's force is down to around 30 or so men, and a lot of them are wounded. There had, as yet, been no determined German armored attacks. Von Luck was still waiting for orders in his assembly area, which was fortunate for the paratroopers as they had only piats and gammon bombs with which to fight tanks. But panzers could be expected at any time, coming down from Caen into Benoville or up from the coast into Le Port. Over on the other side of the river, by noon, the mining work by 591 Royal Engineers is finished. Enough anti-personnel mines have been collected to lay an anti-personnel minefield between Le Bas de Ranville and the River Orne, but not enough to complete a second. They've also made a start on an anti-tank minefield through the orchards between Le Marquet and Erouvillette, but there are only enough mines to do the southern half of the belt, and even that at half the normal density. So the northern half has been laid as a dummy minefield, since they do have enough fencing wire and minefield marking materials for that. The mines, in case you wondered, were dropped in containers from the parachute planes, and so were basically as scattered as everything and everyone else was, though many of them fortunately came down in Ranville itself. 
By now, there are scattered small attacks against 13th Battalion around Granville, but all of these have been beaten off so far, and several enemy self-propelled guns have been destroyed. With the German strongpoint west of the Saint Laurent draw being neutralized, the battle is clearly shifting in that sector. The 16th Infantry is now pushing inland and towards Colville-sur-Mer. A new assembly area for the 1st and 2nd Battalions is drawn up, now more than a thousand meters inland. And while they climb the bluffs, engineers and demolition experts of the 1st Division prepare to open up the Saint Laurent exit for vehicular transport. Despite the constant mortar shelling, the bulldozers are pushing forward, pushing mines, wire, and obstacles aside. The 16th Infantry are now finally able to challenge the enemy for the possession of Colville and Le Grand Hameau. Like Verville, both Colville and Le Grand Hameau are rather unremarkable Norman villages that would not have made more than a footnote in history if it was not for the battle unfolding around them. But this battle, will be very different from at Verville, which they just walked into. At Colville, the 16th is immediately under German defensive fire, and every step forward is strongly contested. Unknown to them, the Germans have brought in what the Allied fear the most. Reserves. The 2nd Battalion of the 915th Grenadier Regiment has come down from Bayeux and dug in here. Well equipped and ready to fight, the Germans are not going to be pushed out here for the rest of the day. At the Kaburg draw, at the far east of Omaha Beach, the 3rd Battalion is now also finally breaking through the gaps in force. Beyond it, the spearhead of Company L begins to follow a narrow dirt road westward, which leads to a fork in the road. To the west is the hamlet Kaburg, to the east, Le Grand Amo. Company L sits tight at the fork and sends out a scouting patrol to each of the villages. The three-man Kaburg patrol vanishes almost immediately. Looking into the future, nothing will be heard from them until tomorrow when they manage to return with 50 enemy prisoners. The four-man patrol sent towards Le Grand Amo returns much sooner, like right away, bringing with them the valuable intelligence that the village is occupied by a strong enemy force, a strong enemy force that is now on its way towards them. So with their backs to the draw, Company L soon makes a desperate stand against a strong German counterattack. No one wants to be pushed back onto that cursed beach. And the fighting here only grows in intensity over the next couple hours. Over in the west, with the enemy being driven back, they can now flatten the road surface, fill anti-tank ditches, and clear exit road E1. Even the Navy gets engaged here. A heavy barrage by battleship Texas, backed by destroyers McCook and Thompson hits the German positions covering the Verville draw. This levels houses, destroys guns, and even partially collapses the seawall. From under four kilometers offshore, this is basically point-blank range for the ships and leads to many stunned Germans having enough and surrendering. With the shelling now hitting the German positions near the draw, General Coda disengages himself from the fighting near Verville village. So far there, the men of the 116th and the Rangers are keeping the German attackers at bay. Coda, though, is increasingly worried about the draw itself, which is still closed. If they really want to throw the Germans back and widen their perimeter, they need the support of heavy weapons and tanks, and for that it needs to be open. So, with a couple of soldiers and engineers in tow, he wants to personally see why the damn draw hasn't been opened or at least been wired with explosives by now. The plain and simple answer he gets is that the German defensive fire has prevented that. So, in a total reversal of the basic Omaha plan, Coda now decides the draw must be secured not from the sea, but from the landward side. Under repeated attacks, the center of an anti-tank wall finally begins to crack. Soon it is wide enough for the men to come through one by one, and the battered Germans are soon also surrendering at the caverns east of the draw and coming down the bluffs. It looks like it won't be long until it is in American hands. On his command ship, General Collins receives the good news that causeways 1 and 3 have been successfully secured and that they have made contact with the airborne. 
Although the assault at Utah Beach has strayed from its original plan, the whole operation has gone much smoother than expected. The first waves landed in an area that turned out to be far more approachable and less defended and fortified than the original beach. And the terrain itself did not favor the defender as it did at, say, Omaha. There were a couple pillboxes and larger bunkers that survived the preliminary bombings, okay, but they did not dominate the high ground and could only observe a relatively short distance in front of them. Overwhelming numbers and an aggressive push by highly motivated men quickly decided matters on the coast here. What now remains is to solve the whole traffic jam problem and help the advancing columns establish themselves inland. If the rest of the invasion has gone according to plan, then thousands of paratroopers were swarming over northern France already at the time the seaborne assault here began. In that case, all Colonel Van Fleet's 8th Infantry has to do is go out there and say hi. Every German caught between the two forces would be crushed between the hammer and the anvil. But you know, while capturing causeways one and three is certainly good news, to achieve total victory, 7th Corps has to secure the others as well. And situated in between one and three, causeway two presents the central road leading off the beaches. At its end, some five kilometers from the coast, stands Saint-Marie-du-Mont, which also guards an important road juncture that provides the quickest way inland. If the enemy still holds firm at causeway two and Saint-Marie-du-Mont, that might delay the whole advance and prevent the Americans from linking up their forces. They expect at least several hundred German soldiers to be present in the area. But where exactly is anybody's guess? Now, sure, the German defenders have been generally overwhelmed here, and sure, for a variety of reasons, but one I have not mentioned so far is that Hans Wilhelm von Schlieben, commander of the 709th Division, as you may remember, has not been here. Yep. I mean, he's not been in Germany like Rommel or anything, but he is not in Cotentin. He has been in Rennes to the southwest for a war game. He was awakened at 5.30 this morning and told the war games were canceled and he should return to his division. His headquarters are, in fact, at a chateau north of Valogne, and he doesn't arrive until past noon. When he does, he is told that his fellow general, Wilhelm Falli, is dead. The Regiment de la Chaudière has been waiting south of Bernier for a couple of hours for the order to advance, and in fact, end up waiting there until afternoon before they begin the attack towards Bernier sur mer with support from the armor of the Fort Gary Horse. They take it mid-afternoon. This is the first of 8th Brigade's objectives. They then move on to Basli and colombie sur town The SGB bridge over the AVRE in the crater has been used to get traffic off Mike Beach for three hours now, but since there's no more enemy resistance here, it's filled with rubble to make a permanent crossing. The tank is still entombed under the road, just making a totally wild guess here. I bet it stays there until the 1970s when Royal Engineers dig it out and restore it. I bet. Back to the first Suffolk's. We saw B Company take the Morris strong point, but A and C Companies are hard at work on a very formidable enemy position, the Hillman strong point, WN-17. This is the headquarters of Oberst Ludwig Krug's 736th Infantry Regiment. It's 600 by 400 meters in size, with not one, but two H605 concrete positions with steel cupolas. It has anti-tank guns, Tobruk machine gun emplacements, and concrete shelters all over. It's got barbed wire and a huge minefield. And they have to get through that huge minefield to get to the inner barbed wire. And they are under enemy fire. The enemy is also mostly underground. Taking Morris without a shot fired may also have helped convince the attackers this would be an easy one too. It's not. They should have some heavy backup. Six B-17s are supposed to drop a couple hundred fifty kilo bombs on Hillman, but heavy clouds spoils that. And the forward operating base officer, FOB, and his entire crew were killed in their LCA before landing, so they do not have access to the distant firepower of the cruiser Dragon and the destroyer Kelvin. They don't even have flail tanks to take out the minefield. This will take time. 
I've mentioned the traffic on the beaches several times before, but I'll repeat it yet again, summarized rather neatly in a long quote from Peter Caddick Adams' Sand and Steel. The narrowness of the beach, the delay imposed by cod, clearing sufficient lanes through the beach obstacles, and the tiny real estate on which to park a growing number of vehicles then combined to great congestion of staggering proportions. Some vehicles, including those of the engineers and the anti-aircraft units, had to stay close to the sand, while Sherman tanks, self-propelled guns, artillery tractors towing their weapons, and Bren gun carriers all queued up to exit the beach and deploy to where they were needed. Although the 185th Brigade Group began landing at 10 a.m., the strong onshore wind pushed the incoming tide further up the beach than expected. At high tide, the depth of usable beach available was down to just 10 yards, 30 feet, 9 meters. The Staffordshire Yeomanry, arriving alongside the 105mm priests of the 7th Field Regiment at 10.30 hours, recorded a terrible traffic jam on the beach where no organization appeared to be operating and no marked exits were to be seen. The majority of our tanks remained stationary for one hour, and even after leaving the beach, vehicles remained head to tail for long periods on the only available routes. This was also the tragic consequence of landing with a single brigade at a time. The 9th Brigade, 3rd Division's Reserve Brigade, did begin landing a couple hours ago, actually, but the bulk of them only start landing as this hour comes to its end. This is when Brigade Commander Jim Cunningham lands too. It has taken until now for a German command to really understand what is going on. But finally, this hour, OB West sends a somewhat correct report to OKW in Berlin. It reads, Oberbefehlshaber West to Chef Wehrmachtsführungsstabes Generaloberst Jodl, OKW, secret. Second assessment of the situation by OB West, tactical time, 12 a.m. After parachute landings behind Haka L-711, Infantry Division cleared forces. About one battalion destroyed about 50 prisoners. So far, no attack on 711. Infantry Division attack front looms from Orne Estuary to Barfleur. Local successes of the enemy at the Orne Estuary and various beaches and coastal defenses. 716th and 352nd Infantry Divisions, partly by tank action, achieved. Landing still in progress at mouth of Vire and at saint vast la hougue Attack of a thoroughly serious nature, which is also evident from the deployment of three airborne divisions and several parachute battalions. In the further course of the battle, encroachment on the north coast of Brittany not excluded. Destroying the strong airborne forces in the Carentan saint mary glise area is the main task. In any case, it seems advisable to advance the Ocavia Reserve Panzalea Division to the area around and south of Flair, since it is possible to intervene from there in all directions. Chef de Generalstabs, OB West, gesetzlich Blumentritt, General der Infanterie. You know, it's interesting that dealing with the U.S. Airborne is the main task in all that. You really see two things on each side in development now. For the Allies, a lot of the top brass, the main commanders, have come or are coming ashore, which means there's a general feeling of more security. But the traffic snarls could still sabotage the whole operation. For the Germans, the top brass is finally understanding what is going on. But that is thwarted by faulty preparations and lack of fighting power. It's things like that that can decide a war, and perhaps they will. But perhaps more importantly right now, whose armor is going to reach the men at the bridges first, allied or German. Perhaps we'll see when we return for hour 13 of D-Day. It's 1 p.m. on D-Day. Last hour, we saw German higher command felt that fighting the airborne was their highest priority. Now, if that is a decision based on true priorities or the pragmatism of doing what one can do, it certainly means that right now the U.S. airborne en Cotentin face continued opposition. Vandevoort of the 505th PIR has boarded a jeep and made his way about two kilometers north of saint marie to the village of neuville au plain Protected by rows of thick hedges, this seems like a good place to rebuff the eventual German counterattack. He wants his 2nd Battalion to take positions on a ridge near the village and orders a platoon under Turner Turnbull to further reconnoiter the place. But just as the platoon prepares to move out, a Frenchman arrives on a bicycle. He reports to Vandervoort that a large group of captured German soldiers is being marched down the road, guarded by several American paratroopers. 
But you know, sometimes if things sound too good to be true, they are exactly that. As Turnbull and I walked over to this position and talked, we kept watching the highway from the north. Shortly, a long column of troops appeared in the distance with vehicles scattered at intervals through the ranks. If these were prisoners, there were more than a battalion of them. We could make out the field gray of the German uniform. On their flanks were individuals in paratrooper uniform waving orange panels. Somehow, it looked just too good to be true. I told our 57 millimeter anti-tank gun crew to go into position on the right of the road where a house offered some concealment. When the advancing column had closed to within a thousand yards, I told Turnbull to have his machine gun that was covering the road fire a burst into the field on the left of the column. That did it. The alleged German prisoners deployed instantly on both sides of the road and the leading vehicle, a self-propelled gun, opened fire on our position. Our anti-tank gun crew returned the fire and set fire to the leading vehicle and one more that moved up behind it. The German infantry began to move forward on both sides of the road. I told Turnbull to delay the Germans as long as he could, then withdraw to San Mariglis. This is not a group of captured German prisoners, and it seems like only a matter of time until they overwhelm Turnbull's position. So Vandervoort must come up with a stellar defense plan, and quickly. Turnbull's orders are basically to buy as much time as possible. I don't know how many German soldiers there are here, nor from which outfit they are from, but that doesn't matter at the moment. Vandervoort has, however, chosen a brilliant place for the defense before San Mariglis. Entrenched in a commanding position, Turnbull's crew can direct their fire into the coverless valley through which the enemy is now swarming towards them. They create a killing field with machine guns and small arms. The Germans take heavy casualties, but answer in kind, firing mortars and grenades towards the defenders. And the battle grows in intensity. As the airborne missions have developed into the later stages, an important task right now is to hold what they have and continue increasing contact with the infantry that, for example, has landed on Utah, so that they can move inland, but that faces some issues. So all three regiments of the 4th Division are ashore and leaving Utah Beach, and the major task of the thousands of men swarming around here is to make contact with the 13,000 paratroops and glider-borne men dispersed all over the countryside. Van Fleet is well aware that their survival depends on the advance of the 4th Division over the four causeways. While his 8th Regiment moves for the three southern exits, 22nd Regiment moves northwards. Its 1st and 2nd Battalions are to take Causeway 4, and the 3rd Battalion is to continue clearing the coastline of resistance. Russell Reeder's 12th Regiment has been brought up to full strength by now as well and is the last to push over the sand dunes. Of course, Reeder himself is with a bunch of his guys heading through the swamps around Causeway 2, as we saw. And around one in the afternoon, they reach the other side, the area of the airborne troops, though they have not encountered any of them on their way. But their crossing of the marshland is important. The unimpeded advance proved that the flooded areas were only a deterrent for wheeled transport and would not stop men. As with any hindrance, the marsh would slow down, but not stop the GIs unless it was covered by fire. But, incredibly, the Germans had fled. The confusion wrought by the paratroops had served its purpose. Reeder and his men make now for Beuzeville au plan. They do start to run into small groups of the airborne troops now, but they also really hit the bocage. Reports of the contact between Army and Airborne are, of course, good news, but the lack of communications between the Army and the Airborne this day has always been a big concern in the minds of the commanders. In fact, since 6.15 this morning, 7th Corps Commander Lawton Collins has repeatedly sent out a single radio message to the 82nd Airborne demanding, report progress of attack, report location of command post. So far, he has not received any answers. So now, it's also up to Van Fleet's men to find out if the Airborne has achieved their objectives or if they were destroyed or captured in the attempt. But finding them is not going to be easy. The countryside is all bocage, flooded fields, flat sunken marshland. They can just as easily stumble upon German machine guns as their own paratroopers. 
One of the reasons the communication is not fluid is of course that many airborne units have lost their radios or radio operators. But there's also technical issues built into the system. The preparation in tech and equipment is a gargantuan task. And at some point, the size, the diversity, and the complexity will create bottlenecks. And let's not forget that radio is a fairly recent technology. Sunday, June 4th was a crucial day for Operation Overlord. It had just been decided the night before to postpone the invasion due to bad weather. Everyone felt the anxiety surrounding this decision and many people did not sleep that night. One of them was a rather unremarkable teletype writer of the Associated Press. As we have seen, they have a select and very limited group at the AP who are clued in on the invasion plans. Under embargo, they were at this point preparing for the news distribution effort we have already seen unfold. Now, that sleepless typist is part of those preparations and she decides to spend the early morning practicing her typing speed on her machine. She repeatedly presses the keys and types out a very specific message. Urgent, Press Association NYK flash. Eisenhower's headquarters announced Allied landings in France. And then press send. She did not check that the machine was live and the unencrypted message was already crossing the Atlantic before she got a chance to cancel it. Did one journalist just spoil the largest amphibious invasion in history? Well, remarkably, she did not. We know the Germans picked up on it, but for whatever reasons, it was dismissed or ignored. But radio does have a decisive influence on D-Day, or should I say the entire course of World War II. A single message delivered via shortwave radio is as deadly as any machine gun bullet. A couple words transmitted in Morse at the right time can decisively alter the outcome of battles. But a misunderstood or weakly encrypted signal can condemn hundreds of men to an early grave. This is especially true for Operation Neptune that depends on deception and communication to overwhelm the German defenses before they can react and reinforce. As a result, the spring of 1944 is a critical time for the Allied intelligence services. The intelligence and radio service have to master three things, deception, surprise, and ingenuity. Inside their headquarters at Guj Street, or better said, from inside the massive underground tunnels and bombproof facilities, the signal service of the ETO USA, as well as the British General Post Office, perform an unprecedented huge buildup of signal and communication capacities. In terms of communications, Overlord is going to be 25 times larger than Torch, the invasion of North Africa. Preparations began already in the second half of 1942. By October that year, the signal station at Grosvenor Square handled 12,000 calls a day between Britain and America using four interconnected switchboards. Then came a rush of building, laying down endless lengths of wire and installing switchboards. By spring 1944, the British GPO have connected 980 telephone switches and 15 teletypewriter switchboards throughout Britain dedicated to the invasion preparations. The switches are staffed by 1,200 operators handling connections between more than 32,000 active telephone numbers. Throughout May and April, an average of 8.5 million calls are going through every every month. Add to that 300 teletype riders in military and civilian installations all over the aisles. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. The massive bulk of communication is carried by radio. Shafe's personal signal division under British Major General Vuliami and American Brigadier General Lanahan Jr. has established a central radio control room for D-Day. From here, they are connected to all the necessary broadcast and facsimile transmission facilities located in the UK. In Lingfield and Surrey, there are two new powerful long-range transmitter and receiver stations to provide voice and teletypewriter radio channels to the US. There, the American Telephone and Telegraph Company, as well as the Long Lines Department, make sure that the US Chiefs of Staff know exactly how the invasion preparations are proceeding. Today, as the invasion proceeds, Viliami is still adding connections between London, Washington, and Algiers. 
When the troops deploy, the goal is that Chafe headquarters, including General Eisenhower and Field Marshal Montgomery, personally have a two-way direct link to the men in Normandy from the very moment the first radio operators set boots on the ground. Now, this requires multi-channel connections and communications, which is a very, very recent development in radio technology. It was only the previous winter when the new FM multi-channel radio relay nicknamed Antrac was ready to replace the old one-channel Morse HF radio stations. Unlike radio relays with only a single two-way circuit, the new ANTRC 3 and 4 sets provide four circuits for speech and four circuits for teletype writing. It even enables the transmission of pictures and drawings via fax mail system. While fax emails, faxes, are nothing new, in fact, they predate the telephone by several decades, the ability to deploy this in the field is a revolutionary wartime communications development. With Antrac, a recon plane can take a photo of, say, the landing sites, fly back to the UK, have the film developed to send back to the gunners on the beach. Getting it from headquarters to the field has been cut from several days or at least hours to minutes. Okay, that's the theory at least. In practice, only a couple of the ANTRC 1, 3, and 4 systems with all its spare parts and components could be sent from the US to Britain before D-Day. But it is enough to vastly expand multi-channel communication. New technology is only part of the solution, though, and old technology presents several challenges, especially interoperability. High Command needs a working standardized system for three services of a multinational army where different frequency bands and types of transmission are still in use. Starting in December 1943, the Radio Frequency Committee is hard at work distributing radio frequencies as well as telephone priorities to an ever-increasing invasion force. They will be equipped with mobile FM radios that run between 1 to 5 megacycles, or megahertz bands. Thousands of different frequency channels have to be provided without running the risk of creating a chaotic mess of interferences. General Lanahan describes D-Day as a stock of bees, and they have to make sense of all the buzzing. We were attempting to assemble the greatest ether orchestra in history, and the planning would determine whether the orchestra produced music and messages or chaos and confusion. Beyond organizing the frequencies, it presents a practical manufacturing problem. To control the frequencies of a circuit, you use crystals made of piezoelectric material, materials that change their shape when exposed to an electric field. The frequency of a given crystal determines how often it will vibrate when exposed. Megahertz crystals vibrate at a very high frequency, which creates an electromagnetic field that can be used to transmit or receive signals. Made of glass, metal, or actual crystals such as quartz, they are cut in a specific way to vibrate at the desired frequency. To make a long story short, to satisfy the needs for so many radios communicating next to each other, the Allies have to produce boatloads of crystals. And they do. To boot, all of this is a delicate affair, to put it mildly. We're talking tons and tons of time-sensitive information passing through a huge series of vulnerable equipment. To protect it all from attack or sabotage, the whole system is backed up by an additional series of emergency radio sets and secondary radio stations to pick up the slack even during a failure of the electrical grid. To make sure that the Germans don't pick up on the moment of invasion by detecting a sudden peak or drop in radio traffic, most of the radio stations have to be kept constantly active, even if it's just transmitting dummy traffic. Part of that is solved by rebroadcasting regular entertainment and educational programs to the Allied troop barracks and hangars, with the added benefit of boosting morale. But it's not just in the ether that all of this takes up virtual space. By June 44, the Allied Signal Corps occupied more than 600,000 square feet of storage space and almost 1 million square feet of open space. More than 2,500 tons of signal equipment is shifted every month. Most of their supplies are stored at the main ordnance depot at Tidworth. There, they have portable short and medium range radio sets for the infantry, bigger stuff for tanks and vehicles, really big stuff for radio plants and pole lines, 
thousands of radios, teletypewriters, and other signals equipment, to not mention thousands of miles of wire, waterproof bags, and charged batteries, all stockpiled and ready for distribution. In all, the Signal Corps has enough equipment to last from D-Day to at least D-Day plus 240 days. All that equipment requires someone to operate it, and that too is a huge undertaking. For D-Day, the Americans alone have 11 signals companies assigned to the infantry landings, two with the airborne, and another two with their armored divisions. Then they have four separate signal battalions, one photographic company and a radio intelligence company. More will follow into France after the initial phase. Each radio man has to know every in and out of his machine. Radio procedures on ships and on land, complex codes and ciphers, and long lists of dedicated frequencies. A combined assault code is in place for all messages between the commands engaged on D-Day. Then each command has their own combined field code for messages inside the command. Each is ciphered around five-letter word groups. Then there are dedicated intra-service and special joint-purpose codes and ciphers. Every code comes with its own list of rules, security instructions, and ciphers, like, for example, the Slidex radio telephone code, one of the two dozen official code systems. All of them run through the combined cipher machine to assure secrecy across the airways. Without the latter, an automatic cipher machine, secure communications on D-Day would be impossible. In the month prior to the invasion, ETO USA headquarters will handle two million word groups, a volume impossible to encipher and decipher by human cryptographic clerks. It's a fairly safe system, but not impenetrable. The cryptanalysts of the German Radio Intelligence Service have cracked several of the codes, like the M209 and Haglin codes, also the Slidex code is partly cracked by March 1944. Allied Command doesn't know what is still secure or not, of course, but the wide range of deception and confusion operations serve to counter the results if or when a code is cracked. Now, as I mentioned earlier, part of that deception is to avoid radio silence to not give away what is going on. That remains true as the Armada gets underway towards Normandy. True for the radio stations, that is. Because the Armada itself and all the planes flying in during the night observe absolute radio silence. Somewhat ironically, they do not benefit from the immense communication apparatus so carefully crafted in past months. They have to move in silence, as to not let the Germans detect and then triangulate their positions. But they are still visible on radar, or rather would be, if the Germans could distinguish them from inside of the blinding mess created by the signal's barrage the thousands of ships and planes bring with them. At H-7 hours, as the first ships are about to come in range of the German search detectors, the Germans detect nothing. Or to be correct, not the Armada. The leading ships carry ANAPQ-2 radar jammers on board. Patrols of B-17 bombers fly the skies of northern France operating ANAPT-3 mandrel spot jammers. Cruisers and destroyers have their own medium and high power countermeasure sets. Once the landing ships enter into range of German coastal artillery, they switch frequencies from the German search sets to their gun-laying radars, blinding them as well. Then there's the Allied bombers dropping huge clouds of aluminium foil into the sky, completely overwhelming the defenders' radar sets. For hours, they try desperately to figure out what is going on. And once they do, the sheer volume of the invasion force and its radio traffic in this gargantuan communication network that had only been an engineer's fancy dream before 1944 is so overwhelming that it doesn't really matter if they're looking and listening or not. The screaming sound of the invasion is deafening and its sheer size is blinding. At this point, the radio jamming is not the central problem for the German defenders on the coast, though. It's fighting off the attackers. Controlling several of the Widerstand's nests on Omaha means that the Allies have more options to move the fight inland. The road to Colville from Omaha Beach is a dangerous one. Dawson's Company G cautiously approaches the western edge of the town, but they are immediately spotted by German grenadiers who open up with machine guns and mortars, killing a few men. The fighting for Colville will intensify over the next two hours 
until Company G can fight its way into the cemetery and the church in the town center. This move will prove troublesome though, as a German counterattack will then almost surround Dawson's crew, and they are then fighting off enemies from all sides in the graveyard. Dawson himself will be severely wounded, a bullet shattering his kneecap. Although they will eventually beat back the enemy, Company G will not make any more headway this day. They will dig in and hold what they have at Colville and wait for reinforcements from the 16th to arrive. This battle for Colville is one of many D-Day firefights that will continue throughout the day, and it's pretty typical of the coming hours. While more and more Americans come inland, trickling in over the bluffs and towards places like Colville, the Germans will keep getting small groups of defenders together to try to surround and destroy them. A few words about the units that are hitting Omaha Beach this day. The western part, as you know, is for the 29th Division under Charlie Gerhardt. They are an untested unit, a volunteer National Guard unit, in fact, that has been beefed up by draftees from all over the states, though the National Guard part was recruited in Maryland and Virginia. This is very much in contrast to the 1st Division, the big red one, some of whom look down on the 29th and call them weekend warriors. The 29th Division has the nickname Blue and Gray, as in American Civil War colors for Union and Confederate soldiers, since its men come from both sides of the Mason-Dixon line. The 29th does, however, still retain its volunteer ethos. The 115th Regiment under Eugene Slappy is companies from the Maryland National Guard. Canham's 116th is Virginian and is actually a National Guard unit old enough to have colonial roots, going back to the Virginia militia. Well, several Virginia National Guard units were consolidated during World War I as the 116th, but elements of it go back that far. The 117th under Paul Good has the claim to fame of being the seventh oldest regiment in the United States, formed just before the outbreak of the Revolutionary War in 1774 as the Baltimore Independent Cadets. There are the division's field artillery battalions too. The Virginian 111th, while technically formed during a 1942 reorganization, has elements that date back to the American Civil War era. The 110th and 224th are Maryland and DC units. All the artillery is local guards units. What brought them together? Most guardsmen were teenage buddies in the Depression days and knew each other from their employers, communities, schools, or local churches. As many of the older families had lived in these areas since the Revolutionary War, and with everyone else's roots closely intertwined, these settlements were effectively large families. They regarded service in the Guard like earlier generations soldiering in the militia or as Minutemen in terms of a civic duty. And there was more than a hint of a social club to local Guard detachments scattered throughout the United States as with volunteer detachments the world over. As for the Big Red One, the 1st Division, named after its very distinctive shoulder badge. That division goes back to 1917, but its regiments go back to Civil War times. George Taylor's 16th Infantry to 1861, George Smith's 18th Infantry the same, and Jeff Seitz's 26th to 1901. A lot of the division's units are military professionals, even pre-war. And many officers are experienced career professionals, and they've seen action in Morocco, Tunisia and Sicily, although Commander Hubner, who worked himself up from private to colonel all within the 1st Division, only has desk jobs as appointments prior to taking command of the division. So today is a real baptism of fire for him. The eastern end of the Omaha position is the central link in the chain that is to connect the beachheads all the way from Sword to Utah. With the delays at Omaha and the delays of the commandos moving west along the coast behind Arromanche, that hasn't happened yet. But linking up inland is equally important, and there too are delays. More and more desperately, Taylor and company await relief in the form of commandos arriving from the beach landings. 1 p.m. arrives, no commandos. 
by 1 p.m. Von Luck's panzers are rolling. Getting shelled by the Navy and strafed by the Air Force, sure, but rolling nevertheless. And one battle group is heading for Benouville, with naval werfers blasting ahead for all they're worth. By 1 p.m., the men at the bridge and those in Benouville and Lepore were beginning to feel disconcertingly like the settlers in the circled-up wagon train, Indians whooping all around them as they prayed for the cavalry to show up. They are strong enough to handle skirmishes and probing attacks, but no way can they handle any sort of full-scale assault. I wonder if they can handle bagpipes. Wait, wait, bagpipes? Yep, back in England during the planning, Howard, Pine Coffin, and Lord Lovat had arranged that the signal that Lovat's commandos are approaching the bridge is to play the bagpipes. The response from the bridge is to be by bugle. One call means that all is clear, Another call means that the area is still contested. Pine Coffin's bugler plays the latter, for there is still fighting near the bridges in town. Lovat and his piper come into view, and then the commandos with a Churchill tank. For D Company, this really is the cavalry arriving in the nick of time. Georges Gondre brings out champagne, which Lord Lovat turns down, but Wally Parr sure does not. Mm -mm. Howard meets Lovat at the east end of the bridge and tells him the whole situation. Some of the tanks set up a defense line in Benoville. The others will cross the bridges and head for Ranville to help out there. As for the newly arrived men, Howard tells them that once across the bridges, they'll be relatively safe. But crossing means crossing under the eyes of the snipers, and they should be very careful. Apparently, Lovat disregards this and tries to march his men across, with the result that nearly a dozen commandos are killed by being shot through their berets. Here's another little side note from Stephen Ambrose. The commandos leave two captive German soldiers with Howard, who are only wearing their underwear. They had run for safety when the bridge was stormed, and that's what they were wearing at the time, and they hid in the hedges along the canal. They gave themselves up to the advancing commandos. When they're turned over to Howard, it's with the words, Here you are, sir, a couple of the Panzoff division. Yep. The armor here is going to soon enough very much calm the state of affairs at Benouville Bridge. And by the end of the afternoon, the position will be fully secure. The Germans will have plenty of other things to occupy them with the landings and the advance inland of British and Canadian troops. In fact, they will soon send their forces towards the beaches themselves. Yes, 21st Panzer is now beginning to move towards the coast, but German command is desperately aware that this may very well not be enough firepower. And that brings us back to 12th SS Panzer, who are still at Lisieux. The log entry at Rundstedt's headquarters reads, OB West therefore requests again by Telix at 1415, verbally also several times before, the release of the 12th SS Panzer Division and its subordination under Heeresgruppe B in order to further clear the beachhead with the combined 21st Panzer Division and 12th SS Panzer Division. Here's a what if. Imagine they wouldn't send the panzers to the beaches and instead they attack the Allied bridgehead at uh, Benoville, right? What, what if they would do that? Okay, maybe they will. We shall see. In any case, the armor that would be needed to ward off such an attack there would possibly not arrive in time because of traffic congestion. Yes, one of the Allies' linchpins in today's operation is to come in really, really quick with reinforcements and more equipment to the beaches. That means marine traffic going in and out and hundreds of vehicles arriving that have to get off the beaches. So, if you look at the general historiography as it is told of D-Day, we get a lot of talk about fighting on the beaches at Omaha more than anything else, but also Utah, and often fighting on the beaches here in front of us at, at Gold, Juno, and Sword is spoken less of. Why is that? I think it's because we focus on the beach itself, which in some ways was easier for the Germans to defend. They could hide bunkers inside uh, the, the buildings, but the Allies were generally off pretty quickly. There was some loss of life there, notably on Juno, where some of the first wave uh, casualties were quite high. But then immediately off the beach, you've got a few yards to go, and then a different sort of combat starts, and that is the urban combat of the environment in villages like this in Grey Sur Mare, where you go from one type of warfare into trying to get through narrow streets like this. 
with your mechanized army of Sherman tanks and artillery pieces and quads towing artillery behind it and vehicles and bowsers and everything else. And these roads simply aren't designed for this. We're using maps that have a, a, a road going from the beach inland, but when you get there, the ro road winds, it bends, it has corners, there are jutting out walls, there are gateways, there are driveways, there are stone bits at the bottom of gateways. And you can still go around these areas and find gouges by Sherman tanks down the sides of walls. And we know that this house we're standing in front of, they just wipe the corner off the Allies to make the ability to curve round that corner so because they were getting Sherman tanks and things stuck here. And this battle is the one we just don't talk about it because it's it's D-Day, but it's seen as a sort of a second chapter. But to me, it is all about still June the 6th. So well, it is on June the 6th, and not only that. I mean, if you look at the battle for Omaha and everybody says, oh, it went on the longest. If you add these two up, as yeah. we've seen in the episodes... But they are the same battle. They are. Of course. Without a doubt. Battle. And as we've seen in the episode so far, there is no question that this went on longer. I mean, this went on longer in the day because they were still fighting as the, as the evening came, right? Yeah, and as the longer they take to get through these buildings, the more chance the Germans have to organize themselves. 21st Panzer start establishing the kind of hedgehog positions in the villages two or three miles inland. 12th SS start arriving late in the evening. They're there the next day. And this inability for the Allies and the British and Canadians particularly to move through these buildings with the big war we've brought over is, a, is really important because the Germans the next day, Kurt Meyer's here with one of his regiments in the 12th SS. He does this possibly foolhardy push of armor towards the beach. Um, he hits at a column of, of a Canadian Stuart tanks and, and Sherman tanks and infantry and they can't respond the Canadians as well as they would like to because all their artillery, all their support is stuck in streets like this. It is just jammed with, with um, vehicles and they can't even back out to try again. They can't even elevate their, uh, their barrels over the buildings because they're stuck in these streets. I don't think we'd really foreseen that that, problem, that would be a problem here. These roads would, oh, they're just straight roads they go through. And uh, this is one of the most important battlefields of June the 6th. And as you say, it's just not talked about enough. Well, traffic we've seen plays a part again and again in the war, and obviously here. I mean, this is, and it is something that people often do not plan for. They plan for logistics, they plan for supplies, they plan for how rail movement, they plan for, but they don't plan for the actual traffic jams that do develop as soon as something doesn't go the way you plan, you, you thought it was going to go to. Now, you, we, we were talking earlier about naval traffic and stuff. Can you go over for them what we were talking about? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, here we've got, you know, the biggest armada ever put towards a coastline that's coming in. And like you've pointed out previously, it's not just one wave of soldiers coming in. It's many waves of soldiers coming in after each other. And as people start to get wounded around the place, and you've seen this in the episodes as well, or you will see it in the episodes if you haven't seen them yet, uh, you know, they have to get people off the beaches at the same time as they're getting them in. So what they created was basically a system of circulation out uh, further out to sea where coming in, so to say, they would unload uh, men and, uh, and equipment that would then go in in the LCPs and LCTs. And then you'd have the ones coming out again, but with the wounded and loaded onto it. And again, as you have seen or will see in the episodes, you uh, get a situation where eventually that breaks down already on D-Day. Yeah. But for most part, it really works quite well. They're really good at it. Yeah. But over at, at uh, Omaha especially, and to a certain degree at Utah, and a little bit here as well, you do get a traffic jam already out at sea because there's just too much movement forth and back. But I mean, it is, you know, and this is what, what uh, is, uh, is Piccadilly Circus, right? Well, the Piccadilly Circus is, you see it on those DD maps, you see the lines coming out of the southern ports in England, you see the lines going down to the, to the, uh, the French side of things, and in the middle is that circle with Piccadilly Circus, you know, named after the roundabout in London. The Piccadilly Circus wasn't really used as a term until several days after D-Day, and part of the, you know, to add from what you're saying there, the problem of this, the planning of the back and forth and the reverse journeys is we couldn't possibly have in advance planned where are there going to be sunken ships? Utah, oh, yeah. you've got the Corrie, the uh, the Rich, the Meredith go down in certain places. You now have to avoid those. There's LCTs, there's LSTs going down, there's breakdowns, things like that. So on the on the 7th of June, or even as you said, the late on the 6th of June, they're now having to work out the the restricted map of, well, we can't go that way because that destroys in the way there. We're still firefighting on that, that vessel that's there. So it, the, the, the system that was well organized 
takes some time to reorganize to the current situation faced by the Allies of these lost ships. I mean, the Allies didn't lose many ships on D-Day, but a destroyer going down off Utah Beach that's, that's... Is, is something you've got to work around. There, were, there was the, uh, the Svenna, a, a, Swedish, a Norwegian ship, was lost off um, a sword beach, and there it is. It's there in the way now. That, that uh, affects the, the, the roots in it, affects the roots back out again. Where are the cadres going to come from? Which bit is going to be the, the area where you're going to need to bring the medical ships into? Is it going to be there? Is it going to be there? So all of this couldn't be planned in advance. So the 7th and 8th of June is where things get a little bit um, slower to, to get themselves back on an even keel to that, to that organised system the Allies had planned for for June the 6th, which, as you said, did pretty much work like clockwork. So, and I mean, you, you're... Saying you're mentioning 7th and the 8th of June, which is of course outside the scope of, of our D-Day 24-hour coverage, but it does have relevance because we've talked about this previously. We've talked about how the uh, Allies abandoned the D-Day objectives at a certain point at night. And part of that really has to do with these narrow streets yeah. as well, right? Yeah. Because we've got the traffic jam, we've seen the traffic jam, but I mean, you know, they could have fixed it until the next day, right? Or... So yeah, it, it goes on to the next day. And the thing is that complicates the issue is we can see this map now with Regina rifles have reached this point, Winnipeg rifles have reached here, King's KSLI have reached here. Most of these units don't quite know where the other units are. They know where they've reached, or they, but they don't necessarily know which exact village they're in because one village kind of morphs into another village there. So this rather disorganized line at the end of June the 6th looks like an organized one on the map, but it, it clearly isn't. And it's all to do with the ability of these units moving in land to simply get again through these streets there. So some units have gone you know, a long way in land, others are just stuck because they can't get through. The beach masters have done an incredible job on the beach. They're not here in the streets. No. Sure, there's MPs and things like that trying to coordinate things, but they don't know where units have got to. They can't necessarily tell people, well, that crossroads over there is clear or isn't clear. So there's convoys going up one way, getting stuck, having to reverse up, try another route. And these slow things down because, you know, we, we've got to remind ourselves that the Allies are pushing on again. The British are heading on for Caen again. The Canadians heading on for Carpacay Airport just to the side of Caen. And, and it just becomes a real struggle on June the 7th, with, particularly with stove cut pipe communication, which is something else we could talk about, is that the units that have got in land, they're using a small radio set, a company to talk to battalion, who are talking to regiment, who are talking to brigade, and then and the information is going across to the next beach and then brigade is talking to regiment and battalion again and two units may be advancing a mile a mile apart or half a mile apart but the information has gone all the way back that way so by the time this unit has bumped into one of these german hedgehogs in a village the information hasn't been relayed to that unit over there for maybe two hours and then they run into a problem and then it just the, the domino effect yeah. is is really there on june the 7th and 8th Added to the fact it is the 12th SS that, that we're talking about um, in the area land, which just ups the ante in terms of the ability of these Germans to respond with efficiency. I mean, some of the German units behind Omaha, Utah, you know, saw they're not the best, but 12th SS, they, they are motivated, inexperienced, most of the men, but, the, you know, the officers, the NCOs, some of them have been on the Eastern Front. They know exactly how to do these And they're well-equipped. Well-equipped, Panthers defensive actions, holding advances. So 7th and 8th of June is in some ways where the real real fighting starts. And I mean, there's another aspect of this that we fail to see today. You mentioned that they took off the corner here and that's like to make it better. Let's not forget this place was pummeled by artillery, by the fighting yeah. and everything else. Yeah. And that makes navigating difficult on other levels, not just the rubble that gets in your way, but also finding your way because you have a map and that map shows you something that isn't there anymore, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so you know, you're, it's, it's, it's absolute total confusion and it's a lethal one. I mean, this is why we got a lot of dead people here, not just on the 6th, but on the next days as well, right? And, and that, you could add the fact that the bombing that had often missed on June the 6th, because it landed too far inland, the Allies are now moving into where those bombs did land. So right. there again, choke points, craters, walls down. Someone has to bring a bulldozer up, sweep that road out of the way. And you've got, it has to be said, some fairly pissed off French because there were <laughs> quite a lot of French killed on the in the buildings behind Juno Beach and Sword Beach and then you're asking as a Canadian officer excuse me can you tell me which way well the, which way the Germans are and is, this guy isn't necessarily that interested in helping you because he's burying his wife who was killed the previous morning by a naval bombardment so there's these issues there's a the civil affairs aspect of D-Day of June the 6th 
June the 7th is something we don't talk about as well, is that you can't just necessarily sweep these buildings out of the way without pissing someone off. Yeah. And that's interesting, actually, uh, for, from another... We've talked, we've talked about this in another place, and that was the resistance. I mean, yeah. what did help that situation was that, contrary to Roosevelt's and Churchill's uh, wishes, de Gaulle had gone ahead and set up a local government structure that kicks in already around noon on D-Day, actually, and start coordinating that. It helped it a little bit, but like you say, the displeasure of being in the middle of a war zone isn't going to be compensated by the fact that some guy who you didn't know was in the resistance pops his head out of a hole and says, well, I used to be the baker, but now I'm the mayor. Right? Mm. <laughs> that, 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 that's not going to help well, it also as, think as, that as well. I think you've, you've struggled, but you've managed to survive under four years of occupation. You've either played the game or you've been in resistance or not resistance, but you've still survived. And the first couple of hours of the liberation, your wife gets killed or you get killed and you leave her a widow and stuff. That's... Yeah, it's you terrible. You can't even begin to describe your feelings, you know? Yeah, and I mean, that's an important aspect. We covered it a lot in our episodes, of course, but I mean, you know, you just think about that. Twice as many civilians were killed on D-Day as American soldiers. Yeah. So, you know, it's... it's, it's we, we remember the soldiers and we forget the civilians and that is actually not okay, especially when you see what kind of destruction was wrought on their houses here. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, the, it's something, because I live here, you know, between 20 and 30,000 French killed during that lib liberation period that we yeah. now call it. But it's liberation in, in the grand scheme of things, but it's leaving 120,000 people homeless. It's killing 20 to 30,000 people. And, and that's going on at exactly the same time as the, as the progression is moving in land, which we now know is not quite as fast as intended. But yeah. and, 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 and that leads to a cultural issue of course, because what the reaction from the Allied soldiers was, well, these French are ungrateful, they're dirty, they're unkempt. Of course they were dirty and unkempt. They'd all been blown to pieces. They didn't have any stuff. Anyway, the <laughs> Germans took all their stuff. In some places, if you go to Cherbourg, there were, were uh, people who had lived underground for three months by the time they were liberated because that was the only, play, only way to survive. Yeah. And of course they come out dirty, unkempt, and pretty pissed off. I mean, yeah. Yeah. that's the ones that survive. And, and the Allies had been told that the French are probably going to be surly and that you can't trust them. That's another whole subject yeah. there is that... Yeah. You know, the, well, that goes back to the goal and the whole thing does, because yeah. they had been... They, yeah, they, there was a... There was a hard information campaign. Don't trust the French, they might be collaborators. You know, of course, but I mean, if we look at the reality of that, you'll know that from my episodes, there were about equal parts collaborators and resistance, and they were a minority of the population. Most people were just trying to get on yeah, and, and yeah, survive. Yeah. The right? great big middle part of the yes. group that everyone talks yeah. that doesn't talk about. Doesn't yeah. talk about the one, yeah, yeah. The survivalists, if you like, the yeah, just right. the, okay. the the take it day by day people. Yeah. Who are at the end of the day the real victims of what yeah, we're, yeah, we're, yeah. we're talking about? Sure. As we've pointed out, on land it's a bigger issue in the British sector because of the long rows of settlements, villages, and private homes that cut off the beach from the hinterland. That means that if the traffic jams are not dissolved, then the men in that hinterland will not get the reinforcements they need to advance. And right now, the fight behind the sword is picking up. At 1.10 in the afternoon, under cover of a smoke screen, A Company of the 1st Suffolk breaks through the outer barbed wire of the Hillman Strongpoint. But they get stuck in the minefield, pinned down by machine gun fire, and they lose their company commander and the platoon and section leaders all killed. The enemy machine guns have interlocking fields of fire, and they have no answer to that, and the tanks of the Hussars cannot break the steel cupolas. Meanwhile, the first Norfolks have passed through Colville. They're not supposed to help the Suffolks, but bypass them and hit the rover strongpoint, like, like a kilometer south, on their way to Caen. They take heavy casualties when they leave Colville, however, and head out across open country that turns out to be the eastern part of the Hillman position. In fact, they quickly take some 150 casualties and they are now pinned down by those same fearsome machine guns of Hillman. And they've lost their radio equipment and have no contact with headquarters. This last is pretty tragic since they also take a lot of casualties from the armor that is supposed to be supporting them. Friendly fire is a big problem this day in many places. So, 3rd Division, who are supposed to make it to Caen today, is now stuck. And two entire battalions are being pinned down by just one enemy strongpoint. At this precise moment, 
With only six infantry battalions ashore, the stalemate opposite Hillman meant that one-third of the 3rd Division's riflemen were being tied down by Oberst Krug, along with perhaps 10% of General Rennie's available armor, engineers, and artillery. Krug was unaware of this achievement, but he more than adequately demonstrated how a determined opponent can quickly erode an attacker's combat power. More significantly, the German colonel had just shredded the whole 21st Army Group plan to reach Caen that evening. Rennie might have already realized this, since he tells everyone they must take Hillman at least before dark, since he expects an enemy armored counterattack. Okay, there's more to it than that. An hour ago, Jim Cunningham, commander of 9th Brigade, landed, right? To his amazement, he found that 3rd Division Commander Tom Rennie and 1st Corps Commander Honest John Crocker had already landed ahead of him. He meets them near Hermanville. I had never before been beaten into battle by my divisional and corps commanders, and we had a good laugh about it. Now, the plan for his battalions, 1st King's Own Scottish Borderers, KOSB, 2nd Lincolns, and 2nd Royal Ulster Rifles, supported by the armor of the East Riding Yeomanry, has been to be on 3rd Division's right flank, to make contact with the Canadians from Juneau Beach, and to make for Carpiquet Airfield, supporting the drive on Caen on its right flank. Rennie and Crocker now tell him that taking Caen is no longer job one, but beefing up their left flank to the east is. They are very worried about an armored counterattack there, one that will knock the airborne off the bridges. So they've had engineers building temporary bridges and rafts for hours already. But that's the big deal. So Cunningham's move on Carpiquet is canceled. He now gets new tasks. He is to head to his left to help out Gale's airborne units. His armor though, the 1st East Riding Yeomanry, the 3rd Regiment from 27th Armored, has not yet landed. So Rennie tells him to wait for them before getting moving. Cunningham goes back to his vehicle, and there he is wounded by a stick of mortar bombs that kills six of his staff and injures another five besides himself. His second in command, Dennis Orr, has already gone to liaise with the Airborne though, so you now have a crisis in continuity of command. When I was wounded, he was not present to take over, and it was a very long time before he got back. The result was a long hiatus when the brigade should have been moving and nothing happened. In short, if a number two is considered worthwhile, do not use him on some other job instead. Or assumes command. But just after that, they discovered that the enemy on their right flank is, in fact, stronger than they had thought. So they can't go off to their left, but must stay and deal with this. So they don't head for either Carpiquet or the bridges. And they're not going to contribute all that much over the remainder of this day. Second Royal Ulster Rifles dig in near Perrier sur les Dents. KOSB do eventually head over to the left flank where they will dig in for the night on high ground overlooking Benoville and saint alban d'Arcenay, and the Lincolns stay on the right near Cresseron. As for their armor, 60 Shermans. They are finally allowed by the Beachmasters to begin landing at 2 p.m. as this hour ends, where they are hit by a low-level bombing run by Junkers JU-88s going after LCs on Sword and Juno. There are, in fact, and contrary to what a lot of people say, a bunch of missions by the Luftwaffe this day. Luftflotte 3 records 139 sorties this day over the invasion zones and 24 recon missions. Hugo Sperle commands Luftflotte 3, and to cover all of France, Belgium, and the Netherlands, he has 891 planes, counting all types, but only 497 are operational. You say that 139 sorties is a lot. It might be for the men on sword at the receiving end of those, but I think it's worthwhile to point out that the Allies are flying more than 100 times. 100 times more sorties today. So that is over 14,000 sorties versus not even 140. And while, as you say, that matters little to anyone at the receiving end of those German planes, it does mean that anyone at the receiving end of the Allied planes has no protection from the Luftwaffe. This hour, that is again, the French population at Caen. At about 
1.30 p.m., USAAF heavy bombers dropped their bombs over the city of Caen. General Bernard Montgomery, commanding the invasion forces, wants the city center bridges spanning the river on to be smashed. He hopes this will prevent German reinforcements from moving up, allowing his forces from Sword Beach to capture the city by the end of the day. American aircraft dropped leaflets in the morning, urging the Cane to flee into the countryside. Few have heeded this message, and the city is still full of people. One of them is Jacqueline Sabine. She has just finished eating lunch with her family when the bombs start falling. Here's how she describes the events. A violent impact shook the house, and all three of us hunkered down in the corner of the room. My father turned over the large wooden table for use as a shield. The noise of everything rattling was terrifying. When it was all over, we found ourselves in the dark. There was an opaque cloud of dust outside, shattered glass all over, and the hallway transom had been displaced. We heard screaming and wailing. After the bombing stops. Jacqueline's parents leave home to aid the Défense Passive. The scenes they witness are nightmarish. Men, women, and children are laying dead or dying in the rubble of their homes. The volunteers are doing the best they can to provide relief. They will win high praise in the post-war records. But the damage inflicted by the bombers is making their life very difficult indeed. The bombs have severed the water mains, so the firefighters are struggling to tackle the raging blazes. The ambulances are halted in the rubble-blocked streets, forcing the local youth to carry the wounded to makeshift aid stations. In the midst of such destruction, tempers run high. One man from the Défense Passive comes across a looter stuffing his pockets with jewelry. The young man threatens the raider with arrest, but the thief simply laughs, amused that an unarmed volunteer would be so bold. Enraged, the young man swings his shovel and slices the looter's jugular, ending his life. At the Chapelle Bon Sauveur Hospital, the nuns and the medical staff do their best to save the lives of the wounded. Surgeons work in improvised theaters, and police officers recover any medical supplies they can find from the ruins of the Caen pharmacies. Those whose homes have been destroyed seek refuge in the Abbé aux Hommes. To ward off any further attacks, the roof of the ancient monastery is marked with a red cross made of blood-soaked sheets. Later, Jacqueline's parents return home, devastated by the destruction they have witnessed. Jacqueline manages to persuade them that they must leave Caen, she writes. After a look back at our family home of 20 years, filled with a warmth created by love and my parents' hard work, I said a final goodbye for I knew deep inside that I would never again see my books, college notes, my freshly typed diploma, the beautiful print of the Louvre pinned to the wall in my little study corner, the pretty crystal vase that Raymond gave to me on Labor Day, all my letters of love and friendship, the treasures of my youth. They join an exodus of people forced into the surrounding countryside. Some 15,000 of these refugees find shelter in a medieval quarry on the southern outskirts of the city. They will shelter there in the damp, airless tunnels for over a month. A month of squalor in their own sewage from limited sanitation, lack of food, lice, fleas, bedbugs, and illness. So these are blunt strategic bombing efforts. But earlier we saw how the Allied tactical air forces were being very effective indeed, partly from devastating incendiary armaments, which have also been in use by the infantry against the defense positions. Like when we've seen flamethrowers in use today in several places. And flamethrowers are used by both sides in this war. But today, the German troops seem astonished at their effect. What's up with that? Yes, the Allies are using something in their flamethrowers that the Germans have never seen before. Napalm. Which we usually associate with a much later war, the Vietnam War. But is really a World War II development that comes into wide use today. The same goes for the terrifying incendiary nicknamed Fenian Fire. Napalm was developed by chemist Louis Pfizer at a secret Harvard University lab for the U.S. Chemical Warfare Service in 1942. Deployed for the first time on December 15, 1943 on Papua, New Guinea. 
On D-Day, it is used by the Allies in flamethrowers, grenades, bombs, and rockets. In some cases, white phosphorus has been added to the napalm. The effect is devastating. Heinrich Runda is a grenadier in a Widerstandsnetz on the western end of Utah Beach. These rockets exploded when they landed, and they threw out a liquid which exploded with a very bright red flame. The first group of these rockets flew over us, thank God, and burst open in the fields behind us. There was a very strong smell of burning tar or rubber, and we could feel the heat from the flames even in the trench. After that, we heard another of these Yabo planes diving down on us. That wait seemed to go on forever. We stared at each other in the trench and listened to this screaming engine getting louder. That pilot sent his rockets all along our defenses, and one of them exploded right there at the end of my trench. The next few moments were complete hell and chaos. I still struggled to make sense of it all. The burning liquid blew up in a great ball which spurted out along the trench. I mean that it poured along the trench with a horrible force. Have you seen a big water pipe that has burst in the street and the water comes flying out into the air for four meters, five meters under great pressure? That is the way this burning liquid flew along the trench, splashing out everywhere. I can still see this today in my mind. There were half a dozen men lined up along the trench between me and where the rocket burst, and each one of them was covered in this burning spray that came toward us. And the liquid was sickening in the way it worked. It was some kind of gasoline fuel mixed with rubber or nylon or something like that. It stuck to everything like glue, to the men's uniforms and skin, and their hair and bodies. It splashed out in front of me and I ran like a madman. I'm not ashamed to say, and I got away from it. When I turned to look back, many of our men, who a few minutes before were eating their last meal, were completely on fire. One by one, those men fell to their knees and gave up their struggle, or they simply fell back into the flames and disappeared from my sight. Now, a sticky expanding spray of fire is already terrifying, but phosphorus adds the horrifying effect of sustained burning. Handmade white phosphorus bombs were first used by the Irish Republicans fighting the British in the 19th century, giving it its nickname Fenian Fire. The first factory-made phosphorus bombs were developed by the British in late 1916 during the First World War. During that war, phosphorus mortar bombs, shells, rockets, and grenades were used extensively by American, Commonwealth, and Japanese forces in both smoke-generating and anti-personnel roles. As World War II begins, both sides develop a variety of new phosphorus devices. However, with dwindling access to raw materials like phosphor by 1944, the Germans don't have any meaningful phosphorus armaments on D-Day. On the Allied side, phosphorus hand grenades and mortar shells are in wide use to clear enemy positions. Tanks carry white phosphorus rounds, and some of the rockets on planes and naval vessels are armed with white phosphorus. On a human, or other animal, ignited white phosphorus will enter the airwaves and orifices, melt the skin, enter the body, and continue incinerating the victim from the inside. It leaves an unforgettable impression on the enemies who survived the attacks. Gefreiter Stefan Heinewitz is in a bunker on Utah Beach when they are hit by thunderbolts carrying rockets armed with white phosphorus. The effect of these rockets was in some ways worse than the bombs. The warheads used some kind of incendiary material which exploded with a very intense white light and then burned and expanded with a hissing noise. I saw one of the first rockets detonate in this way against the other bunker. The white flames covered the structure and entered the hole that was blown in one side, all the time making this eerie hissing sound. Really, it sounded like an animal hissing or breathing. The other rockets hit our line in very rapid bursts, and our zone around the bunkers was absolutely filled with bright, pale flames. One rocket hit our blockhouse on the wall outside the pack gun aperture, and the explosion was completely blinding. This fire simply would not go out. It covered the pack crew and sank into their ammunition pile. There was complete panic and disorder at that point. The men near the pack were consumed in these white flames, including the weeping man on the ground and several injured men nearby. The uniforms of these men peeled off in scorched pieces, and their bare skin was set alight by the fire. 
Somebody threw open the steel door of the bunker and I hurled myself at it. Other men were competing with me to get out of that inferno in the bunker and we fought each other with our bare hands at the doorway. I made the mistake of looking back into the bunker through the door. I can tell you that the interior was a vision of hell, an obscene sight which remains with me. The white burning material was still expanding and burning alive the men who had not escaped through the door. Men were rolling and struggling on the floor in the flames. Some were clawing blindly at the walls, trying to feel the root out, with their faces all covered in smoke because their clothing was on fire. Pack rounds and MG rounds were detonating in there in the confined space, and the tracers were streaming from one wall to another, tearing up the bodies of men where they stood and lay. I backed away from the door as a couple of other men staggered out after me, with their backs and legs on fire. Finally, all I could see inside the bunker was the flickering white light of the incendiary and many flashes of exploding rounds. I learned afterwards that this material was a phosphorus weapon. It is a very powerful explosive chemical that the Allies were starting to experiment with. The devastating thing about this phosphorus was that the fire kept growing and expanding, and it flowed almost like a liquid, eating into anything it touched. My god, I saw some of the bodies of our troops in the trench lines that had been hit by these rockets. The bodies were reduced to skeletons, very black and charred, as all the body material was burnt off and consumed. I confess that I was terrified at the sight, not knowing how soon the Thunderbolt planes would come back and strike us again. Would this happen to me within a minute, or five minutes, or six? Would I be reduced to this skeletal state soon? I was left stunned, incapable of action, for a few moments. As the 14th hour of D-Day ends, the fighting is getting more and more dispersed into battles for choke points and controlling defense positions. If the Allies want to meet their objectives, to take Caen, Bayeux, and Carentan by the end of the day, they need to hurry up and get their communication and movement issues resolved. We will see how that progresses when we return for Hour 15 of D-Day. This Hour of D-Day coverage is dedicated to what D-Day meant to Jews the world over to those suffering in Nazi custody or desperately hiding from their reach, as well as those in neutral and allied countries fearing the worst, or fighting them in uniform or as partisans. By 1944, this war is affecting all of humanity. Millions have already died, and the dying and suffering is not over. Jews in Europe, which was where the vast majority lived when the war began, will suffer more than most. No other group will see as large a portion of their people perish. 68% of European Jews will die before the war is over. The vast majority murdered by the Nazis. In June 1944, over 5 million Jews have already perished in the Holocaust, and as we have seen over the years of our coverage, the world knows. In the minds of the Nazis, Jews are the enemy they think they are fighting. Driven by anti-Semitic delusions, they began this war with the genocidal intentions. Ordinary men, women, and children who make up only 2.5% of Europe's population and have nothing to do with the imagined troubles of the Nazis' mythical German race are targeted by the Nazis for extermination. The evidence of what D-Day means to them is only fragmentary and we will never know the full picture, but one glimpse is provided by Anne Frank when she wonders, is this really the beginning of the long-awaited liberation the liberation we've all talked so much about, which still seems too good, too much of a fairy tale ever to come true. And goes on to talk about the long wait and her relief that she has the feeling the friends are on their way to deliver them from oppression and threat from the German Nazis. She makes a special point of how important this moment is when she writes that the thought of friends and salvation means everything to us. She also points out that she's aware of how much it means for everyone who is under Nazi occupation and a hope for a return to school and normality. 
Of course, the Jewish experience on this day is as diverse as humanities in general. Naval officer Tracy Sugarman is commanding LST 491 landing men on Utah Beach just as dusk falls. In many ways, he is just like so many other American men in this invasion. His letters to his wife June and the months leading up to D-Day reveal a mixture of excitement, boredom, and homesickness. His last letter before Neptune closes with the sentence, Buy it for a little, angel. Remember, I love you with all my heart, always. But he may also have a slightly different attitude towards the liberation of Europe than many of his comrades. Early next year, he will tell June of a letter he found from one of his men containing an anti-Semitic joke about Jews at home profiting from the war. He will confront the author directly. I don't think it's funny. My brother in France doesn't think it's funny. And my cousin in the paratroops who was killed on D-Day doesn't think it's funny. Looking back on this moment, he will remember how frustrated he was at many of his countrymen's narrow-mindedness and lack of appreciation for what the fighting in Europe was about. For too many of the Americans, this war was not really our war. It was their war. It is 2 p.m. on D-Day, and in this hour, the news rings liberty, literally. After the messages of success based on Churchill's speech at the House of Commons a couple of hours ago, which gave no details, the BBC now quotes military sources inside Shafe that two beachheads have been secured in Normandy. The two beachheads are, of course, a reference to the Western First Army's and Eastern Second Army's overall position, not the five sections of those two beachheads. This is how CBS military expert Major George Fielding Elliott reacts to that news. Perhaps the most important news that we have received since the all-important news that invasion had begun. This report from the British radio that two beachheads, not bridgeheads, the bridgehead is a river crossing, have been secured by the Allies in France. This is supported by the report just received that the Allies are penetrating inland and uh, by a report picked up from the Paris radio which says that the battle in the Cotentin Peninsula, that is the Normandy Peninsula, as it has been called in other broadcasts, where uh, the city of Cherbourg is, seems to be gaining depth. If we have, in fact, established two beachheads, as the British radio has announced, and as there is, therefore, every reason to believe, we have made a successful landing. We have carried through the first phase of our operations successfully. We are established on the uh, European shore, and are developing from those beachheads our operations inland against the enemy communication. We must expect the enemy to counterattack as soon as he has collected sufficient forces for the purpose. By now, it is morning across America and Canada, and as people wake up and get the news, they stay glued to their radios. The same goes for the British Commonwealth countries, where it is now going towards, or already, evening. The morning papers are out in North America, and second editions of the evening papers are coming out in Australia, British India, and New Zealand. Operation Neptune dominates the front pages with headlines like, Invasion! Canadians in the thick of it as allies smash inland. Hitler's Europe invaded. Greatest military operation in history begins in France. Allies drive into France. Losses below expectations. In Philadelphia, Mayor Bernard Samuel is with a radio team at the Liberty Bell in Independence Hall. The Liberty Bell, bearing the inscription, Proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof, was one of the bells that rang in the first public reading of the U.S. Declaration of Independence on July 8, 1776. It is famously cracked and has not been rung since 1846. Today is the day, destined to go down in history as one never to be forgotten, for it's hurled the beginning of liberation for the countless millions of enslaved peoples throughout German-dominated Europe. And to those millions, the landings of the Allied troops spell the precious words of liberty. Standing as a symbol of our priceless freedom through the years is the American symbol of liberty, the Liberty Bell in Independence Hall, Philadelphia. Silent through the years, this bell once more peals out the strokes of liberty to symbolize the day of liberation for the enslaved peoples from Independence Hall in Philadelphia. WIP brings to its listeners 
The Seven Strokes of Liberty from the world-famed Liberty Bell. The seven tinny strokes symbolize each letter in the word liberty. The broadcast is syndicated on radio stations across the U.S. and Canada and ushers in prayer meetings that are being announced later in the day for churches, workplaces, and public institutions across both countries. Back in Normandy, in an orchard near the press headquarters in Bernier-sur-Mer, General Rodney Keller, commander of the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division, gives the first Allied Expeditionary Force press conference on French soil. The details from that conference will reach the world in a few hours. Meanwhile, the first reports from the press detail attached to Eisenhower outside of Portsmouth are broadcast. For CBS and NBC, it is pool reporter Merrill Mueller reporting. Before he turns to Eisenhower's first press briefing of the day, he describes the morning and night of nervous waiting, and then the humble secret camp they are in. Otherwise, the tent show is a tree-shaded terrace and three pieces of deck chair furniture. You have to tear your eyes from the general to note these things because he holds your interest completely. When you appreciate his tremendous command of facts and figures, duplicated, I think, only by General Marshall, you understand why he was picked for this assignment. It is not opportune to release the details of our briefing on behalf of the general, except in three general ways. One, he wanted all the credit for this campaign to go to the common soldiers of the Allied Army, and he emphasized the lower ranks and the word Allied. His order of the day takes that vein. Two, he had nothing but praise for the untiring efforts an inexhaustible research of his various staffs and his various commanders for air, sea, armies, and supplies. Three, as to the actual plan itself, perhaps I can best put it this way. I have been in on all of General Eisenhower's amphibious assaults, but none was as involved or as mammoth as this one. Last-minute headaches? Yes, the general had a last-minute headache, and he expressed it beautifully when he suddenly jumped from his chair and said, Good heavens! There's some sunshine. Otherwise, the invasion of Europe had already been pat for days. We came out of the tent and strolled toward his proudest, newest possession, just the general and myself. He praised his new mobile office, a super deluxe job built into a 10-ton truck and trailer and presented to him by the Lockheed workers here. And then I asked him about his own nerves. He stopped hatless in the sun. He is supposed to be phlegmatic, but he said quietly, I'm so gall darn nervous, I boil over. He's not supposed to show it. He didn't either. I caught him only twice, wringing his hands or jiggling his English change. But I like reporting that he is human enough to feel what the lowliest of his troops feel. As nervous as Ike may be, he can now check one box for certain success, his press operations. Freedom is being wrung across the United Nations Alliance countries and in occupied territory inside the Axis terror system, he has lit the beacons of hope for a return to freedom, dignity, and humanity. At Gold Beach, there is also a box checked for success, one that will save lives and increase the likelihood of the Allies holding the beachhead. At 225, the Sherwood Yeomanry Rangers have captured those two 75mm guns up at WN39, up on the cliffs between Arromanche and saint Comé. This is a big deal. They count that just one of the big guns there fired 124 shots down at Jig Beach. But beyond that, capturing this allows the second Devons to really push past towards Ri. They will take it just after 4.30, and at 7.30 this evening, D Company of the First Hamps will take the radar station at saint Comé and 40 prisoners. The fight of the U.S. Airborne en Cotentin is far more fluid, and many boxes remain to be checked before a victory can be called. Being out of the swamps and out of sight for the time being from German pursuers has given Colonel Johnson's small band of men from the 501st time to catch their breath. Johnson knows, of course, that staying too close to the main road is an invitation for trouble. Instead, he moves his group to La Barquette Dam, which was already under their control. Here, they can not only prepare a much stronger defensive perimeter, but also keep a tight grip on this vital point. Johnson assesses the odds of assaulting nearby saint Combe du mont 
That small Norman town was the original main objective of the 501st, since it sits right on the main road leading to Carantan. Johnson sends men out to recon the area, but they come back with pessimistic news. The terrain between saint Combe du mont Road and the La Barquette Dam is as flat and as swampy as it gets, with little to no cover, and the only high ground in the area is in the hands of the enemy, with saint Combe du mont situated on the highest ground of all. If they move out against the town unsupported and get caught in the open, well, for now, Johnson stays put and hopes that more paras make their way to La Barquette. And indeed, there are other larger groups of survivors of the 501st still active in the area. Robert Ballard's is like two kilometers to the north of La Barquette at a place called Haute Adeville. Richard Allen's is also pretty close at La Basse Adeville. Just like Johnson, both Ballard and Allen tried to strike westward on their own in the hopes of threatening saint Combe du Mont, but the Germans made this approach impossible. Instead, they both opted to save what they could and retreated to a safer distance. Alone, they are indeed in no position to challenge the German firepower on the high ground. But getting all three groups together might tip the scales. So Johnson, who is in contact with both groups via radio and runners, now orders Ballard and Allen to move out and join him at La Barquette. With the spearheads of the 4th Division moving inland, and linking up with many elements of the 101st Airborne, there are now many incidents where lost paratroopers are found and returned to their units. Also, throughout the night, many were captured by the Germans. Some were overwhelmed after surviving the jump. Others lost their weapons or were injured upon hitting the ground. Landing in the middle of a group of Germans, it was often safer to throw down your gun and surrender than try to fight unbeatable odds. Those paratroopers and glider men captured during the morning hours were naturally disarmed of their grenades, knives, and ammunition, and most of their kit was taken away. The Germans also have the habit of leaving their captives with only one boot on, so that running away would be more of a challenge. POWs were then marched to nearby farmhouses, chateaus, or hamlets, where they were locked into basements and cellars. Here, they remained for most of the morning and the early afternoon. Their captors have neither the means to transport the prisoners nor to properly interrogate them. But with the battle unfolding all around, the Americans might find and free their captured comrades before the Germans can move them. Many of the chateaus and farmhouses have been and are surrounded and besieged with machine gun bullets and bazooka rounds smashing against the walls. More often than not, though, the attackers are not aware that they are attacking a makeshift prison, so the trapped POWs are in real danger of getting killed alongside the German garrison. Trying their best to get their comrades' attention, they yell and scream over the noise of battle, or wave shirts and other uniform pieces like flags out the windows. Still, the subject of taking prisoners during the first hours of the invasion is a difficult one to assess. It is by no means guaranteed that the agitated and frightened German soldiers will not simply shoot any paratrooper they encounter on sight, surrendering or no. The same goes for the Americans, who have been drilled to kill by any means necessary. Many airborne commanders specifically task their men with not taking prisoners until after they link up with the seaborne invasion force. Fighting a guerrilla war, the airborne forces also have neither the time nor the space and means to keep the enemy subdued. So being trapped in a kill or be killed scenario, neither side is that keen on taking too many chances with the enemy's intentions of surrendering. Those who are might still resort to breaking ankles and wrists with their rifle butts to keep the enemy out of the fight. Because simply locking someone away in a farmhouse or barn might just buy them time until they can get rescued or break out on their own. Now, the airborne on Cotatan may well need some help from the men who have landed on Utah, and one of them is more than determined to provide it. At 2 p.m., Colonel Edson Raff from the 507th PIR drops in at the beach at the head of a special task force with 17 Sherman tanks from the 746th Tank Battalion and four armored Greyhound scout cars. To any of you out there who know the name Edson Rath, 
You may be wondering, why the heck is he commanding a bunch of armor? This is the guy, after all, who's been training paratroopers for several years, commanded the 509th during Operation Torch, and is on the record as saying that jumping out of a plane to him is like getting out of bed in the morning. Why didn't he jump this morning? Well, Raph is pretty outspoken and does not see eye to eye on a lot of things with Matt Ridgway, the big kahuna, about this whole operation today. Ridgway figured that the paratroopers that landed this morning would take a bunch of small towns and villages, but would need big guns and an armored punch to hold them. So he's put Raph in charge of this force, whose special assignment is to hit the beach and then race for San Mariglis and bring that punch to them. Raph really does not like this task at all, but he is a master jumper and this is a tricky jump and he has actually commanded an ad hoc armored force before in North Africa. Well, like it or not, he lands with Task Force Raph as this hour begins. With 40 infantrymen of the 401st Glider Infantry riding on the hulls of the tanks, they will try to reach the town and take it by surprise, not knowing who of their guys and who of the enemy might be there. Along the way, they are to keep their eyes and ears open and achieve what radios can seemingly not, make contact with as many paratroopers of the 82nd Airborne as possible. The situation at Oma is still more complex. The Americans have made progress, but there is still German resistance. Now making its way towards Colville sur mer is the 1st Battalion of the 16th. All three of its companies have a tough time slowly penetrating the Bocage, though, encountering German snipers and machine gun squads, as well as sporadic mortar and artillery fire. Contact with the enemy is pretty much continuous throughout this countryside of sunken rows and hedgerows. The Germans, although lacking an overall plan, are proving to be excellent at delaying and counterattacking the advancing Americans in small groups, the thick foliage of the surrounding trees and hedges being excellent help in concealing their ambushes. The battalion moved through the 16th, which had had heavy casualties, to the west edge of colville sur mer by following sunken roads and hedge lines. The Germans had most of the gates and breaks in the hedges zeroed in with rifles and machine guns, and several of our men were lost as they advanced. It might be well to bring out at this time that this fighting is much different than any encountered before by this division. The ground is covered with trees and hedgerows, making concealment excellent, but observation is practically non-existent. Fighting is at very close ranges, and this increases the difficulty. At the east end of Omaha, Company L has now finally repulsed the German counterattack by the fork in the road. Supported by Companies I and K, the men continue forward over open terrain into Le Grand Amo. See, by mid-afternoon, the German defenders in general are left with an increasingly bleak choice. They can either stay and hang on to their continuously shrinking perimeters in the hopes that they'll somehow get reinforcements, or they can flee to the south and yield the coastline to the overwhelming firepower of the Americans. So now, with Virville and Le Grand Amo in Allied hands, and Colville at least halfway there, more and more Germans are choosing option B to escape being trapped. But time is running out. The Americans now hold nearly all of the ways through which the Germans could escape, or through which their reinforcements would have to arrive. Only three paved roads lead from Omaha Beach South. Two of those are in American hands. The third one, from Saint Laurent to Formigny, is still controlled by the Germans, but if the Americans can take Saint Laurent, then this will fall as well, and then anyone left in the area will be trapped. It's not as clear as on Utah, but as the troops on Omaha move inland, they too are connecting with the airborne of the 101st. Speaking of airborne troops, we haven't yet had time to look at their training, their equipment, and the different ways they are expected to fight. Let's have a look. There are no accidental paratroopers in the British and American airborne forces, and no one is pushed out of a plane. Each and every one is a volunteer, specially selected and well-trained to do one of the most dangerous jobs in the war. 
for D-Day, the paratroopers are, as we've seen, to jump into hostile territory and secure objectives vital to the success of the whole operation. But once the Wehrmacht is alerted to their presence, then all hell breaks loose to not only survive, but to fight their way through the madness on the ground. They need the best weapons, gear, and equipment available. Once dropped behind enemy lines, they cannot expect to be supplied or even reinforced for a long period of time, and must fight largely autonomously. If need be, paratroopers take on the role of assault troopers, guerrilla fighters, and sometimes even commandos to overcome enemy resistance. So their equipment must be equally versatile, specially selected, and often manufactured particularly to meet their demands in the field. Even regular infantry equipment is often modified, lightened, or otherwise altered to be useful for aggressive small unit search and destroy missions, from boots to rifles to anti-tank guns. The U.S. conducted experiments with military parachuting throughout the 1930s, but none of this was ready when they entered the war in Europe. To build up their 82nd and 101st Airborne Forces as quickly as possible, U.S. High Command naturally studied how the German Fallschirmjäger performed. The early American jumpsuits were basically nothing more than modified coveralls that resembled the German Knochensack that was to be worn over the regular uniform. It was not before mid-1942 that they issue the first lightweight drab jacket. Its most notable features are the slashed breast pockets and the deep cargo pockets on the sides. The pants still pretty much resemble the German design, but they're baggier. They have multiple slanted pockets to give the para faster access to his equipment and a sewn-in belt at the waist. At first, the U.S. thought of issuing a new helmet, and the first airborne trials were indeed performed with aviator or indeed football helmets. Soon, though, they simply settle on the standard turtle helmet, but with a stronger chin strap or chin cup to it. Among the most innovative designs in the American Airborne is probably the freshly designed Corcoran jump boots. Laced up tightly, these high jump boots made out of reinforced leather provide excellent support for ankles, toes, and heels. Unlike the British, the Americans did not have a standard parachute, and only by 1940 introduced their first military version, the T-4. The T-4 was a designated static line chute, meaning that it was hooked to a line inside the plane and would automatically deploy with the trooper jumping out of the plane. Its canopy was around 9 meters in diameter and made out of silk or nylon. But also unlike the British, the U.S. issues its paratroopers reserve parachutes just in case the first one fails to deploy. But although that offers some kind of life insurance during the jump, it also burdens the trooper with an extra bulk slung across his chest. The T-4's reserve had to be attached vertically to the harness via snap hooks, which left very little room for additional items to be stuffed into the breast pockets. By 1942, the improved T-5 is introduced, which solves this problem. Now the reserve can be worn horizontally across the chest, so it allows for other equipment to be carried underneath. The T-5 also has a quick release mechanism attached to it, nicknamed the Bang Box. It allows the paratrooper to quickly detach himself from the chutes. After landing, of course. For fighting the Germans, each paratrooper is issued two fragmentation grenades, the Mark II Pineapple, which can be thrown or fired from a rifle. Also one white phosphorus smoke grenade, which produces a hot flame and can also be used as an improvised anti-personnel grenade. And one M18 smoke grenade, which produces a colored cloud of smoke. The Americans offer their airborne forces a wide arsenal of weapons. Most common among regular troopers is the semi-automatic rifle M1 Garand. Clip-fed, it weighs only 4.3 kilos, but has to be safely stored in a Griswold bag or another padded drop bag because of its size. Sometimes paratroopers opt for attaching the rifles to their harnesses to have them ready instantly upon landing, but this is both risky and dangerous. An alternative is the M1 carbine, which is both shorter and lighter, weighing only 2.5 kilos. A special paratrooper version, the M1A1, has a folding tubular shoulder stock and a pistol grip. A favorite for close combat is the 45 caliber Thompson submachine gun, both M1 and M1A1. Each company is allotted six submachine guns, 
And the dedicated gunner usually carries 20 or 30 round box magazines. Technically, there is also the 50 round drum magazine in case they want to go full Chicago typewriter style on the Germans. However, many feel that that drum is too cumbersome and unwieldy because of its weight and size. To have more ammo ready, the paras simply tape two box magazines together. Speaking of ammo, each paratrooper is issued 150 rounds of ammunition. These are spent quickly during firefights, and since that supply is finite, there are many men who wear extra bandoliers or stuff extra ammo inside their canteens. No one wants to face the Germans with an empty gun. Another option is the M3 and M3A1 grease gun. Firing the same 45 caliber, the grease gun is a little lighter than the Thompson. At first, each paratrooper was issued a sidearm, usually an M1911, but as the force has increased in size, only a fraction of the men have received additional handguns. For heavier support fire, the men are issued the Browning automatic rifle. As an assault rifle, the BAR can also be fixed to a bipod and operated in the role of a light machine gun. But for the real full auto experience, the Paras are given both the Browning 30 and 50 calibers. These are, however, often considered too heavy for a single leg bag and have to be dropped in in containers. Same goes for the 60 millimeter M2 mortar. This portable mortar can fire high explosive shells, smoke, or illumination rounds. There are attempts to drop in the heavier 75 millimeter and 105 millimeter howitzers as well. Each comes in nine different boxes on color-coded parachutes. But searching for nine different containers in the middle of the night in enemy-held territory to assemble a single howitzer, that sounds like a real nightmare. They decide it's safer for Waco gliders to bring them in. Against German armor, each para company is equipped with the modified bazooka, the M9. 1.55 meters long, the M9 can be broken into two sections and is fired by an impulse magneto in its handle. Designated demolition troopers carry C2 demolition blocks and TNT, as well as Hawkins light anti-tank mines. In their demo kit, they also store walkie-talkies, as well as fuses and detonator cords. Ideally, the paratroopers remain unseen and unnoticed as long as possible, at least until they have found their equipment and located other members of their outfit. So, it isn't just about guns and grenades. Sometimes, the most important thing a paratrooper can have is a compass worn on the wrist like a watch, or the basic first aid pouch with field dressings, morphine, and a tourniquet. Many men also store extra compresses on their helmets. Then there is the standard infantryman stuff, entrenching tools, ammo pouches, cleaning and maintenance tools like oil or grease bottles. The standard field pack is filled with ration packs, soap, extra laces, a shaving kit and toothbrush, cigarettes, and a Zippo lighter. Paratroops carry an additional survival kit, containing a map with escape and evasion routes, a small saw blade, binoculars, a flashlight, and some French currency. Paratrooper pockets are famously deep, both literally and figuratively. Each man packs a K-ration consisting of three meals, several D-rations, and chocolate bars, but although they are issued additional leg bags and separate containers, each man wants to carry as much equipment and ammunition on his person as possible. So many things can go wrong during a jump. The leg bag might snap loose, or the containers land on some rooftop among the enemy, but also every ounce counts, and each additional item increases the risk of injury upon landing. The Americans are not the only ones packing their bags full for D-Day, of course. By the time it comes to prepare for Normandy, the British Parachute Regiment has already gained valuable experience during Operation Torch and the invasion of Sicily. Already their reputation and ethos has attracted a lot of men that wanted to be part of an elite fighting force, but it is truly their equipment that embodies the airborne soldier of the modern age. The concept of military parachuting was still relatively new to Britain when the German Fallschirmjäger and glider infantry were overtaking airfields and fortifications in Denmark, Norway, and Belgium. Like the Americans, the British and Commonwealth Paras had to build up everything from scratch as quickly as possible. Resources were not exactly overabundant, so their early step-in smocks, 
paratroop jackets, and side lacing boots were almost direct copies of what the Fallschirmjäger used. It was obvious that much of the existing British uniforms and gear had to be either modified or specially manufactured to work under the parachute. The British standard helmet, for example, was totally unusable for jumping because of its wide brim, so they had to come up with a new design. The rubber Sorbo helmet resembles sort of a love child between a dispatch rider's helmet and headgear from Flash Gordon, right? I'm sure there's pictures. It was used for training purposes only until in 1942, the British introduced the round shell HSAT helmet for combat jumps. Around the same time, British Airborne Command authorized the iconic Maroon Beret as part of the outfit. By 1942, the Paras are also officially issued the Denison smock, which is worn over the standard 1937 battle dress. An additional oversmock is issued soon after, mainly as a safety precaution to prevent equipment from getting tangled with the rigging lines. The Denison is mostly made out of light denim material and also is the first official uniform piece in the British Army with a disruptive camouflage pattern on it. The smock has a long tail at its back that can be attached between the legs before the jump to keep the dress in place. Some paras also choose to wear MRC body armor underneath the smock. This is made up of three plates of manganese steel that cover the chest, lower belly, and back. Although a very modern idea, it proves unpopular since it causes chafing and restricts quick movement. When it comes to developing parachutes, the British settle on the standard X-Type already in 1940. The X-Type consists of four parts. The parachute itself is made out of silk, nylon, and Ramex cotton. It is separated into an inner and outer pack and the harness. The parachute's canopy is 714 centimeters in diameter and its rigging lines are 7.6 meters long. Unlike the American Airborne, the British do not offer their paras a reserve chute. Instead, they put their trust fully in the X-Type, reminding the Packers that every parachute is a man's life. But jumping and surviving the jump is one thing. Engaging the enemy in battle on the ground and fulfilling their objectives is another. For that, the British formed the Central Landing Establishment, which later became the Airborne Forces Experimental Establishment. Here, they experiment on how uniforms and equipment function under the parachute. The major problem is, of course, the weight. Training jumps with fully loaded kits are the most critical moments, leading to injuries and fatalities. So they have to find the delicate balance between outfitting each single trooper with as much equipment and ammunition as possible, but not overburdening him to the point where he will break his legs or his ankles on landing because of the weight attached to him. The weapons are mostly the same that regular British infantry carry into battle. Para riflemen either carry the traditional SMLE Mark III or the Lee Enfield No. 4 rifle. Because of their size, these rifles must be put in a specially designed jump bag, which of course takes additional time to sort out after a landing. Many favor the compact Sten Mark V submachine gun. With a detachable stock, the Sten does not need to be put in a case and can be directly attached to the harness itself instead. This is very handy if the para gets into a firefight directly after landing. For fire support, the Airborne is also issued 303 Bren light machine guns. With a 30 round magazine and a range of 550 meters, the Bren is highly effective for both mobile and defensive action. Many paras also wear the Fairbairn Sykes Commando Dagger, or the Camilla Stiletto, at a special pocket sewn into the battle dress trousers. The dagger is not only for the closest of combat situations, but is also useful for cutting oneself free from the rigging, like if the chute is caught on something. The introduction of the leg bag allows for an additional 45 kilos of weight to be carried in the jump. Dangling from the leg from a rope, the bag will always land first and thus decrease the risk of injury. But everything larger and heavier has to go into a separate drop container, the CLE. These supply containers are packed with ammunition, grenades, and the support weapons like the Piat recoilless rifle and the three inch mortar. I've already talked about the Piat earlier today. The three inch mortar can fire a wide array of useful grenades against enemy positions. 
Speaking of useful grenades, the Paras also carry the number 82 Gammon Bomb next to their frag grenades. This has been intentionally designed for the paratroopers, since its explosive load can be adjusted depending whether they're fighting infantry or armor. In case the men have to drag those containers somewhere, they are equipped with a toggle rope, which also helps them climb over obstacles or transport wounded troopers. The CLE containers have, of course, their own parachutes and an additional crash pan at the bottom, which absorbs the shock on landing. The chutes themselves are color-coded to let the paras easily identify what they carry so they don't have to rummage through each one looking for the right equipment. Further experiments have been made as to how to provide more mobility to the paras upon landing using those containers. Ideas include collapsible motorcycles and folding bicycles, lightweight jeeps and even full motorcycles. However, these are still mostly delivered by gliders. A special outfit among the airborne forces is the Pathfinders. These are paratroopers that drop in before the main force and mark the drop zones for those to follow, as we've seen. They are introduced by the same person who developed the leg bag, British Major John Lander. Fitting name. Pathfinders carry specialized equipment to fulfill their mission. They have ground identification panels, which are basically large colored sheets of fabric. 5G radio transmitters, and radar devices, the Eurekas. They also carry special smoke grenades and vary pistols that fire colored flares. The men ready to jump into battle today have been selected for being physically and mentally tough and filled with enough strength, drive, and determination to fight through hostile terrain. They are outfitted with the best weaponry and equipment available. Emphasis, though, on the word available. More than 13,000 paratroopers, American, British, Canadian, and other allies, will parachute into Normandy on D-Day. A large fraction of them still have little to no weapons or the gear that they are supposed to have upon landing. Estimates run as high as 60% loss when it comes to their equipment. Mortars, ammunition, radios are scattered all over, just not in the landing zone they are supposed to hit. It isn't uncommon that once the chute opens, the heavily packed pockets tear open, or the leg bag is ripped away during the descent. Turbulence, heavy weather, and German anti-aircraft fire are factors that are hard to anticipate and, and account for. Yet it is the paratrooper's unshakable can-do attitude that will either see them prevail or be destroyed on the ground. To prevent the Wehrmacht from sealing off the beaches, or blocking the roads and bridges. They must be two things above anything else, inventive and versatile. That means finding ways to fight with the equipment they have at hand, using German weapons if they have to, and generally being ready to kill and survive with whatever is available to them. And a place where they have had a decisive importance today is beyond any doubt, the bridges at Benouville. We had a look at that area of combat and the bridges when we were in Normandy last fall. And it's quite eye-opening to be on the ground. Paul, before we get into this, uh, I want to just say a few words, not really as a lead-in, but just something that's actually personal. This is the first time I've ever been in this location. I've read a great deal about it. I've seen films that cover it and stuff, but I've never actually been here before. And even just walking up, it really puts a lot of things in perspective. So I'd like you to tell us where we are, but I'd also like you to point to things so we can, so everybody else who's done, who knows as much as I do about this content can, can get a, the real, the real actual physical, you are there perspective, which changes everything. And everybody who doesn't can really see, see how it all fits together. Okay. So we are at what we now call Pegasus Bridge. At the time, Benouville Bridge is a canal bridge. A couple hundred yards that way is a river bridge. The now called Horsa Bridge, it was just a swing bridge made by Gustav Eiffel back in the day. Sword Beach, as it became, is a few miles north of me. Caen, the city, is behind us there. And this is the main road that crosses these two crossing points that is the only crossing point of the canal and the river between Caen and the beach. And the ridge of high ground over there 
is where the British 6th Airborne Division will be landing by parachute and glider in the early morning of D-Day and they are to hold that ground there to facilitate the move towards Caen, the vital crossroads town, the linchpin of the Normandy campaign. So the Airborne are over there, but to reinforce the Airborne, they've got to come from Sword Beach across these two bridges here. So these bridges are absolutely vital to everything that is built after this to make sure the success of the invasion is, is there. What strikes me standing here, I have been here a couple of times before, but what strikes me every time I come here is how close all of these different things are yeah. and how it's not. When you read it, you get this feeling of, well, we're in the middle of the countryside, yeah, yeah, but we're yeah. not. So explain to us a little bit what we're looking at, the different structures and, and how they're connected to each other sure. on that day. So there's a chateau over there. The, at the time, Benouville Chateau was a maternity hospital. Uh, it had children in there. There'd been some other people gathered there because of the pre-D-Day bombardment there. And there was a lady who was working there was a matron who was in pivotal to the information that was gathered about this area because she is supplying this information to the resistance that's going to the allies in, in England to prepare their understanding of just how important this area was. So that chateau is very integral to it. We've got buildings over there. Benouville is an, an urban environment. The bridge was always a busy one because it had a customs office and a control point. There were checkpoints. This is going back before the Germans are here. It was always an important artery. And then the church and the village kind of established themselves around the, the, the crossing point of the canal. That, it was that, that order rather than some villages just established. It was all about the crossing point of these, of these waterways. And when we talked about it now in the episode, I mean, of course, we described exactly what was happening with the snipers over there and they had to take them out and everything. When you look at it from here, right? I mean, you see exactly why that's a problem, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. you have the straight line going there right over to the bridge, which kind of, you fail to understand that until you really see it physically, what, what, what it means. Yeah. So, and they came down in gliders here, not in parachutes. Why is that? Well, it's simply because parachute troops take time to assemble on the ground. A stick of men, depending on what speed the aircraft is going, they may be scattered over half a mile or a mile or two. And here, every second counts. So getting men in one place together, and there's the next thing is silently. The Germans had this bridge patrolled 24 hours a day, pretty much. So if a, an aircraft bringing paratroopers comes into the area, they're gonna hear the engine noise. If they hear the engine noise, they're on alert, maybe, because we knew this from the resistance, they could detonate the charges, blow up the bridge, and we lose it as a crossing point. Gliders, however, silently bring in 32 fully laden men to one location, out they get, then a minute later a second glider and a third glider and then three more gliders for the other bridge over there. So this can happen almost within a blink of an eye and that's the reason of, of, of gliders. And, and 32 for a, a horse, up, probably a Mark I horse, it was an incredible amount of men because Major John Howard deliberately chose from the company the shorter guys. No okay. point taking in a glider load of Spartacus is because you only about to get 16 in the glider. Right, yeah. Take 32 little guys and you've got that much more firepower because everyone's got a Sten gun or a rifle. So 32 men in a, in a glider is amazing. What really blows my mind being here is how close the gliders are. Yeah. I, I, knew how, I, I know the numbers. It's but, insane, But, but when it? you see, I mean, it's right there. It's right there. Yeah. That, that's amazing. Um, well, I see they've got, um, they've got markers and stuff here now. Uh, that, no, that's really, really impressive. That's something that, yeah, well, we're, we're probably having footage right now showing how close the gliders are to the bridge. And yeah, as you say, patrol 24 hours and not seeing this coming. You know, yeah. that's, and, and it was probably one of the most excellent pieces of flying in World War II. Well, there probably is something that's annoyed me for years because it was Lee Mallory, who I always describe as the Eeyore of the Allied planners. He was a bit dour, a We've bit glum. We've talked about him a bunch in and, and Lee Mallory said after this, it was probably the most bit of, yeah, amazing bit of precision flying. And the thing that's amazing about it is it's not the ideal location to land gliders here. It's the only location. You can't land there, it's too urban. Can't land over there, it's urban. Can't land over there where the museum is today because that was all swampy. You've got this stretch of hard ground with the canal on one side and there's a pond over there. And then the gliders had to come from England, which is that way, do a big circular route on a church tower and then following the canal using their reflection, it's moonlight, of course, they can follow the canal there and then come in there and land. But because of the conditions that morning, they're coming in with a tailwind, which is less than ideal for a glider. The other big glider zones, the, the pilot's able to maneuver and come in, so he's into the wind to slow it down. But these guys are coming in with a tailwind behind them. 
And the nose of the first glider piloted by Jim Walwork, who was a fantastic guy and a, quite a good friend of mine. He brings that glider in at 15 minutes after midnight and the glider nose comes down and they know this 47 yards from the bridge. And there's some things, as you guys know, with history that we're, we're not certain about statistics. We know that because the guider pilots later on in the day got out a tape measure and they actually measured it. They knew this was cool. They knew they'd done the job and they went, yep, 47 yards, yes. which I've been here so many times. It's still insane they were able to do that in the middle of the night. For, yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. It's, and, and, and you're one chance. You can't loop around a second time. Bing it, bring in that glider, bang. And it was supposed to be 50, right? So, so yeah. So they, they, were, <laughs> they were three <laughs> yards closer. <laughs> But, but, but that, that had an bonus. advantage, that yes. had a real advantage. Yeah. The Germans know this is important. They, they've identified this and the Allies have identified this very early as a critical, critical point. So there's barbed wire perimeters all around this. The nose of that first glider had pierced through that outer string of barbed wire, which means the internal door on the glider is now on the inside of the barbed wire. So they're off and running towards that bridge. Grenades go in the five centimeter uh, German gun position, bang, bang, there's no one actually there. Off they go across the bridge there. Lieutenant Den Brotheridge, who's Major Howard's second in command, leading the way across the bridge there. And they're, they're kind of across the other side before the Germans have even really realized what's going on. I mean, I, I know Major Howard said that it took less than two minutes for them to be up and running. Might not be exactly two minutes, but- It's a very short space of time. It, yeah. it yeah. doesn't really matter if it was two minutes or it was four minutes. That's amazing. I mean, that's, that's, yeah. that, that doesn't happen normally. And, the, and the, we were very blessed that the morning of, uh, or the night of June the 5th, 6th, there was a rather popular and apparently rather affordable brothel in Benouville, and that's where a lot of the German uh, troops were that morning. We're going to visit that in just a little while. Yeah, well, we, if, again, you know, I mean, again after Mary. last night, yeah. Um, <laughs> and um, what was weird, and this is a little bit of kind of extra detail that I like to say, say is there's, it's almost certain that the two German sentries who were near the bridge that night were French customs guys in their 70s with great coats and helmets on who were paid to stand there overnight, and if a staff car came past, they kind of lift up their barrel. No one cared about saluting or checking past, and off they go. And they would pay these guys on the nights they're off at the, uh, the carousing. Right. And it was probably those two guys there that night who promptly just dropped their helmets, ran, you know, threw away the greatcoats and ran away. So there was no immediate response. Yeah. Without a doubt, it is part of the linchpin of the whole campaign, which is mm. Kao at the end of the day. But this is like, yeah, this is the linchpin of the linchpin, so to say, there's no question. But over the years, it's taken on sort of this like weird, almost mythical uh, existence, which kind of like belies a little bit actually how good they were at taking it. Because you get the feeling if you read some of the books that this was like a 12 hour fight that was really, really yeah. harsh and everything. And I'm, I, I, I'm saying, that that belittles the greatness of the operation. Yeah, yeah, and and it also ignores the great majority of the Sixth Airborne Division that are over there doing what they're doing, which is keeping the Germans away from this area. When we go to high ground later and see the view back towards Saw Beach, this is integral. But you also need the high ground over there because when the British start moving towards Caen from Saw Beach, if they've got a high ridge of high ground on their eastern flank occupied by the Germans with artillery and tanks and everything else, that's not fun at all. So those Sixth Airborne guys over there who are battling in villages like Ronville and Breville and Omfreville, they don't get the glory that these guys got because of the brilliance of this. I mean, Walwork, when he executed that landing there, and there's another glider a minute later and a minute after that, it's superb. And these guys are brilliant, but they are only the first step. And one of the things I think gets forgotten is that this is to seize these bridges to reinforce that division. But the division are landing by parachute, whether or not this goes ahead. Now, yeah. we now know that within 10 minutes of landing, they've sent the signal, ham and jam, for the successful of the bridges, uh, success, successful capture of the bridges. Interestingly, though, the actual message received by probably Seventh Parachute Battalion headquarters was ham and fucking jam because the, the signaler <laughs> was trying to get through, going ham and jam, ham and jam, yeah. ham, ham and fucking jam, and finally yeah. that's when the other guy picked up. <laughs> so that was the message that was sent, um, and they've got these two bridges there. But those guys are landing by parachute immediately. If these bridges are not seized, and in the worst case scenario, they're blown up by the Germans. Yeah that division over there have no means of easy support. I mean, you could say the same thing about the American Airborne having to rely on troops coming through from Utah, but there are 
various routes they can come across. This is one single road over yeah. one single crossing point of these two waterways. Everything is hinging on this one, one event going like clockwork. Okay, but there is one moment during the night when the bridge almost goes up, thanks to the Luftwaffe. And that was the bit of luck. It, it, you know, the bomb that they dropped was a dud and, and nothing happened. And spoilers now, because you'll be seeing this before the, the, the day is over. We do not meet the, or the Allies do not meet the D-Day objectives fully. They don't meet the D-Day objectives no. fully. No. So, now, assuming... I see where, I see where your question is going. Okay, <laughs> yeah. okay, go ahead, okay. Assuming that, you know, they wouldn't have taken Pegasus Bridge or taken Benoville Bridge, mm -hmm. they would still have had time to construct a new bridge and all of that. So, you know, with the D-Day objectives not met, is it really that important? Um... I always think it's actually the other bridge because this is the canal which has good solid banks and things and they actually threw up some Bailey bridges here within a matter of days that were used for Operation Goodwood in July. It's the river that for that distance over there that would be the trickier bridge, uh, that waterway to bridge. So yeah, they probably could have got the bridges over here fairly easy, but the, the whole, what became Horsa Bridge would be much more tricky, I think. So I think that's, if we have to identify a, a single bridge that had to be seized, it's Horsa Bridge, as it's now known, rather than Pegasus Bridge, is the vital one, because that's the more difficult one to, uh, to bridge later. How long would it have taken them to, to get over that bridge? Do you, I mean, why, I know it's a guess, but I mean, you know, are we talking hours, would days, or fire, would, would they, they exactly? A couple of days, maybe. I mean, the British have uh, engineers from the third division up in this area by, by early afternoon, mid afternoon on June the 6th, but that's li lightly equipped engineers have been on foot. The, the bridging gear is gonna take some time to come up. So we're, mm. that, yeah, every hour counts when you're a paratrooper are there on that high ground. Um, and, so. and you'd have Germans coming in from the from yeah. both sides. Yeah. So well, I mean, yeah. and, that, and that's the other thing. You know, Major Howard, who who was commanding D Company Oxenbuck's Light Infantry, I knew Major Howard quite well, and and he he was never really worried about the moving in and seizing the bridge because you're achieving tactical surprise. Right. You know, it's coming as we said, coming out of the darkness silently. It's holding it because. Saw Beach is nine miles away. The estimated time of arrival for the commandos, who are not actually reinforcing the bridge, they're moving through to the high ground. That's midday. So you're talking, these gliders are landing just after midnight. So that's 12 hours before yeah. the first reinforcements are due to arrive. And you've got 21st Panzer, who, as we know, had been a pretty elite formation out in North Africa. They're lesser, lesser threat in 44 than they had been. But their closest elements are five or six miles away. And they're in tanks. So when your reinforcements are 12 miles away and their commandos on foot with a few bicycles and there's German tanks just down the road, <laughs> that, that's Howard's worry. And, and the ridiculous thing is, is when the first, we still haven't determined if it's a Marder or a Stug or whatever, but a German armored vehicle comes up from through Bernouville and there's a British guy with a Piat, um, Wagger Thornton his name was, and he fires a couple of bombs and the first one misses and the second one misses, but he hits this vehicle. And one of the versions of the story is it hit a stowage panel on the side of the vehicle and all these flares go off, yellow and blue and pink and stuff goes off. And the Germans following are possibly alarmed by that and what the hell have those allies got there in terms of anti-tank fire and they kind of fall back a bit. Okay. And if it maybe hadn't hit that stowage bit, I mean, it's one version of the story. Yeah, we still the haven't decided where the vehicle was knocked out and whether, what type of vehicle it is. But the point is, the first probe by 21st Panzer has this kind of lucky bit where it, it, it bumps into a unit that isn't very strong, but they perceive it for being stronger than because it is. Because of events, yeah. Because right. of events and just circumstances. And 21st Panzer back off and do things elsewhere. And then finally, and this is the bit of the story that is in the Longest Day film and everyone knows, is that there are guys, and I knew some of these guys, they're sitting there, they've been holding all day. There's been some sporadic action. There's been the fire coming from the chateau. The Germans probably dragged a 20 millimeter cannon up there that's raking the bridge there. And they're saying, what the hell's that noise? And they can hear this, no, 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 what is it? And it sounds like bagpipes. And then they realize it is bagpipes. And elements of Lord Lovett's commandos arriving with his personal piper, Bill Millen, and they do hear na, 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 na. And up come the pipers. There had actually been a few commandos who had already crossed at that point, uh, uh, one of the troops on bicycles. But when they see Lord Lovett arriving and they have the piper there, the sense of relief against, um, amongst these guys, was, you know, you could have sensed it because it's the, the link up has occurred. This vital moment when the troops on the beach have got here, yeah, I said they're not staying, they're going up the high ground and then Still. Major Howard can go, yeah. job done. And I think I always would like to get across the idea that although Eisenhower probably wasn't aware of this immediately, 
if you're planning or overseeing something as complex and complicated and vast as Overlord, if the first bit goes well, yeah. which this is the first bit, that's a good piece of the jigsaw puzzle on that board there to go, right, it's okay, fun. that's it, we've got it done. And this is an exceptionally um, uh, uh, bit of action here, unfolded almost perfectly, and it starts everything so, off. I mean, wasn't Love It late? It was a minutes. few minutes late. <laughs> yeah, what's a few minutes between friends and the, and yeah, that? But he yeah. did apologize. He did apl <laughs> profusely. Yeah, yes. and, and in For the being movie, fifteen minutes late. <laughs> yeah, he he actually carries on across the bridge with the piper piping across the bridge. And Bill Millen told me years ago, he said, uh, everyone thinks I piped across the bridge there, but we're he mentioned the shadows. We're under fire from snipers and machine gun fire. He said. The only way to cross that bridge on D-Day was, was crouching. He said, you can't crouch and play the bagpipes no. at the same time. So had been playing the bagpipes, stopped playing the bagpipes, got to the other side again, carried on with the bagpipes again over there, but not across the bridge. At the previous bridge over at St. Mary Glees, we saw a more traditional bite and hold tactic where you're holding a whole region uh, in order to control that and control crossroads and everything. This is kind of an evolution of that because we're seeing one point where you bisect all of Normandy, so it's really cut in two, and it creates a lot of problems for the Germans. I think you've covered something kind of similar happening on the Eastern Front, which is a new thing in this war, right? Okay, well, what you're seeing then, this is on a, in, a, in a micro version, a very micro version here, would be sort of a mid point, not an end game, but a mid game of like real Bevegon's Creek and Blitzkrieg theory. Like, okay. Starting, you know, Bevegon Creek wasn't just German, it was the mobile warfare. It started with the Prussians because they knew they were going to be outnumbered against pretty much everyone they were fighting, but they had the tactics and weapons up, so they had to have the mobile warfare since they couldn't fight a battle of attrition. And this carried over into the German Empire, even though they did have manpower by then since they had all the rest of the empire. But when you see it at its most successful, and let's say the beginning stages of Barbarossa as an example, right? The armored spearheads go out, but they don't just, they're not just driving straight ahead randomly and then stop and wait for the infantry. They really are trying, like the cauldrons they were seizing, like around Kiev, seizing 600,000 people in here. They reach a point, like this point, they reach a point where you have now left the enemy with a binary situation. They have, they have two, two, two things, they, there's not... There's not like, 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 for example, if the 21st Panzers had come here, right? Yeah, then yeah. they would have, they would have had, they would have had options. Yeah, they would have exactly. Options. But once it's taken, there's two options and, and it's closed down. And that is, that, that, that is where you will have a successful Bevegan Street Blitzkrieg. It's a lot easier to lead to stage three, taking 600,000 prisoners or whatever. But on the other side, that can easily fail which, like we saw in July 1942 during Fall Blau, the, the world's biggest traffic jam when the things were not taking as many prisoners as Hitler would have liked. And Bach and Liszt are saying, no, we're still taking plenty of land, this is fine, we're, they're going back, but the, the Soviets had by then not, not learned to effectively counter, say, Panzer Warfare or Blitzkrieg, but to counter the large gaps, the, the, the plan B, the point taking, of, of the Bevegans Creek because they took all the land but there were no prisoners. It was no longer a binary situation. The Soviets were willing to give up endless miles of territory in order to avoid being put into an A or B situation which led to Hitler rearranging the armies and sending the 4th Panzer Army down to Rostov where there's already a Panzer Army and creating the world's biggest traffic jam and running out of fuel and having three or four days with tens of thousands of vehicles just sitting around Rostov while the Soviets get to reorganize, bring everybody towards Stalingrad, six armies walking to Stalingrad basically with its flanks exposed and we all know what happened to that later on. So yeah, you can really see the success and failure, but creating the binary situation, that's absolutely key. What we're seeing here, because of the evolution of warfare into a mobile war on both sides at the end of the day, is an evolution of bite and hold into bite and hold to interdict. Now. We're going to talk about traffic jams within that context in a, in a, in a different segment of this, uh, of, of this event. But here, when uh, Benoville Bridge and what is now Horsa Bridge are taken, the Germans are left with two options. How does that influence the rest of the day? Well, the 21st Panzer is not 
a real threat anyway because it's not had its vehicles replaced. Lots of Marder, lots of maybe Mark IVs. They haven't got the Panthers and the Tigers. But now they are into this option of they've either got to go, because Corrie is that way, they've either got to go and try and attack the British Airborne on the ridge, which is forested, woods, difficult movement there, or they've got to try and focus on that side and go towards Saw Beach. So an already less than effective Panzer Division is now split into two parts of a Panzer Division because they don't have the options of, if they have this, given we're sitting within you know, a five centimetre pack here, is there's already a defence around this. If the 21st Panzer had got here, they can then make this into one of those classic Normandy kind of hedgehog positions and hold it. And it gives them options, theoretically, to go this way, go that way. But because the Allies have it, the Germans are reduced to, to two choices, neither of which are good and neither of which ultimately pay off for them. Uh, and when they do make a final push, eventually when their commanders decide what they're going to do, and an element is sent, sent off towards um, the gap that has now established itself between Juno and Sword Beaches. It's too small, there's not enough tanks in it, it's been too late coming, and they get there and they bump into basically anti-tank units of the British and Canadian armies, and it all ends up in, in, in burning panzers. panzers. So it, it, the 21st Panzer's fear, uh, fear effect, because the Allies were, they were worried about 21st Panzer. You don't want to be landing a airborne division on a division that you've come up against in North Africa who have bested you on, on previous occasions. Paratroopers with Lee Enfields and Sten guns. But in the end, the 21st Panzer just didn't do that, didn't do enough to live up to their reputation because partly of their options being reduced. We are going to see the choice that 21st Panzer does make and how reduced it has been because of what we just talked about. Mm -hmm but also because of traffic jams. Yeah. So, Paul, now we are at Breville Ridge and we're looking back towards we were where we were only a couple of seconds ago, basically. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Uh, explain how this whole bite and hold strategy that we saw at Pegasus Bridge ties into this place and how it all comes together, because now we've got the whole vista in front of us. Well, the first thing is, so the bridge is down there in the village. The bridge is, as we said earlier, it's the connecting area between the two potential means the Germans had of moving towards the, the, the beaches and to stop this invasion. But the point about the ridge is, this is the left-hand flank of the Allies. This everything else that happens on D-Day is happening that way from us. And the 6th Airborne Division are jumping by parachute onto this ridge over here to occupy this area. Nearly 100 gliders are going to be landing into those two fields down there by the end of June the 6th, June the 7th to reinforce this division, to hold this area here and make sure we've just got that firm flank position in there to base everything else from. Okay, so if Pegasus falls, they're facing two fronts. If right? Pegasus yeah. falls, then the Germans control the road network there, which means the Allies don't get the reinforcements from sword to here, which means the British Airborne Division is essentially isolated and overrun, and the Germans are then here with their artillery, potentially armor, using the forests and wooded area down there to move in and out of to kind of keep away from Allied air power, and then they can keep that whole area there under fire. And indeed, it takes the Allies a month to move from Saw Beach over there to Caen over there, and they are moving through that open experience area there, but they're doing so under a protection of this carpet of Allied soldiers in the British Airborne here for three months because they do hold this ridge. It's all about this ridge. How many roads are there, lateral roads back there? So we can see from here about three or four, and there's another two or three beyond that. Right at the distance, there's a water tower kind of in the sunlight over there. And this, these are the arterial roads. There's cars going past us right down there that are going to be moving under the threat of this. And so there is German artillery here. I don't want to say there is none. What it is, though, it's been pushed back beyond where okay. we can see. And they, right. they have no observation about to hit that area there with any kind of uh, chance of hitting anything. Wow. Okay, back to June 6, 1944. This hour, 10 hours after the original request, the 12th SS Panzer Division and the Panzer Lehr Division are verbally released by the OKW. For good measure, the OKW throws in the entire 1st SS Panzer Corps, a request by OB West that was made only moments before the release. They will all be subordinated to the command of Hierasgruppe B, in other words, Rommel. The order by OB West ends with, with the known rapid biting of the enemy, it is essential to destroy the enemy as quickly as possible. 
The 12th SS Panzer Division is to return from Lisieux and deploy south of Caen past 21st Panzer Division on the left. Panzer Lea Division shall move immediately towards the Flair Vire area. In effect, that means that it is unlikely they will see any action today. Yep, it looks like Rundstedt has decided that he needs to form a defensive line further back to give the Germans a chance to live to fight another day. It's early for such decisions, and he has not explicitly said that this is what he is doing. We shall see what happens when we return for hour 16 of D-Day. Hour 16, part one. It's 3 p.m. in the afternoon on D-Day, the 16th Wait, hour. It's of not the 3 p.m. in the afternoon. It's either 3 p.m. or 3 Why in the did afternoon. You write it like that. I didn't yeah. write it that. I, I did not put the a.m. You put the a.m. in. I wrote that it was 1500, and you I changed didn't write it. that. Well, it's either 3 p.m. or 3 in the afternoon. Yeah, it is. Yeah, Pick one. Right. Yeah, okay, fine. Okay. Leave this in. Editor. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> sure, why not? Don't, 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 why not? Yeah. Leave it in. Yeah. Okay, it fine. Okay. <laughs> now it's 3 a.m. in the afternoon in my head. Okay, okay. wait. Okay. okay. It's, it's 3 in the afternoon. <clears throat> it's 3 in the afternoon on D-Day, the 16th hour of the day, but the action is far from finished. Though in general, the fighting has moved off the beaches and is at localized points inland, there are a great many of these localized points. Sitting tight at La Barquette, Johnson's paratroopers of the 501st have spent most of the afternoon so far hoping to make a move against the German forces on the heights surrounding saint Combe du mont But prospects still look bleak. The men nearby at Aul and La Basse Adeville under Ballard and Allen have not dared to move out, both citing the ever watchful German artillery spotters as the reason for staying put. There is also, though, some good news for Johnson as unexpected reinforcements arrive in his little enclave. Lieutenant Farrell is one of the U.S. Navy's liaison officers that jumped into France with the paratroopers, intending to provide a radio link between the two services, right? Surviving the night, Farrell's small team not only evaded capture, but also kept hold on their portable but cumbersome SCR-609 radio. With Farrell's arrival, the paratroopers have suddenly been dealt an ace. Using a frequency monitored by heavy cruiser USS Quincy, Johnson asks for immediate support from its nine eight-inch guns to give the Germans around Saint-Combe-du-Mont a taste of their own medicine. And indeed, as soon as the first heavy naval shells begin raining down on them, the German mortar fire stops. Johnson now creates a radio line relaying fire support from Quincy to Allen and Farrell to allow their groups to finally move out. The Battle of Neuville, north of saint marie has been raging for two hours. The small space is littered with craters and dead bodies. So far, Turnbull's small platoon has held tight to their superior positions, but there are many casualties. The Germans have also realized they are facing a much smaller force and maybe should try to outmaneuver their enemy. Rather than being surrounded, Turnbull pulls out, hoping these two hours have been enough time for the defenders of San Mariglis to finish their preparations. Turnbull's decision is a wise one for his platoon, as the first German soldiers are indeed just a hedgerow away. But to help prevent disaster, a fresh platoon of the 505th under Theodore Peterson arrives on the scene to cover Turnbull's retreat. We set up a line of fire on Turnbull's left. All hell broke loose. The enemy moving west down the road near a farmhouse to our immediate front walked right into our hidden left flank, which was stretched out along our hedgerow. Corporal Burke, who had already won a silver star, and three or four riflemen held their fire until the enemy was within a few feet of them. Then they opened fire. The surprised enemy took off in every direction, losing a good number of men. With that, the whole platoon opened fire with everything it had. During all this havoc, a runner from Turnbull reported to me they had successfully withdrawn their platoon. Having accomplished our mission, we made a tactical withdrawal, firing as we left. Together, they withdraw down the west side of the road leading towards Neuville. Of the 43 men that had stayed with Turnbull, 27 of them are dead or seriously wounded. Most of the wounded men are captured as the Germans 
overrun the stragglers and their medics. Only a dozen of Turnbull's platoon, in fact, make it back to San Mariglis. There is a lot of talk and a lot of rumor and all about the airborne today. And it seems to me that some of it has maybe entered the realm of myth. But a lot of things also seem like, how can I ever know that this really happened or not, you know? I do know, but we can definitely figure out at least some of it by asking Paul Woodage. So Paul, we're in San Mariglis now, and to certain segments of the general public, there is the belief that the, the fighting on D-Day was actually more or less already won or won here. And I know you can, don't, don't get to say anything yet. No, no, I'm gonna get to it. I'm gonna, can we freeze on that? Yeah. Okay, no, I, I understand you. You're dying to talk and we're gonna babble. You're gonna, like always. But um, there's, there's a symbol to many people of that. And that of course is the pirate river that got hung up on the church and they say, oh, uh, he pretended that he was dead and, and uh, maybe went deaf because of the bells and stuff. And he was there for hours. And that's sort of the symbol of stuff. And now you can either, either do myth busting or myth either way, it doesn't matter in your choice. It's both really, isn't it? Yeah. I can't say it didn't happen because you can't disprove a negative. Right. What I can say is there's very, very little evidence, contemporary wartime evidence that that ever occurred. Okay. Even before we get to that, what happened here was a tragic sideshow. So a couple of sticks, 2nd Matan 505th, navigation issues. They saw lights here because there was a building there on fire on D-Day that may or may not have been connected to the invasion. Flew across here, there's Germans standing in the square and a couple of sticks of men tumbled out right where we're standing and one or two of them landed on buildings and may or may not have landed on a church tower there. And a lot of these guys died. Their bodies were caught in trees around this square and that was a sight that confronted some of the commanders when they arrived. But in the case of PFC, John Steele himself, I'm just not sure it happened. If, I, if I'm pushed to kind of commit myself, I just don't think it ever happened. And there are certain bits of evidence we can use to kind of back that up. Okay. And the first one is, it doesn't start being mentioned really until after the Longest Day book, and certainly the film came out. That's All when right. it starts being mentioned. The French, the mayor, the people here start saying, there was a guy in a church. It doesn't get mentioned before that. Second thing is there are aerial photos taken latter part of D-Day that do not clearly show a parachute on the church. So if there is a parachutist on the church, his parachute still could be that, doesn't happen. And the, the kind of the smoking gun is the fact that the story hinges on John Steele being pulled up by two German sentries who may or may not be in the church tower in the first place anyway, up over the ramparts and inside the church. Right. I've been up in that church tower, other people have been in that, been in that church tower. There is no way, there's no space big enough with the way it works out there to bring a guy from outside up in the tower and down through the ladder there. It's just impossible. So, um, these are the kind of things we have that, that, that suggest it's, it's but what not. what if it's just a, a Santa Claus, like a symbol of Christmas? It's the symbol of the fantastic victory. It's a, yes, well, this is the second part. The, uh, it's, even, if it, even if it is true, and, and I don't think it is true, folks, but even if it is true, that. it doesn't matter. Right. What happened here is not the story of the 82nd Airborne. The story of the 82nd Airborne is holding crossroads and vital positions and hills and choke points and nodal points and containing the area for the 7th Corps on Utah Beach to move into. What happened here, as far as the public concerned, this is the be-all and end-all of D-Day, but it just isn't important. And I say that with a caveat of I'm not in any way belittling the loss of life happened here, that on a tragic human level, those who died here, it's awful. But their actions dying in this square do not really make a difference to the outcome of D-Day. Then why, why does it, has it become so big in, in public, public perception and memory? I think it's the longest day film. I, yeah. mean, I watch that film every, every year to kind of refresh my memory. And I kind of do other things, I'm doing things on my computer, but there's something about the sound of the bells there, red buttons plays John Steele and the sequence there and the ding dong ding. It's a very well lit, very well staged scene there. And I find myself looking at the screen and watching it, even though my brain's going, bullshit, 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 I'm gripped yeah. by the storytelling of that sequence there and the paratrooper dropping his knife and being deaf from, deaf from the sound of the bells. That, even that silly bit is the bells had been sounding on that church tower earlier when uh, the fire had broken out as an alert to the fire department and the locals that we need you in the square to deal with this situation. There wasn't some French person still on that bell tower an hour later when they're out there fighting the fire. The need for, for sounding the bells has passed. So right. 
when he claimed and people said of him, John Steele, oh, he was deaf with the bells, they weren't sounding when he was there, I don't think. So that, that bit doesn't make sense either. And where were, like, the person, John Steele, he should have been easy enough to find to corroborate. Yeah, well, yes. Um, and this is where, you know, in case there's any relatives of John Steele watching, I don't want to kind of talk negatively about the guy, but he was single. Um, and one version of the story is there was a 505th reunion sometime in the 50s at the time Cornelius Ryan was writing Longest Day and at this re reunion someone like, almost, almost like James Gavin stands up and says this is going to be a real major part of this book that may end up being a movie we want someone to volunteer to be the guy landed on the church tower because we feel this is going to be a really part of that and John Steele said I'll do it and kind of volunteered to be that guy so that's another story. Uh, but he himself died of lung cancer in 1967, I think. Okay. So he'd come here and become a, a folk hero. Yeah. And at that point there, I don't think, even if it, you know, he, he's buoyed along by the fame he's got and the fact that suddenly he's a nobody and he's now a somebody. So I think um, if he'd lived longer, I think people have started to ask him serious questions. I think yeah. he'd have tripped himself up with or his not. answers or not because um, it may it may have happened and I say I can't say it didn't happen I'm just saying there's very little evidence to support it did happen okay I know we're going to hear a lot of stuff about that in the comments which I'm looking forward to yeah no I'll, look to, I'll read them as well you know and it's it's it is it is as you said there it's an iconic iconic image of D-Day but I'm, I'm not I'm not convinced it happened and, I don't, and it certainly isn't important it, um, it's not important to what actually did happen but it led to other things it led to the, then people felt the need other paratroopers who landed here felt the need later on to reference the church tower and this, because someone would say to them in an interview would say, did you see the parachute on the church? And they would say yes, which for me as a historian is not the way to frame the question. It would be the best way to ask a veteran is when you went through Santa Maria Gliese, was there anything else there notable that you remember? Uh -huh. yeah. But when they said, did you see the parachute? It's a loaded question. Oh, yeah. okay. And so we say, oh yeah, I think, oh yeah. But I see it today. And especially they've seen the movie. By then, oh, yeah. they've all seen the movies, and now yeah. they're thinking, oh, that was the movie with John Wayne, and it becomes a fact. And the, the fact that every day tour buses come here by their dozen, and all talk about that, and click, 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 click. It, it's a story that won't go away. Even if, even if this channel reaches many, many people, this story won't go away because oh, no. of this. Well, you know, think of how many people the Great War reached, and people do still believe that Gavrilo Princip was eating a sandwich outside Schiller's Delicatessen. And that story, has, as far as anyone's aware, that's not even from the 20th century. <laughs> that was, it was from a, from a, I forget if it was Brazilian or Argentinian, first mentioned in a film that referenced a book in 2003 wow. in a South America, and now it's become accepted. Ken, you know he's eating a sandwich outside of Schiller's? He wasn't eating a sandwich outside of Schiller's Delicatessen. That was 90 years later, after yeah. the war, that that began becoming so, so no I don't think this is going to disappear no and uh, you know but the point is let's go and do something more interesting where stuff that happened really was important all right let's hit it there's certainly interesting stuff going on over at Omaha again let's hit it by now the exit road e1 at Omaha Beach is finally cleared and open for vehicular traffic. The first task forces of tanks, armored vehicles, jeeps, and other support vehicles can now move inland. Enemy small arms fire is also subsiding here, with more than 5,000 men of the 1st and 29th Divisions prowling the bluffs, there is little the remaining German resistance nests can do anymore, at least at the beach itself. Over at Saint Laurent, the 115th Infantry Regiment is still grinding against the Norman town, which the Germans have turned into a pretty good stronghold. There are just a couple buildings around the old church, but they seem almost impossible to crack without assistance from heavier firepower. And this additional firepower is to be delivered by the destroyer USS Thompson. This is not necessarily a good call though. Saint Laurent was a mass of tunneled emplacements, not only connected to each other, but also two strong points overlooking the beach. The German force holed up in the town was not large, but was strategically placed and difficult to locate. A sniper would fire from one spot and then show up at another a few hundred yards away, having used the communications tunnels to advantage. Fighting during the first few hours was rough, with few of the rules of warfare observed. German snipers seemed to like the targets offered by the Red Cross armbands of the medics, while few prisoners taken by our troops reached the collecting cages. During the fighting for Saint Laurent, members of the 2nd Battalion 
had as much difficulty dodging shells fired by the Navy into Saint Laurent as they did from German snipers located in the town. Friendly fire accidents are not uncommon in the chaos today, but misguided naval fire is another thing. Many of the heavy shells aimed at the high church steeple fall short and into the American lines. The 115th will suffer more than 100 casualties from such action in the fight for Saint Laurent. In general though, the more the Americans begin moving inland, the more they realize that the Atlantic Wall has barely any defense in depth. Sure, there are still several strong pockets of German resistance, especially around the Colville and Le Moulin draws, but with Virville and Le Grand Amo in American hands, and Colville and Saint Laurent challenged, it seems highly unlikely that the Germans, even with reinforcements, can push them back towards the beach anytime soon. Now from his command post at exit E3, General Kota begins directing the efforts of 29th Division's engineers. Omaha Beach is still by no means a safe place. German shells fall in seemingly at random. Mines wash ashore and explode against vehicles. Landing craft and trucks filled with ammunition take hits and, and explode in flames to get rid of the congestion at the beach. They have to finally blow up those walls at the draws. At Virville, the main concrete wall is three meters high and two meters thick. And the engineers aren't sure if they can get their hands on enough TNT to blow it to pieces. But once wired and set to explode, it proves easier than it had seemed. German construction crews failed to reinforce the wall with steel rods. So there is very little left once the TNT detonates. Kota immediately orders the vehicles to get moving through and get off the beach. The second East Yorks have been preparing to attack the strong point they call Daimler, WN12. Unlike Seoul, which they took this morning, Daimler is a pretty substantial defense point. It's not only protected by minefields, it's got four 155mm howitzers in concrete bunkers, two flat guns, and six machine guns. They are going to use tanks from the 13th Battalion, 18th Royal Hussars, to break this one. The attack goes off, and it is successful right away. We deposited a smoke screen to the west side of the objective, and a troop attacked with all guns blazing. Almost before we started, we saw little dejected figures in grey uniforms approaching from the complex. Rather like Singapore, Daimler collapsed like a house of cards almost at once, since it was being fired on from every side, against which it had no real defence. I'm going to digress here for a minute about a weapon, okay? In fact, if there's one thing that really characterizes the German defenses today, it's their main go-to weapon. This also happens to be an excellent offensive weapon. You are talking about the German machine guns. I am. Specifically, the MG42. There are very few things more terrifying on a World War II battlefield than the loud bark of a German machine gun 42. Its intense fire rate can stop whole squads dead in their tracks as an unrelenting stream of bullets rips and tears through the air. The Allies are well aware that the Wehrmacht will use this weapon to devastating effects to defend their fortress Europe. In bunkers and trenches, behind bushes and armor plates, their universal machine gun is quickly put into action by mounting it on a variety of pedestals and carriages. But why is this gun so very effective? How is it designed differently than its competitors? The introduction of the machine gun to the world's battlefields was truly a military revolution. And then during the Great War, guns like the British Vickers, the Russian M1910, and the German MG08 presented serious weapons of mass destruction against any infantry assault. Water-cooled and operating on short recoil, these derivations of the original Maxim gun could achieve a deadly rate of 450 to 600 rounds per minute. However, all of them share the same tactical flaws. Their cumbersome nature because of their heavy water cooling system and tripods favored an entrenched static defender. The German MG08 needed a whole team just to be carried around with its water jacket and sled carriage weighing more than 55 kilos. This of course was at odds with the emergence of the stormtrooper concept where quick agile units needed the support of light 
Versatile guns. The British had already introduced the light machine gun with the air-cooled and gas-operated Lewis gun, while the French and the Americans leaned towards automatic rifles. For the Germans, the redesigned MG0815 was an attempt to incorporate machine guns into the concept of the fluid battlefield. But although now outfitted with a bipod and a shoulder stock, it was still pretty heavy, and the fixed barrel still needed water cooling. There were other more innovative designs, like the air-cooled MG15 by Bergmann that was fed by a sturdier metal link belt, or the Dreise MG15 made by Schmeiser that had a fire accelerator and a recoil buffer. But the Great War ended before the Germans could further really commit to producing their own light machine gun. The defeated German army was not allowed to have many machine guns post-war, but weapon designers found ways to work within the restrictions. Forced to favor quality over quantity, the German Waffenamt, the weapon office, laid down very specific demands. See, they didn't just want to create a new LMG, but a truly universal machine gun, one that could fulfill all major roles on the battlefield. It must be light enough to be carried into battle by a single infantryman, but also easily mountable on vehicles or behind fortifications. It had to be belt-fed, air-cooled, and able to fire a full-power rifle cartridge at a high rate of fire. Eventually, the weapons manufacturers Rheinmetall and Mauserwerke began producing new Machine Gewehr 34. From the outset, the gun's innovative design, with its pistol grip, flared stock, and air-cooled ventilated barrel jacket seemed unlike any other foreign designs. As required, the gun fired the powerful 7.92 by 57 millimeter Mauser cartridge on a short recoil system. The two-piece open bolt assembly was locked onto a barrel extension and driven forward through the power of the recoil spring. A booster cone at the front of the gun would increase the gas pressure and drive both barrel and bolt backwards to power the feed mechanism. Through the bolt's rotation, it would then insert and extract cartridges and carry the belt. The MG34 could go through such a firing cycle 15 times a second. This meant the gun was able, in theory, to send out 900 rounds a minute with a muzzle velocity of 755 meters per second. Faster firing variants were also introduced, like the MG34S, which allowed for 1,200 rounds per minute, although the gun's delicate interior mechanism began to buckle under that rate of fire. By January 1934, the new universal machine gun was put into service and began replacing all other machine guns in the Army's arsenal. However, it took some time for the Reich's industry to get production numbers going, so it was not until late 1941 that the MG34 was widely distributed throughout the Wehrmacht. In many ways, the MG34 really was a masterpiece of engineering and successfully fulfilled the needs of Germany's mobile warfare doctrine. Soon, there were several different ball and pintle mounts to fit the MG34 on, on tanks, on armored vehicles, and even bicycles and assault gliders. However, reports from the field began filtering in that the gun did not function all that well in rough conditions. Many gunners saw it as overly complicated mechanically complex, and generally over-designed. It was hard to keep the gun's many delicate mechanisms clean, especially in tough environments like, like North Africa or the Eastern Front, where sand or mud could cause jamming or stoppages. The gun was also reportedly unreliable in extreme cold. Manufacturers complained it was both too expensive and too difficult to produce quickly. Many of the additional features seemed pretty unnecessary too. Like some of the earlier versions even had a switch that could adjust the rate of fire between 600 RPM and 1000 RPM. Or to select semi-fire, the gunner would press just the upper part of the trigger and for full auto, the lower part. There was even a reversible feed tray that could be switched for left or right-handed feeding. This was neat for an elite cadre of thousands of soldiers, but not for an army of millions. New ideas were needed to find a suitable successor to the MG34. Most promising was the MG3941 prototype brought forward by Metallfabrik Grossfuss by getting rid of many unnecessary features. And by simplifying many of its mechanisms, the German weapon industry 
would benefit from a general redesign of the universal machine gun. The new designated MG42 is made entirely out of stamp sheet metal, which reduces costs by 25% per gun over the MG34. It also only takes 75 man hours to manufacture the simpler MG42, rather than 150 hours of its more complicated predecessor, without cutting back on any of the fundamental requirements. After some testing and redefining, Adolf Hitler personally approves the mass adoption of the new gun in all branches of the Wehrmacht services. But the MG42's new design goes much further than just reducing the production costs. Grossfuss has designed it with a new roller-locked bolt mechanism that increases the firing rate of the machine gun to 1,200 rounds per minute. Depending on the bolt, this rate can be boosted to 1,600. It also keeps the standard 792 by 57 millimeter Mauser caliber, which at the high muzzle velocity of 755 meters per second can easily penetrate light cover and thin armor plates. Operating the gun is still fairly simple as well. The gunner opens the top cover and places the first round of the belt against the cartridge stopper on the feed tray. For ambushes, it's also possible to drag the belt straight through the feed block to avoid the ominous clicking sound of closing the top cover. Then the gunner grips the cocking handle, draws it back with considerable strength, only to push the bolt forward again to chamber the first round. Pulling the trigger releases the bolt through the power of the strained recoil spring inside the stock. Then the bolt surges forward, beginning the firing cycle, while the feeding mechanism drags the belt through the cartridge chamber. Engaged, the MG42 kicks like a mule, and with its aggressive recoil, it is difficult for an inexperienced recruit to keep the gun on track, let alone to hit the target. The gunner will have to dig his boots into the ground while using the strength of his elbows and shoulders to keep the gun pressing against the bipod. Otherwise, the muzzle will pull away from the target after the first shot. The main benefits of the super high rate of fire mean that a trained gunner can deliver and maintain sudden barrages of intense fire onto a targeted area. Yet, this also makes the MG42 a hungry beast. On full auto only, its ammunition expenditure can quickly become a problem in the field. And indeed, the best results are obtained by releasing small bursts of fire. Squeezing the trigger for five to seven rounds is considered enough to destroy a single target. This is still extremely fast, as that trained gunner can release 22 such bursts within a minute, expending more than 150 rounds. Another important decision overhaul is the quick barrel change mechanism. The high rate of fire means the gun's barrel overheats very quickly. Each bullet is propelled with an explosive charge that leaves enormous heat behind. According to the manual, a barrel should be changed after 250 rounds of rapid bursts. But usually, a barrel was able to withstand around 400 rounds before the danger of malfunction. The MG42's design makes that change very easy. The gunner, or his assistant, simply pushes open the barrel change door on the right side, which makes the barrel pop out on its own. Very thick gloves are necessary, and each gunner is issued a cloth made out of asbestos to drag out the white-hot barrel. But then they just slide in a new barrel, shut the door, and the gun's ready to go. An experienced team can make this change in a matter of seconds. Reloading and changing the barrel are, of course, the most vulnerable moments, but not just for the gunner. See, for the German army, the power of the machine gun has become front and center for both their offensive and defensive tactics. Keeping the gun alive means keeping the squad alive. If it is silenced, either through enemy action or a lack of ammo or replacement barrels, then the attack will fail or their lines will be overrun. So training concentrates foremost on ammunition discipline, as well as preventing, recognizing, and correcting stoppages. It is emphasized that proper maintenance in and outside of battle decides over life or death, and every German soldier must be familiar with the MG34s and MG42s mechanics. But although every recruit is schooled in firing and maintenance, only a certain type of man is chosen to become the designated Richtschütze. Not only does he have to be physically fit, 
and strong enough to carry and wield the gun, he has to be especially competent and technically minded. The German manual reads, When choosing the machine gunners, it is recommended that one does not choose soldiers with glasses or soldiers that are left-handed, but rather strong and well-built muscular boys with good perception and a reasonable amount of initiative. Future machine gunners undergo two main training courses. The first concentrates on using the MG42 as an LMG on its bipod. Lessons on how to move on the battlefield, as well as tactical exercise and technical studies follow. The second course focuses on using the gun as a heavy machine gun on pedestal mounts, like the German Lafette 42 and 43 with additional optical sights. Typically, the MG42 has a range of 2,000 meters using the V-sight blade mount that can be adjusted from 200 to 2,000. But the effective range is, is more like 800 meters, you know, when the gunner can still actually identify what he's shooting at. For more precision, German gunners also use armor-piercing tracer rounds. The basis of German small group tactics is an infantry squad of nine called simply a Gruppe. Led by a non-com, these groups usually consist of five riflemen and three men to work the machine gun. The designated main machine gunner carrying the MG42 is outfitted with a pistol and a 50-round belt drum. The first assistant gunner carries a double-barrel holster on his back an additional belt drum, and a 300-round ammunition can. His main job is to supply the gun, as well as helping to emplace the gun in the field and provide close-quarter protection if necessary. The second assistant carries another spare barrel holster and two cans filled with 300 rounds of ammo. On the move, the group forms a Reihe, a single-file formation. Naturally, the squad's leader is at the front, but right behind him is the machine gunner. German tactics dictate that once contact with the enemy is made, the gunner shall immediately drop to the ground and send heavy fire towards wherever the target appeared. While the enemy is suppressed by these bursts of fire, the rest of the squad fans out to the left and right in a skirmish line. German infantry doctrines always include gaining fire superiority over the enemy, and the MG42 is especially good at that. The physical and psychological effect of an unrelenting stream of bullets flying past at high velocity is often enough to stop an enemy squad dead in its tracks. And once the other side is pinned down, then the German riflemen or assault troops move out to flank the enemy or take them out with grenades at close range. On defense, the enemy is to be pinned down and then mortars and artillery can do their jobs. Each German battalion also has a dedicated heavy machine gun group attached to it. This group has four MG42s and their tripods. Once set up, they can saturate a whole area with sustained fire. These heavy MG groups consist of at least six men and their additional ammunition carriers packing at least 1,800 rounds altogether. But even those 1,800 rounds can be gone within 10 minutes of fighting by now. The Allies are well aware of this gun's performance in the field. They also know that the bunkers and trenches on the coast are held by mostly low-grade reserves and fortification units. But even an invalid with one eye and a peg leg can hold down the trigger of an MG42. And once the gun's devastating fire is unleashed on the men packed close inside their landing crafts or, or slowly wading through the water then there could be massive casualties. Sergeant Henrik Naube of the 916 Grenadier Regiment has this to say. I lifted the MG42 back up and recited it in the firing slit. I remembered my father told me many times he had done this himself as a machine gunner at the Battle of the Somme back in the First War. He and his comrades hid deep in the dugouts with their guns and then raced to fix their guns back in place before the British attacked. Now here I was doing the same thing. The Americans were about 400 meters away from us. I did not sight on them individually at first, but I began firing and swept the gun from left to right along the beach. This knocked down the first few men in each line. The MG42 was so powerful, the bullets would often pass through a human body and hit whatever was behind it. So many of these men were hit by a bullet which had already passed through a man in front, or even two men. The only time we stopped firing 
was when the gun barrel began to overheat and the mechanism showed signs of misfiring. We did not want to run the risk of the gun breaking down, so we rested it to let it cool. We took up our rifles and used them instead. Carl Wegener of Grenadier Regiment 914 says, I pulled the trigger up tight. The MG roared, sending hot lead into the men running along the beach. I saw some go down. I knew I had hit them. The bullets ripped up and down the sand. This 19-year-old lad from Hanover had just cut down several men, but now was not the time to think of right or wrong, only survival. After the first few moments had passed, my mind became automated. I would fire as I had been trained to do, in short bursts, 15 to 20 centimeters above the ground. When the gun jammed, I would clear it quickly because every second counted. We knew where to shoot. When I pulled back the bolt for what seemed like the thousandth time, I paused for a good look down the beach. I saw Amis lying everywhere. The gun's great rate of fire can tear through rows of infantry, but other defenses are needed. Artillery, anti-tank, and counter-assault units must be in place to prevent the enemy from countering the machine gun threat. Because once the distinct sound of the MG42 booms over the beaches, then every enemy will concentrate on specifically taking them out. American Sergeant Guarnier remembers how focused the Allies were on its sound alone. I went looking for a gun and found a Thompson submachine gun. I also took a German MG42 off a dead kraut and started shooting it, but the gun made a noise that was distinctly German. The American guns went bap, 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 bap. Every time I started shooting it, the Americans started shooting at me. I got shot at by a dozen or so of our own men. For the German defenders, everything revolves around supplying their men with enough machine guns ammunition, and spare barrels to keep the beaches covered. And therein lies the main problem with the MG42. The gun is extremely deadly in both offensive and defensive operations, but it must be adequately supplied and supported because even the best gun will not work without ammunition. And then what? Karl Wegner would find himself in exactly that position. I finished up a belt of ammunition and waited for Willi to load another one into the gun. He pushed through the starter tab and I noticed it was only a 50 round belt. Normally the belts were linked together for about 200 rounds. I told him to get some more as this wouldn't last long and he simply said there wasn't any more to get. I looked at him in disbelief then realized we were standing in a pile of empty ammunition boxes, belts and spent shell casings. All that was left of 15,000 rounds. The two of them looked at me and I can still see their faces silently asking me, what should we do now? That's a pretty heavy situation in which to find yourself. It sure is. It's interesting that their men are seeing so much action so quickly today, and yet for a lot of them, the past weeks and months of training and planning, especially for like, like the Americans in Britain, it must feel like going from zero to a hundred. I wouldn't quite say that. See, by May 1944, over 1.5 million Americans are stationed in the United Kingdom, right? They have brought so much equipment and vehicles that many GIs joke Great Britain risks sinking into the Atlantic. And the only thing keeping it afloat is the barrage balloons floating above. Mm -hmm. But they aren't just waiting around. That's not at all true. They've been in training hard, week in and week out. The 29th Division has been garrisoned in Britain since October 1942. There is no specific mission to prepare for when they arrive, so the training is often experimental. As one officer will recall, there was only a vague idea of what we were supposed to do. At first it was all conducted on land, using homemade mock-ups of landing craft. Dartmoor was probably as good a place for this as any, for it seemed afloat with rain. We came to know but never loved Dartmoor as we tramped across it, shivered in its cold winds and slept on its liquid surface. The seemingly constant grey British weather is a big adjustment for many GIs, causing a lot of homesickness among those used to the American sunshine. The living quarters haven't helped matters. From May 1943, most of the 29th are encamped in the southwest of England. 
In wet weather, their steel and stone Nissen huts become surrounded by seas of mud. Airmen usually have better lodgings, although this brings its own problems. Bomber HQ has taken over a boarding school near London. On the first night, the officers are sleeping in the teacher's office when they are woken by a ringing of bells. The dorms where the enlisted men are quartered have signs saying, if mistress is desired, ring bell. Space is a constant issue in England's green and pleasant land. Back home, facilities like the Desert Training Centre allow GIs to undertake large-scale maneuvers complete with tank and artillery support. But in England, they are competing not only with the millions of other Allied troops in the country, but also with the British people themselves. As a result, troops are often confined to small unit training or marches. The 29ers march an estimated 3,000 miles in the winter of 1942 to 1943, enough to get them back home. When officers are allowed to plan maneuvers with life ammunition, they must navigate the limits of dual usage. The British government's preferred policy to balance civilian and military interest. Upon arrival at one range, artillery men learn that uninhabited roads run between them and their targets. They have to fire over it. Unsurprisingly, the American military is constantly trying to get more space for its men. The most controversial demand concerns the assault training center in South Ham, Devon. The center is established in September 1943 under the command of Paul Thompson in order to train US troops in amphibious landings. But the center is too small for any unit above the battalion level, and there are tight limits on live fire exercises. Planners demand more space. They ask for 25 square miles running along the coastal areas of Slapton Sands. This is prime real estate for invasion preparations. The beach and its surrounding area are very similar to the coastline of Normandy, especially Utah Beach. But expanding the centre would displace new 3,000 residents. Nevertheless, after some negotiation, the Americans are granted their request. Thompson and his fellow trainers finally have the space to practice in perfect amphibious landings. In the new year, thousands of men go through exercises every week, with new lessons learned each time. When off duty, many men like to get out and meet their British hosts. Quite a few Yanks have got to know the Brits very well indeed. General Eisenhower is among them. K. Summersby has been the Supreme Commander's Driver Secretary since 1942, and they appear to have formed a very close bond. So much so that when on home leave in January 1944, Ike keeps calling his real wife K. The relationship has never become sexual, though. Although, according to Kay's post-war account, they try to consummate it once, but Ike struggles to stand to attention. Still, they share a deep affection for each other. Like Eisenhower, many Americans in Britain find companionship among the local women. And there are around 70,000 GI marriages during the war. But whether it's a long-term commitment or a one-time thing, female company offers a break from the intense pressure of military life and provides comfort for the men. For married men like Eisenhower, staying true to their women is difficult when they are so far away from home. For some of the young ones, the distance instills the sense that rules are different overseas and they can have as much fun as they please. Many revel in the chance to get blackout drunk and be a playboy. Of course, many GIs don't find wives and girlfriends in England. Some are even shocked at their comrades for acting in ways they never would at home. And it's not like every relationship between Yank and Brit is romantic. Mac McIntyre of the 4th Division is billeted in a Devon town and has been all but adopted by the prince's family. He has spent most of his off-duty time with the princess, joining them for Sunday dinner, shopping with mom and hiking with pop. He takes their young daughters to the cinema and goes fishing with the twin boys. But Britain has also been somewhat of a culture shock for many Americans. The War Department has warned the GIs that the conflict has taken a toll on Britain's people and buildings. Still, many are shocked by the much lower quality of life compared to back home. The houses and hotels are old-fashioned and run-down, very few cars are on the road, and the food and drink are 
awful. Many cities are covered in rubble and the people in the countryside appear traditional and backward. These are the opinions of many of the white GIs at least. Interestingly, many black GIs stationed in Britain have less to complain about. There are approximately 130,000 of them across Britain and they have found their state to be a welcome change. Their lower economic status back home means they find Britain less of a downgrade and they also enjoy equality of treatment from their white hosts they have rarely experienced before. Many British hosts are confused by the strict racial lines drawn by their American guest. But the GIs are also surprised by aspects of British society. Many are taken aback at how rigid the class system is. American officers and men are much more friendly with each other than their British counterparts, where deference and respect are essential. Raymond Park, an American who joined the RAF at the start of the war, puts it well. I sometimes feel that England does not deserve to win this war. It has been well and truly said that General Rommel of the German Army's Africa Corps would never have risen above the rank of NCO in the British Army. The nation seems inexplicably proud of the defects in its national character. Some quite like the system, though. One radar expert attached to a British signals unit will remember, I thought I had practically reached heaven. I was served by a batman who woke me in the morning with a large cup of hot tea and whilst I slowly woke he finished shining my shoes. What a way to fight a war. Fighting that war is getting closer and closer. By spring, dress rehearsals for the invasion take place all over England. Assault forces practice marshalling, assault, evacuation and everything in between. These provide priceless experience, but they are also dangerous and bring home just how challenging the actual invasion will be. On April 27, an invasion rehearsal at Slapton Sands turns into a disaster when soldiers are bombarded by friendly fire just as they go onto the beach. It happened thanks to timetables moving last minute and radio frequency errors, but it is made worse by inexperienced soldiers panicking under fire. The tragedy doesn't stop there. The next day, a convoy of LSTs and a corvette are hit by German E-boats. The two incidents result in nearly 1,000 dead. Nearly everything went wrong in this operation. It may have taught the commanders lessons that will save lives during the real thing, but it has also made them doubt the quality of the troops. General Eisenhower's aide, Harry Butcher, complains of the absence of toughness and alertness of the young Americans officers, whom I saw on this trip. They seem to regard war as one grand maneuver in which they are having a happy time. They are as green as growing corn. But there is little time to dwell on the matter. The wheels for the invasion have begun turning. From the beginning of May, troops must begin gathering at their camps. Some have the time to say goodbye to the people they have met. Mac manages to see the princess for a final visit before leaving. He brings cigarettes, candy and oranges, and they all drink good ale mixed with port. It is another joyful evening, but as Mac will recall, Mr. Prince all but broke my hand when we parted, and Mum's eyes were misty. The boys were silent, but expression on their faces spoke louder than words. Other GIs have much less meaningful goodbyes. On a line of empty tents in a cleared camp, someone has chalked the message. Sorry, Jean. Had to go. Johnny. Endless columns of men, trucks and tanks begin trundling down to the marshalling areas. Traffic is so jammed that the convoys sometimes move for about five minutes before waiting again for an hour or more. When they finally arrive, the men begin to realize what lies in store for them. They are issued seasickness pills, condoms, life belts and French francs. They all receive a new weapon and new uniforms. This clothing stinks because it has been washed with a chemical to counter poison gas. The menu options are excellent though. All you can eat fresh eggs, fried chicken and white bread. As one man from the 101st will recall, the realization that we were being fattened up for slaughter didn't stop us from going back for seconds. By the end of May, all the marshalling camps are sealed off. MPs and English soldiers patrol the boundaries and there is no contact with the outside world. 
The briefings are next where the officers and then their men learn of their new objectives. Next is the order for embarkation. Once again, vast columns of vehicles and men stream down English lanes. It is during these massive migrations of men that we see the warm feelings shared between Brit and Yank. GIs throw gum and small chains to children. Women come out of their homes offering tea and scones to men on halted convoys. Some even invite the troops into their homes for a quick wash or shave. One Sussex woman wakes up in early June with packages left for safekeeping by the 4th Cavalry Regiment. They are full of pictures of mothers, girlfriends and other treasures. The men know, or at least have a good idea of what lies in store for them. On June 5th, General Leland Hobbs gives some advice to those in the 30th Division. War is a series of three things, remember it. Long, hard waits, just waiting. Relatively short, hard fighting. And quite short, pleasant rest. That is the cycle. That is the way it goes. Wait, fight, rest. Fight, wait. And around it goes. The waiting is now nearly over. Age hour is around the corner. Well, it's no longer around the corner. It's actually past. Andy, you know what I'm wondering about? What are you wondering about? We've heard speeches from Eisenhower and Churchill and heard from Hitler, but I'm wondering, with Charles de Gaulle soon to make a speech to the people of France, well, to the world, and with plenty of tension and disagreement in the various high commands, how the command situation is among those whose land is actually being invaded this day, the French. There's plenty of tension and disagreement in the various high commands, as we've seen. But we haven't really looked at the command situation among those whose land is actually being invaded this day, the French. Relations between the French and the British and Americans have ebbed and flowed over the months. The central issue has been repeatedly whether or not the Allies would grant governmental recognition to the organizations of the Free French. The French have had the Committee of National Liberation, the CFLN, since June last year. And it was for a while led by Henri Giraud and Charles de Gaulle, though Giraud was basically put out to pasture not that long ago. Giraud had been mainly focused on military stuff, and de Gaulle more on politics. Or maybe I should say entirely on politics. As you heard from Spartacus earlier, the French efforts inside France, including the CFLN's real influence, were pretty much out of order until January this year. It was only after the difficult meeting between Churchill and de Gaulle in Morocco in January that things began coming together. Even then, the incredibly complex political infighting and power play among the French leadership continues to stand in the way of clear and concise action. Spartacus has, and we'll talk more about that in other parts of today's coverage. Back to the geopolitical and military effects. The efforts of de Gaulle and the CFLN were directed at restoring France to her former greatness. In their view, this could best be achieved by an independent French contribution to the defeat of Nazi Germany, the formation of a provisional National Assembly in November 1943, and the proclamation of a provisional French government a few days before the invasion were also intended as early markers of France's claim to sovereignty. Thing is, the British and Americans aren't that keen on officially recognizing the Free French. I mean, they were not actually elected, and that sticks with Roosevelt. He's not sure that they would be elected if they held elections, and he wants to hold off on French politics until that can happen. As for Charles de Gaulle, Roosevelt sees him as a potential dictator. In fact, by this time, Roosevelt is so sick of French politics that he wants to change the post-war occupation plans of Germany so that the U.S. has the northern zone and is supplied through Holland and not France. He absolutely does not want to have U.S. troops stationed in France. But he is a bit blind, though, and doesn't see what de Gaulle is trying to accomplish, holding together all the various French factions to save France from complete chaos or even civil war after this war, which does, by necessity, take a firm hand. However, de Gaulle is 100% Francocentric and completely against anything which might in any way undermine French glory. It is he, after all, who wrote a history of the French army 
and left out Waterloo. Churchill is a little more pragmatic, well, at least in this respect. He's also been trying to get Roosevelt to soften his stance, but Roosevelt absolutely will not officially recognize de Gaulle's government as the legitimate French government, and repeatedly says firmly that the Allies are not invading France to put Charles de Gaulle in power. He also will not request a meeting with de Gaulle because that would kind of recognize him as France's leader. But obviously, come liberation, it will take time to organize elections. So the Allied military would otherwise have to administer the liberated territories, right? To Charles de Gaulle, this is just changing one army of occupation for another one. So Eisenhower, as Supreme Commander of the Allied Armed Forces, is in a tricky position. Of course, he wants to use any and all French who want to, to fight the Axis occupiers. He wants French liaison officers working with Allied staffs. He wants support ops by the resistance. But although there is a French division in Britain before today, the Second French Armored, it's not planned to go to France until July. And the only French military power that is in action today are commandos, some paratroops, and units from the Free French Air Force and some warships. Thing is, de Gaulle has been commander-in-chief of French forces since April. They are to be subordinated to overall Allied command. Well, that was the idea. But with Washington not wanting to recognize de Gaulle's government, the combined chiefs of staff, who have promised to tell de Gaulle their plans, want to have talks only with French military personnel and not any government-level people. This, as you may imagine, sits rather poorly with the French. So even by today, there is no formal agreement subordinating the French troops to other Allied commanders. Roosevelt has also forbidden Eisenhower from having any contact with the CFLN. And Eisenhower is only to work with Pierre Koenig, who commands the French invasion forces in Britain and is de Gaulle's military rep. But Eisenhower is not to tell him details of the invasion, which pisses off Koenig, since French units are to be used in the invasion, as is the resistance. The Allies do need to brief de Gaulle about D-Day, and Churchill shrewdly points out that it's kind of hard to cut the French out of the liberation of France. But once de Gaulle is in Britain, whenever that happens, he would have to stay there until after the landings are made because of security concerns. And these are very valid. The French codes are so bad, in fact, that an SOE guy goes to their offices in London and tells them to encode any messages they like, and then he breaks the codes right in front of them. The French command is then not allowed to use radios, only secure landlines. You know, I said French liaison officers would work with allied units. Well, there are a lot of them ready for the task, enough for one for each unit even, which is what Koenig wants. But without their duties being clearly detailed and without any agreement on post-war France, de Gaulle cancels the whole liaison thing. This not only messes with all the administrative agreements for civil affairs post-liberation that the British and Americans have managed to make with the French, but also really pisses off Churchill and Roosevelt in the process. Those admin plans were pretty agreeable to all three nations. The general aims were largely uncontroversial. All parties wanted to facilitate the pursuit of military operations by establishing orderly conditions in the hinterland, relieve the distress of the population in plundered war-torn areas, remove collaborators from administrative office, and restore a functioning democracy as soon as possible. And to do this, Roosevelt has allowed military commanders to settle military and civil issues with the CFLN even, as long as it stops short of official recognition. The CFLN, though, has been busy setting up to transfer the running of liberated areas to French control as soon as they are liberated, so as to prevent any establishment of a military government. They've really been at it, not only choosing people to fill various city officers, but getting ready to restart the judicial, the legal systems, the press, and even what to do with POWs and, of course, collaborators. There was at least some cooperation between the British and Americans and the CFLN until around six weeks ago. See, that's when the British started total censorship of all correspondence between people in Britain and those outside. American and Soviet officials, and even Polish government officials, could still do it. But not the French. 
The CFLN has a real problem with this. Despite the security concerns I mentioned earlier and decides they're just not gonna work with the Allies anymore. So, de Gaulle finally comes to London. The British and Americans really want to tell him when and where Operation Neptune is going to happen. And they're pretty certain he's going to be mortally offended if they don't, right? He arrives in London June 4th, two days ago, although he almost refuses to go because Roosevelt will not meet with him about civilian government issues. When he gets to London, he gets very angry because Churchill won't either, and he explodes when he sees Allied currency issued to the troops for after the invasion, which his government damn sure does not recognize. But the currency is because the British and Americans are to work together, and they quite simply have to have something their forces can work with. And Churchill then tells de Gaulle clearly that any time he has to choose between de Gaulle and Roosevelt, he chooses Roosevelt. Well, they calm him down eventually, and then Churchill and Eisenhower tell him the invasion plans. And then Eisenhower gives him the speech that he is to read to the French people today on D-Day, and it says to obey Allied command until the French people can choose their next government. You can imagine this does not sit well with de Gaulle. In fact, de Gaulle just rejects that out of hand because the speech makes no mention of his provisional government's role after liberation. So they say, fine, write your own speech, but give it to the French at the end of this day. As for the resistance leaders, they are not informed about the operational plans at all, not the date, not the place, but they do sort of put de and de together from BBC messages and have at least a general idea. And de Gaulle has at least gotten permission to integrate resistance cells into the regular Free French forces to support Overlord as regional cells are liberated. They will be organized under Koenig's command. This is all post today, assuming success and continued success. I'm really looking forward to his speech. It should be very interesting. Hearing the live, okay, well, not so much updates, but at least partial updates from world leaders and their spin on what it means for their people specifically, but the war in general. You know, just the whole live as it happens global event is, is really something new. Yeah, it really is. And this hour, the first live recordings from the actual battlefields reach the world at large. While the Germans might have mostly lost the fight at the beaches, by now they know where the enemy is and can at least guess where he is heading. In fact, they have been assembling their first organized counterattack, scheduled to soon go off, and we will see how that goes when we return with Hour 17 of D-Day. It's 4 p.m. on D-Day, and the 17th hour of the day begins. The fight has moved beyond the beaches for the most part, but it is still very much a fight. Sure is. And this hour, over to the east, there are stubborn German defenses and the first organized German counterattack. The struggle to break into and overcome the Hillman position continues unabated. The infantry has finally at least breached the center position though. They're attacking the steel cupolas with 17 pounder anti-tank guns, but the shells do virtually no damage. The Germans are underground here, snug in their bunkers, but they've been laying down a lot of small arms fire that's really hurting the British. One by one, the Suffolks knocked out the anti-tank guns and eliminated a good number of the surface machine gun pits. But fire continued to come at them from all directions and from every dip in the ground. Tanks arrived and joined in the action, enabling the infantry to close on the trench systems. But it was a slow process to overcome each infantryman in his well-concealed hiding place. The KSLI, have been heading for Caen, but at Beauville they get held up by snipers in the church tower. They take care of them, but this brings out an issue among the men. See, the snipers have been taking out NCOs mainly, like, like hunting them. So some of the other ones cut their rank identifying stripes off their uniforms. This is a divisive issue, however, since some commanders are cool with it happening, and others do not allow it and insist on rank being worn. By now, Staffordshire Yeomanry has caught up with the KSLI, and they're deploying around both Beauville and Beville, not that far from Caen. It's not just the Yeomanry. I mean, they already had some self-propelled artillery from the 7th Field Regiment. But then, the 33rd Field Regiment turned up. 
Then the 41st anti-tank battery arrived. Then a heavy machine gun platoon from 2nd Middlesex Regiment. So suddenly, there is a real force here. But K.P. Smith is thinking, like Rennie, more and more about defense and not hitting Kant. On the right, W Company of KSLI has moved on to Perrier Ridge. They head up the left of the ridge to the right of the fighting for Hillman, and on the back slope of the ridge meet the enemy, a German artillery battery and artillery battalion headquarters. This is WN-21A, which has four 122mm formerly Soviet guns in open positions, but surrounded by barbed wire. Like Morris, it's mainly manned by Poles. The following firefight is pretty intense, but backed by armor, the Shropshires win the day. After this, though, KSLI Commander Morris thinks his right flank is kinda exposed, so he leaves a squad of armor on the ridge to protect the approach to the 185th, and then continues to slowly advance on Caen. German 352nd Division Commander Dietrich Kreis is aware of the growing gap in his Mauvain front, and he sent Kampfgruppe Meyer to plug that gap. Now, we saw them get that order hours ago at Omaha and head over on bicycles. Well, also some commandeered French trucks. They have been delayed by both naval gunfire and aerial bombardment, but they arrive on the scene around 4 p.m. They also have 10 Stug assault guns with them by now. But they run into elements of the 5th East Yorks and the 4th 7th Dragoon Guards. The Yorks have just captured villiers le sec after two hours of fighting. The fight now does not go well for Kampfgruppe Meyer. Meyer is killed and most of the Kampfgruppe destroyed. Under air attack and harried by the fleet, never mind Allied ground troops, very few grenadiers appear to have survived this brief encounter. It was reported to the 352nd Division at 1730 hours in terms of complete annihilation, in which all the senior German officers were killed, wounded, or captured, valuable documents and maps captured, and the survivors pushed south across the river Sul. Well, okay, there's that. But the Germans do manage to capture 151st Brigade Commander Henry Sr. at 445. He's in a jeep visiting his forward units when he runs into an ambush. He's wounded and taken prisoner. He has on him at this time a bunch of marked maps and all of the Allied signal codes for the next two weeks. But guess what? He manages to escape a couple hours from now and makes his way back to safety. I'm not certain if he still has his documents on him or not, but either way, there is no record of the enemy actually making use of them. This is the only actual organized counterattack behind Gold Beach, or Omaha Beach for that matter, also in Crace's sector. Its failure can be attributed to the premature use of the Corps Reserve. Had Generals Marx or Kreis a better intelligence picture of the Allied dispositions during the morning and a little more patience, these battalions would not have had to cycle 40 miles hither and thither before attacking their foes. That's a good point. I mean, what if these guys had hit 50th Division many hours ago while it was fully occupied fighting Le Riviere and Le Amel, the latter of which still has not entirely fallen even now? It could have been another story. I think the Allies got kind of lucky that having their signals codes fall into enemy hands did not turn out to be a big thing. I think so too, but that is the vagaries of war. Hey, how about that Hillman position? That looks like a pretty serious defense system. It very much is. And here's something special for all of you, so you can get a better idea of just how these underground systems looked and worked. Here's Paul Woodedge and Ryan Sokash and a German bunker. So this is the east end of Omaha Beach, and honestly, other than the beautiful panoramic, the military remnants are less cinematic and impactful than I was really expecting. What would this have looked like in its heyday? And what remains? Well, this is a German Widerstands nest or resistance nest. And there is more than we can see from this particular location because what the Germans would do is they'd incorporate their bunkers and positions and trenches into whatever there was there existing as best they can to camouflage it. So in front of us, 
We have two mortar to Brooks for spigot type mortars, probably 81 millimeter that are here because they can see across towards the beach. There's a draw, a valley that they're defending here, mm -hmm. connected by trenches. They can move machine guns. It's kind of more mobile along the trenches there. But down in front of us, which we'll go to in a minute, was a position with a couple of larger caliber weapons, 50 millimeters, 75 millimeters. And what they did here in this particular location at the east end of the beach, is they incorporate those bunkers into an existing French little kind of chalk quarry. So there were okay. already some earthworks and they built into that to hide it as best they can because the Germans know that the Allies will be flying over taking photos of this all through 43, 44. So anything they can do to hide their construction aids their, their secrecy. You know, I'm thinking no matter how strong military might, may have been, standing up here and seeing over 100,000 guys in the water coming your way must have been scary. Was there any documentation as per the emotions or you know, conversations that were held here when that was on the horizon? Not right here, because right here, these Germans were uh, eliminated quite early by a breakthrough off the beach. But further down the beach, a few hundred yards that way, there are some surviving German accounts of people who, who absolutely saw uh, from here, you'd be, uh, be able to see two and a half thousand, maybe three thousand ships coming towards you and, and the naval power behind that, the bombardment, the aerial bombardment early, it was clearly anything more than they would have possibly imagined as would be coming their direction. Don't forget the German commanders are playing down the Allied strength. Oh, they don't worry, they don't have very much. They're not going to come here with very much. And of course, when they actually see that armada, it would have been uh, incredible. That's an interesting intersection of your ideology being tested by the reality, of yeah. the repercussions of it, yeah. really. Now, I also understand that there weren't only um, ethnic Germans uh, at these bunkers that there was a mix, that there were POWs fighting. That Yeah, it's a very complicated situation. I mean, sort of 40 to 50% of German troops defending the bunkers were, were Ostrupans, so Eastern Europeans of various levels of commitment to the cause, you know, Russian POWs, Poles, Slavs, some of them very committed, some of them less committed, some of them literally looking for an opportunity to run away as soon as they could, and others who are, say, highly motivated, and then the Germans be sat behind them. This particular location where we are now was one of the better more German, German divisions, elements of 352nd Infantry Division here, who are quite an experienced unit, so still quite young guys here, but mostly ethnic Germans here, who would have been pretty motivated to, for, the, for the ideology, yeah. um, although it's kind of a blanket statement to make. Well, when I look at this from today's perspective, you know, it's cold, hard, wet cement. And from what I understand, these types of bunkers were never pretty, they were never comfortable, they were never cosmetic, other than maybe an intimidation factor. And uh, I wondered, did the soldiers feel proud, dignified, in, in something so gross for so long? Well, don't, don't forget, they're, they're not living inside these bunkers all the time. For part of their life, they're living in French farms 500 yards away, yeah. coming here on shift work. So they're not living inside the bunkers. And they're part of a mechanism where they're going out on a daily basis and seeing signs up in German and Commandant Tour and headquarters. So they're feeling this is quite a strongly held German presence everywhere. The, the bunker itself may not be the best representation of the occupation, but yeah. they're, they're, they, they are, they're coming here and they're, they're doing a, a shift work and then they're going back having some break in their accommodation. Tell me a little bit more about what would have been positioned here and, and how would the soldier Observe, what was his duty? Well, for a start, the German would never expose himself to being out where we are standing outside. Everything is done internally. Okay. And so inside on these walls here, where you get this octagonal uh, section around here, yeah. they've long since faded away if ever they were here, but they would have uh, oil paintings on these surfaces okay. with all the ranges worked out. So they would know, for example, that there's a position halfway down the beach that is perhaps 2,500 meters away, and they would know that to, to elevate their mortar to have that, hit that position, it would be 4.7 degrees at you know, 217 degrees compass point so and so, so they can instantly refer yeah. to a predetermined range target there. So they rarely have to bring their heads out to see anything. So they're operating it from inside here. The spigot mortar that was here you load the mortar round at the bottom and then turn it and fire it. You're not out the top dropping mortars down the top. Um, the same would be for the artillery piece in the bigger bunkers. They're just working off predetermined data. Yeah. Was there any amenity here in terms of maintaining the soldiers' morale under siege? 
Um, Maybe some political propaganda slogans. Uh. Yeah, no, absolutely. Some of these bunkers have little slogans. Um, there's one on Utah Beach where the slogan says, every time ready to fire or always ready to fire be a better translation of it. So someone's put that there in sort of German script to kind of motivate the guys. And sometimes mm -hmm. there'd be perhaps some uh, pictures of, of their sweethearts back home and things like that and these patriotic phrases. Well, as far as amenity goes. As far, yeah, as far as that goes. <laughs> Picture of um, your sweetheart, I guess, that's the thing that uh, can give you a little motivation to live. Yeah, I mean, for this position here, Vida Stones at 6, there's another set of uh, defenses over there that has more of a kind of an underground situation where you can have maybe six or eight people in there yeah. with some bunk beds some things like that for kind of taking a bit of a break in between duty or to, to hide out when it's raining, things like that. And these have, depending on the, the level of the uh, sophistication of the position, they can have anti-gas defense. Sometimes they have, you know, heating in the winter, even kind of air conditioning in the summer because they've got ventilation coming yeah. through. So it depends how a particular position has been has been built, but they, they could get quite sophisticated with quite some, quite some mod cons. Now, finally, I'm curious, when the Allies came here, made their way up, took these positions, did they utilize the armaments that were left behind? And did they know how to use those weapons? Very rarely, no, because um, it's in a fixed line here. Uh, you're now moving in land. To know how to use this is the first hurdle. You've got to work out how to operate it. Then you've got to have the fire information from back here. So frankly, you've got your own weapons, weapons you've, you've, you've served with. So the Americans coming up here would have their own. Uh, 50 millimeter mortars and stuff like that. So they, they would rare, rarely use the enemy weapon. That's kind of a movie trope where the, the guy hero picks up sure. an MP40 and runs with it, but not, not in practice very often. Fascinating. So now we're about to check out the uh, central corridor bunker, as you called it. This was a place that really united the network in a sense, right? Yeah, every every position has to have some sort of central position, the coordination position where supplies are kept, where the officer would have his billets and and there'd be a couple of bunk beds for people to take a kind of a break in here. But this okay. is the one for this position here, Vida Snorzer 60's kind of support central bunker. Then you can see it's been fortified under the ground, yeah. reinforced concrete above it, all built into the environment with trenches connecting it to the other ones. Well, I've got to say, this is one of those blatant contrast of military and uh, and war, because on one hand, you've got like one of the most beautiful sights I've ever witnessed. And then in front of me, you have this deadly looking dark hole in the ground, you know? Uh, well, welcome to Normandy. That is exactly how we live here. We live with the remnants of World War II, with life goes on. You know, on, on the beaches in the summer, there are people standing there talking about their World War II history, alongside people taking their families to play on the sand. And those two worlds coexist pretty successfully. I've got to say, though, I mean, my very first impression, it's uh, more well-kept than I kind of expected it to be. And uh, I don't know if that's the effect of renovation, but it's uh, dry, it's uh, surprisingly intact. Yeah, these ones were, were dug out uh, fairly recently, like five, six years ago. They, they'd been, the entrances had kind of been sealed in and they kind of opened up and made the access into it again. And what they found was pretty much as it was. It had been sealed up from the top and it hasn't been, as far as I know, hasn't been cleaned out. It is what we're seeing is how it was left when German soldiers left here on sometime on the afternoon of June the 6th, 44. So tell me, uh, this room, for example, what would we have, what would we have uh, seen in its heyday? A bit of everything, really. I mean, there'd be a couple of bunk beds here for people to take a break in between working while the bunkers or the machine guns. There'd be some uh, a, a map board, perhaps things like that. There's some ammunition stored here. There's, there'd be a steel door, of course, defending the entrance. The steel doors were all taken away after World War II for their scrap value. So we're no, we're no longer seeing the defensive uh, area. Um, they'd always have ventilation, so you can still see the pipe uh, still sitting here that would bring in fresh air. There'd sometimes be a complete compressor unit that pumps fresh air in. If not, there'd just be a vent that brings air in. There'd be boxes, there'd be jerry cans, there'd be, you know, um, electric lights here for the darkness, all these, these kind of things. Basically everything this bunker, this bunker complex would need to support it would be kind of concentrated here. So is there more to it? Yeah, it, uh, it would connect via uh, trenches to the other positions and of course even though it's just really for coordination and storage and uh, this still has its own defense so as we come out the door here 
we continue up and we'll let you go first. You go up to a, a machine gun defensive position, probably an older type uh, Polish early machine gun or German 08 machine gun, something like that. So it can be defended uh, from attack with ammunition recesses here left and right for boxes of ammo. So do you suppose that uh, they would have felt any nerves approaching this uh, position when, when action was happening? The Germans would be, in many ways, they'd feel quite confident here because they've been here for months. Their, their superiors have told them this is an you know, uh, impregnable set of defenses. Don't worry, the you know, Führer has got you covered, lads, kind of thing. So they believe everything is going to be set up there. It will change a little bit on the morning of D-Day when they see all those ships coming in. But um, I think generally they're... they're their, their day would have begun feeling more confident, and then as the day progresses, it would have got worse and worse. Yeah. And yet we can enjoy a stunning view. So one of the things I want to talk about here is how the German defensive position as a whole wasn't designed to last very long. It's basically meant to stop the Allies at the water's edge, and hopefully that will be enough. And you can tell that by the fact the ammunition stowage areas aren't very big. You know, some of the German machine guns can fire up to you know, 1,200 rounds per minute. And if you imagine box ammunition there, they, you've got a few minutes worth there. So essentially, Rommel's plan was that the Allies would be halted at the water's edge. The Allies would fail at that first moment there. And it, they, these positions wouldn't need to have very much ammunition because that first wave would just be halted. What happened universally across the beaches is the first wave often experienced heavy losses, but the second wave arrived 10 minutes later, and then a third wave 10 minutes after that. And once the Allies started putting so many men ashore, often these positions ran out of ammunition before they ran out of, uh, of, of will, so to speak. If they simply haven't got any am more ammunition for their guns to keep on firing, you'll see that on certain other positions where the Germans just no, have no rounds left to fire. So, Would the Germans surrender in that situation? Uh, surrender or, or, or move to handheld. You know, they've got rifles as well and kind of hold on there. So the German defences seems to be very strong, but it's in many ways a kind of a paper-thin facade that is dependent on the on it working in those first few moments. And, and what happened is it didn't work in those first few moments. You have these two kind of levels of combat going on at the same time. You have the massive great naval guns engaging with their eight inch shells on a large level, firing over the top and helping to reduce these positions. And at the same moment, you might have two GIs running up a, a gully and attacking two Germans in a machine gun position where it is almost hand to hand uh, combat. Perhaps if the Germans had fought in the Eastern Front where some of them had, they would have a, maybe a, a sharpened edge to their entrenching tool for that kind of close combat. I'm not saying that did necessarily happen, but that those sort of small en engagements definitely happened on D-Day as it got very, very, very intense in some of the, some of the locations. Can you paint the picture for me as to how this beach would have looked from the perspective of this bunker on D-Day? So this, this is part of a German Widerstand's nest, so a resistance nest, so it's a complex of bunkers. On each beach, the Germans did what they could to incorporate those bunkers into the environment that happens to be there naturally. So here clearly is an urban environment. So there are mortars hidden in effectively the basements and gardens of houses, trenches dug through back gardens, and here, the bunk has been incorporated into the existing seawalls. So this wall was always here. But running along that seawall was huge tangles of barbed wire to stop the Allies getting off it, which is why the, uh, the, the Canadian force mostly didn't land on this stretch of beach ahead of us. They landed behind us. So they're not in the field of fire of this gun. And what's interesting about this gun is this five centimeter pack can turn and rotate towards me and then down the beach looking into the camera there. It can also face up the street there, up down the street there and over that way. It's got about 270 degrees field of fire, so I've chosen to locate it here. But because the Allies have an incredible amount of knowledge, they've got aerial photos, they've got information from the French, what they're able to do is plot the very worst parts of the beach and try and bring the forces in around that. So what they're doing is, is they're coming in around the side and attacking from behind here and taking out from the rear. So we've visited some of the bunkers along the coastline, which were rather standalone, isolated feeling. This, in contrast, is sprawling, damp, it's a bit of a maze. What 
is the difference? Simply because we're at the next level of sophistication. The, the beach defenses are um, smaller, the bunkers have trenches between, but now we're talking about a major artillery position to deal with the threat of a Navy, an sort of Allied invasion coming in. So the Germans are now creating a city underground. So, okay, yeah, we're seeing it when it's a bit damp and a bit nasty to walk into. But at the time, you're talking about a thriving city where 170 Germans are living in this complex at any one time. So there's electric lighting and there's, you know, maybe music playing out through the, the system here. And these tunnels are the means of moving from the storage areas to the ammunition dump, uh, areas to the bunkers, all safe from any potential Allied air, air, air bombardment. So we're at the next level of sophistication here. And I'll be honest with you, as a visitor, I could imagine that this feels a degree safer because there's actually another place underground where you could escape to. Yeah, and the very fact we're in it here and walking through it, and we know this area was heavily bombed before D-Day and on D-Day, is the fact that it obviously didn't do much damage because we're here. There was some damage to this site, but really this type of defense keeps it not 100% protected from the Allied invasion, but you know, to a point where you can be confident that you're not gonna get uh, interrupted here. But tell me, how would this compare to modern technology? Well, modern technology is very different because shells have that much more sophistication with various levels of explosives and penetrating things or hollow charge and things like that. And I expect these days it would be fairly easy to, to, to destroy this. But the, with World War II bombing, essentially dropping big lumps of metal out of aircraft from a head, uh, 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 overhead, it's, it's not going to really make much difference. And we know that by the fact we're in it uh, 78 years on without that damage being visible. We've just been going through about 200 yards of rather simple but still pretty cool tunnels where we have to crouch to go through, but we're getting further into the Asville battery. So come with me now as we go into the next level of underground storage and ammunition areas. Just when I thought it couldn't get bigger, we've descended underground. Tell me, how did this sprawling complex come to be? Well, the Germans occupy Normandy in 1940, so Rommel's 5th Army come up here and occupy this area. Up until that moment, though, there was no construction here. The construction of these defences didn't even begin for two years. 1942, things have turned very sour on the Eastern Front. We know that Barbarossa starts failing, etc., etc. Then the Germans begin to think about defending on the Western side of, the, of Europe what they'd already seized and that's when the construction of the Atlantic War begins and what the Germans are doing is they're looking for really good geographical areas where they can have a battery that has good vision, good, good support network, plenty of locals to have to help with labour and things like that and that's why Asville where we are now was uh, chosen because it overlooks the beach and it's near the main roads towards Cherbourg, which of course being a deep water harbour is something the Germans really want to defend because of the previous experience of Dieppe in August 1942, Operation Jubilee. So they know the Allies are gonna to want to need a harbour. So set up those defences to keep a harbour safe. And that's where Asville starts coming into the story. How much did the Allies know about this complex? How did they gather the information that they did know? And were they fearful of this place? They did have information. The majority of the information is going to be aerial photos. And the problem with aerial photos is they cannot penetrate below the level of the ground. You can understand there's a bunker there, there's a bunker there, there's a bunker there. There's a limited amount of information coming from the French resistance, but that is only going to be French people who are allowed within the construction sites because the Germans aren't stupid. They're not going to let every Tom, Dick and Harry from 20 miles away near what is going to be a very secret location. So. The workers that are allowed in here, who might not even be from Normandy, they might be brought in from Poland or somewhere else, how much information can they relay to the resistance to get back to Allies? So the Allies had information, but often with these big fortifications, they had misunderstood how strong they were below the ground. And we know that sites like this, Asville, uh, there's Mayerville in the British sector, Crisbeck is another one, Long Mare. Generally, though they were bombed before D-Day and on D-Day, the damage was not what the Allies had hoped. They were mostly still able to fire on D-Day, mostly still operational. This one itself wasn't liberated till June the 9th, troops from Utah Beach, so they provided big defensive positions for the Germans to set up in, and that's what you have here at places like Asville. I'm not surprised at all. This place is big and it is brutal.
So here within the quarters, you start to come upon an interesting contrast in reference to this photo where the people who were housed here had personal artifacts and were probably trying to cling to some sentiment of humanity, yet they were waiting for a time that either horrific things would happen to them or they would have to do horrific things to others. Walk me through that sentiment and a day in the life. Well, the first thing I want to say is I don't think they feel that what's looming is going to be disastrous. They think they're confident. The ideology they've been they've bought into, even if they're not loyal Nazis, is the German war machine is still functioning. It's still brilliant. These defences are amazing. They're they're safe here. They're underground. They've got air conditioning in almost in the summer. They've got heating in the winter. They've got food on site. They've got canteens. They've got leave every now and then to go up to Cherbourg and 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 see women and have a few beers. So I think they're sitting here supremely confident that they're in a place place like this. It's either here or the Russian front. Where would I rather be? Right here. So they're getting up and they're living on site preparing for something that's happening. But I think until the morning of D-Day and there they start receiving that bombardment, they are supremely confident that they are part of a mechanism that is going to thwart this invasion completely. So with that in mind, I'd have to kind of retract what I said earlier because it would seem that humanity was absolutely lost if people in this condition could actually believe that they stand a chance of a positive future. This is amazing. It's like on the scale of industrial decay. What kind of armaments were held here? So this is where one of the French 105 millimeter uh, gun sets out here that can fire 12 kilometers, so eight or nine miles. And the fact is we don't need to be able to see the beach from here because this is using information coming in from a fire observation position a couple of miles away at Crisbeck. So they're being told what to do by telephone. If the telephone doesn't work by runners and signalers and what have you, and they just simply turn to a pre-determined uh, elevation and, uh, and bearing and they can fire the target. So massive guns and firing it here was just horrible. The vacuum created when this gun fires, you know, you have to have ventilation behind it. And these guys are essentially not, they're not trained monkeys, but they're not the tech. They're, they're not the clever part of the tech. The clever part of the technology is the observation elsewhere. These guys are just following what they've been told to do to fire on a target elsewhere. Which leads me to wonder if one party is a, inside of a fire observation tower, the others are here and this bunker is huge. I imagine they had to, communicate with one another. How was that done? Well, this is the, one of the things that became a factor for the Germans on D-Day is often the Allies had not damaged the bunkers, but they had taken out communications. And so there's uh, limited telephone lines operating between the various positions. The runners start getting killed as they go out. Telephone lines get broken. And often it was the failure to communicate between bunkers that lets the Germans down. The gun itself is still operable. The crew are still there, but they don't have the fire orders coming out. So there is a system to communicate, but it's not perfect. It's certainly not perfect when along this coast over there behind Utah, you know, 300 medium bombers fly down the morning of D-Day dropping you know, hundreds of tons of bombs and that takes out some of the communication. So yeah, communication they thought was perfect here, but it ended up being imperfect. This is one of the larger complexes that I visited and it makes me wonder, what do you believe it represents in terms of the Nazis overall scale? Well, it's folly. I mean, it's all this money into something that didn't work. I mean, that, that's the thing, is that you can argue the merits of the Tiger Tank and the Stuka and the Messerschmitt, this, that, and that, but this Atlantic Wall project that ran from the coast of Norway right down to the border with, you know, with Spain didn't work. It barely delayed the Allies for the first few hours of morning of D-Day. So all these thousands of tons of concrete, all this steel, all these hundreds, thousands of workers, they are part of something that basically fails, and it fails on the first day it was ever used. Well, I've got to say, standing here in a free France and in the free part of the world, I'm sure as hell glad that it failed. Failing it may be, but in the American zone, there is still fighting going on in and near several coastal villages. Robert Cole's small group has held out at saint marie du monts church, for other than the occasional German patrols at the outskirts of the village, there has been no direct threat to their position. Well, until the first heavy shells suddenly hit the ancient stone walls. Like all church steeples in the area, these formidable observation posts are prime targets for the artillery and mortar of both sides. Under enormous explosions, Cole and his men quickly scramble down as the upper part of the church begins crumbling around them. 
As they reach the ground, they suddenly hear the sound of armor approaching. An American tank comes rumbling through the bushes, but this was not the culprit of the shelling. They soon find out it came from Oldi. But wait, that's the place where the paratroopers of the 506 neutralized the German artillery. Now the Americans, it seems, are using the captured howitzers, and it is they who have shelled the church steeple here, thinking it is being used by German observers. Such incidents of friendly fire between the outfits are not uncommon. In the early afternoon, Task Force RAF enjoys a rather uneventful journey. The 17 Shermans and four six-wheel Greyhounds only encounter dead or captive Germans along the busy roads. Once they make their way off the causeways, they follow the road for three miles until they reach a junction called Le Forge. From here, they can see the high church steeple of saint Marie-Glis, or what's left of its smoldering top. Since the Germans have made no effort to block Le Forge, Raff decides to keep the momentum going and directs his small armored column northwards. Then the road begins to slope downward, descending into a valley with overgrown ridges on either side. This is a great place for an ambush. And that is just what happens. Three tanks are lost in the blink of an eye before they can line up and respond. The German commander on top of that ridge is no fool and knows that he holds a strong position. With a direct assault out of the question, Raff orders his men to change gears and reverse out of range of the enemy anti-tank guns. It is not going to be easy to get to San Mereglis. 115th Regimental Headquarters has been down on the beach since landing at Easy Red, but about 4.30, they head up the E1 draw towards Saint Laurent. I said this morning that WN 66 and 67 protect that draw. 66 does fall to the attackers this afternoon, but 67, on the western side, will remain in German hands for several more hours. The village itself will end the day still in German hands, though at 6 p.m., an American company will reach the center of town, but will be driven off. There's something else we see this hour, though, inland. We see more Allied bombing of German-occupied targets. At about 4.30 p.m., the citizens of Khan are bombed again. This time, though, it is the medium bombers of the 9th Air Force that do the job. The attack on Caen is just one of a series of strikes this afternoon carried out by a total of 225 B-26 Marauders and 130 A-20 Havocs. These aircraft drop over 400 tons of bombs on four coastal batteries, six road junctions, and four bridges in and around Norman towns. All of a sudden, someone yelled out, Planes are diving! Quick, everyone inside! We had enough time to catch a glimpse of the planes. They had a white star on the fuselage and a strange tail with two rudders shaped like plates, which were connected to the elevator. The planes flew at low altitude and there was a strident whistling noise as they passed over our heads, but they didn't shoot. We rushed into the trench. Phew, it couldn't have come sooner. We had barely gotten to safety when all hell broke loose. Terrorized little children began to scream as the machine guns tore up the area above us. The planes were turned to attack, one after another. They swooped down on us and fired continuously. One woman was screaming as the children around her sobbed. I wondered when the infernal racket would finally end. It was the lowest the planes had ever flown. We had the horrifying impression that they were targeting us that we already had one foot in the grave and our only option was to sit and wait. What did they all want from us? I wanted to rise up in revolt against whom I did not know. I felt like crying out, this is your great liberation? We are all meant to get our share? Our world was calm before you arrived. Perhaps it wasn't terrific, but at least we had a chance to make it out in one piece. Whereas now? The sound was enough to drive one mad if only the kids would stop their wailing and their mother, Mercy. She should shut her mouth, yelled Colette, who had limited herself to plaintive sighs up until that point. I was relieved that my sister was brave enough to bring the woman into line. You have to pull yourself together. It was hard to believe, but we didn't hear any more noise outside. We listened closely, silence. At last, it was over. Everyone in the trench calmed down as well. Someone next to us abruptly started laughing uncontrollably. It was a strange, Wild guffaw, we were all on edge, but alive. 
Also, 37 Marauder bombers attacked the German battery at Mont Canessy with 61 tons of bombs this hour. As D-Day drew near, the Allied air marshals did really carefully watch the skies over the North Sea and the English Channel. The great air offensive into Germany was in full swing, and the Luftwaffe is seemingly on the brink of destruction. Yet they are not out of the count yet. The same goes for the strong German batteries and mobile reserves on the ground, which could wreak havoc on a tightly packed landing force. So if the Allies want to achieve success on D-Day, they need to utilize their strongest assets, planes that spit fire and move like lightning. There are few aircraft more iconic than the Vickers Supermarine Spitfire. The sleekness of its wings, the distinct sound of its engine, the whole design has, by now, become the embodiment of wartime Britain. But back in the early 1930s, it seemed like the Royal Air Force was fast asleep, dreaming of the glory of bygone days of agile little biplanes with Vickers machine guns. And the sudden power surge of the German Luftwaffe was a rude awakening. Reports about the new aircraft coming from the likes of Messerschmitt, focke Wolf, and Junkers led to the British Air Ministry issuing specification F-1035, the urgent need for a powerful new fighter with excellent speed and maneuverability. The engineers at Supermarine headquarters felt confident they could deliver exactly that and more. By March 1936, they presented their first working prototype, K-5054, which was soon to be called Spitfire Mark I. The Spitfire's oval platform wings, which resemble a leaf shape, seemed to embody aerodynamic perfection. They were also very light, with the engineers trying to keep the wings as thin as possible while still being able to house four machine guns. Outfitted with a two-blade propeller and an ultra-smooth paint job, the first Spitfires could reach a top speed of 560 kilometers per hour. This was also because of another technical masterpiece coming from the British Isles, the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. Originally, it was designed for the Wellington bomber, but seemed inadequate for high-altitude fighters since it lost efficiency fairly quickly at higher altitudes. But once Rolls-Royce engineers found that a coolant made out of pure ethylene glycol would still boil at 120 Celsius at 8,230 meters, it gave fighter planes like Spitfires a massive boost in speed and acceleration. The Royal Air ordered their first batch of 300 Mark Ones to upgrade their outfit. However, there was a downside to innovation. The Spitfires revolutionary design seemed just too complicated to produce. In fact, the Germans could build three ME-109s in the same time it took the British to make one Spitfire. In September 1939, when Messerschmitt put out more than 100 ME-109s, Supermarine made just over 30 Spitfires. Many in general in the Air Ministry thought the Spitfire didn't have much of a future because no matter how good it was, if the Germans could really outproduce them, then it was simply not worth it. And truly, there were no initial plans to continue the Spitfire beyond the Mark I. But the outbreak of the war with Germany quickly turned that around. With the Isles under increasing air attacks by the Luftwaffe, the RAF had no choice but to use what they had at hand. And the small force of some 300 Spitfires that was available quickly proved their worth. Pilots immediately noticed the versatility of the Spitfire's slender wings, which allowed for such incredibly tight turns that pilots could even suffer blackouts from the heavy G-force. The elliptical wings allowed for a rapid climb rate, while at the same time lowering stall speed. And unlike other contemporary aircraft, the wings react when the Spitfire is about to go into a stall. A noticeable wobble alarms the pilot and gives him a chance to pull out in time. Together with perfectly harmonized controls, this fighter offered an excellent compromise between maneuverability and steadiness for shooting down German bombers. By the time of the Battle of Britain, though, the Spitfire was not the unchallenged champion of the skies. But although the German ME-109 was the quicker plane, a faster diver with more firepower, it had a hard time dealing with the Spitfire's ability to make ultra-tight turns in a dogfight. Still, to not fall behind, Supermarine called in supreme urgency, and its workers put in 15-hour shifts to bring the spit to the next level. New exhaust pipes gave a boost to its speed, and with engine heat diverted 
into the wings, it prevented the now eight machine guns from freezing at high altitudes. There was a simple rearview mirror to help escape the Germans on their tails, as well as a thicker windscreen glass to reduce injuries from frontal attacks. The fuel tank was covered by an alloy cover, and additional armor plating was added to the rear of the pilot seat, but maybe the biggest improvement in performance was achieved by switching out the Spitfire's propeller. The original two-speed propeller was removed, and the new Mark II was upgraded with a constant speed propeller. This allowed for even greater maneuverability, as well as a stronger climb and a higher ceiling. The new propeller also reduced the takeoff distance required by 25% and reduced the climb rate to 6,000 meters from 11 minutes to eight. Another big help was the arrival of better fuel from the US. The new 100 octane was way superior to the previous 87 octane fuel. This not only increased the Spitfire's overall acceleration, but also gave the pilot an emergency boost system. When the need for speed arose, the pilot could push a red thumb lever to override the engine's boost control and inject extra fuel into the system. A short-term rush of an extra 58 kilometers per hour was the reward. Of course, it had to be used sparingly to preserve the engine's life, but you know, that's pretty cool. The Germans weren't sleeping, of course, and their new Messerschmitt BF-109E was a tough opponent. But another major step forward for the British came with the introduction of the Mark V in 1941, which was equipped with the updated Rolls-Royce Merlin 45 engine. The Mark V came with several modifications and variations. Some Spitfires were now equipped with 20 millimeter cannons, others with a bomb rack. Some had their wings clipped, others theirs expanded, depending if they were to fight in low or high altitude operations. By the time of D-Day, the Spitfire has evolved from a symbol of resistance and defiance to the old workhorse of the Empire. Thousands are now deployed all over the globe, flown not only by British pilots, but by pilots from Canada, Australia, New Zealand, as well as Belgian, Dutch, French, Norwegian, Czech, Polish pilots. As June 1944 has drawn closer, it is the Mark IX that provides the ultimate Spitfire experience. The new Rolls-Royce Merlin 63 V12 engine is able to pump out 1,690 horsepowers, and a new four-bladed propeller gives the Spitfire its best possible performance. With a top speed of 657 kilometers per hour at 7,620 meters, the Spitfire can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the German Focke Wolf FW190 and compete with the new planes coming from the US. Once the weather improves over Normandy, it is the task of the 2nd Tactical Air Force of Airfield Number 125 to provide direct support to the invading forces and keep the skies clear of enemy interceptors. They do and will accompany bombers into the lowlands, attacking railway junctions and airfields. In the absence of Luftwaffe fighters, they themselves undertake rhubarb missions, attacking ground targets like V-1 installations, anti-aircraft positions, and trains. It was 1940 when the Royal Air Force undertook retaliation strikes and bombing raids against occupied Europe. But losses among bomber crews were heavy, and Britain could hardly afford to assign any more Spitfires to escort duty. So, in need of reinforcements, but with their own aircraft industry working at their limits, the British looked towards American manufacturers for help. Many American entrepreneurs saw the war in Europe as a major business opportunity, and one of the most ambitious ones was the head designer of the North American aviation company, Ed Schmood. He and his engineers were eager to get their hands on the first combat reports from the Battle of Britain and channel those experiences into their new prototype, the NA-73. Like the Spitfire, the NA-73's design was quite innovative. A laminar flow airfoil built around a sleek, all-metal, stressed skin airframe was to become the main characteristic of the new plane soon known as the Mustang. A second major selling point was its range. Since the Mustang stored its fuel inside two self-sealing tanks inboard the wings, its capacity was 180 US gallons, 681 liters, which was nearly twice the amount of the Spitfire. Soon, NA brokered a deal to send Britain a total of 620 of their new planes. Now, although the US was neutral, 
North American Aviation was a private company, and as long as the German-born Schmood did not raise the suspicions of the American security offices or give the U.S. Army Air Corps a reason to block his aircraft sales to a foreign power, this was fine. But the Royal Air Force did lay down some specifications. First, the Mustang had to be built with a liquid-cooled inline engine. The only one available in the U.S. at that time was the Allison V1710, which was a little heavier and larger than the Merlin, but similar in power output. Second, the British needed significant firepower, so the Mustang Mark I was armed with two 50 caliber Browning machine guns in the underside of the nose, synchronized to fire through the propeller. Another two were mounted in the wings outboard of the landing gear. Four additional 30 caliber guns were set further outboard on the wings. The first tests of the designated British prototype NA-73X showed the plane worked rather well with the engine and the heavy weight of the guns. It was almost 40 kilometers per hour faster than the contemporary P-40. The Mustang's laminar flow airfoils were a bit problematic at first, as while they produce less drag at high speed, they produce less lift at low speeds, which made landings rather difficult. So North Americans engineers had to extend the flaps and add straight spars to the wings to stabilize the fast aircraft. By July 1942, all 620 Mustangs had been successfully shipped over to Britain. By then though, the battle for Britain had been decided, at least in the air, so the Mustang was mostly deployed for cross-channel sweeps against German trains, supply depots, and other targets of opportunity. There are many historians that consider the Mustang the best American-made fighter plane of the war. It is faster than the Spitfire at an altitude below 7,600 meters and has twice the range with the larger fuel tanks. Fully loaded, the Mustang can reach a top speed of 595 kilometers per hour at 4,570 meters at a cruising speed of 290. This gives a maximum range of just under 1,600 kilometers. However, they are by no means perfect. The Mustang's performance drops sharply at altitudes above 4,600 meters. Where the Mustang needs 11 minutes to climb to 6,000 meters, the Spitfire 5 can reach that in seven. And once up there, both the Spitfire and the ME109 are superior in agility and turning speed. This sharp decline in performance is mostly from the Mustang's Allison engine, as well as its heavy weight, which is a third more than that of the Spitfire. For those reasons, the RAF employs the Mustang mostly in low-level tactical reconnaissance and ground attack missions, since the supercharged Allison engine really excels in these roles. Of course, it isn't just the Brits that are interested in the Mustang. When the U.S. enters the war, Air Chief Hap Arnold orders 500 NA-97 Mustangs right off the bat. He intends to use them as dive bombers. Although technically not designed for that role, the redesignated Mustang A-36A turns out to be a good fit for the job. Outfitted with perforated dive brakes, it can keep diving speeds down to 400 kilometers an hour, even with attacks starting from up to 3,700 meters, and still have excellent dive recovery ability. With the war widening in all directions, North American also wants to cover the U.S. fighter plane market as well. Initially, only the Bell P-39D Era Cobra and the Curtis Wright P-40E Warhawk are available in quantity. So NA's newest Mustang XP-51 version is equipped with the devastating firepower of 850 caliber and 230 caliber machine guns. Still... In the U.S., they get some real competition. There is also Northrop, Lockheed, Bell Aircraft, Volte, Republic, and others who all make prototype designs hoping to land the lucrative contract. The Mustang's strongest competition comes from the turbocharged Lockheed P-38 Lightning and the Republic P-47 Thunderbolt. The P-47 has even more firepower and better survivability and its air-cooled engine is more reliable, especially in the heat of combat, yet many American pilots find the Mustang to be the better plane. Its main asset, the laminar flow airfoil, is very efficient at reducing peak airflow velocities over the wings and minimizes the compressibility effects that impede many fighter aircraft at the time. With its flexibility to be used as both a long-range fighter escort 
and a ground attack plane, the U.S. Army Air Forces put their hopes in the Mustang. It's the NA-99, which becomes the P-51A in August 1942 and the P-51B by the end of 1943. As part of the U.S. 8th Air Force, the Mustang escorts heavy bombers into France and deep into Germany, and there are many large and small changes and alterations to the P-51 over the years. The P-51D, the newest version on D-Day, reaches a maximum speed of just over 700 kilometers per hour and has a max range of 2,655 kilometers. That is 800 kilometers more than a return trip from London to Berlin. This is because of its marriage with the British Merlin 61 engine, which boosts overall performance. At low altitudes, the Mustang now outmatches pretty much everything the Luftwaffe can put into the air. For D-Day and the air offensive into Germany, U.S. Fighter Command has assembled nearly a thousand Mustangs. Their main job today is to cover bombers against Luftwaffe interceptors while they sweep over the shore defenses. After that, the Mustangs are free to execute tactical airstrikes against German troop concentrations. And no matter where the Luftwaffe retires to, they can pursue them all the way to Germany and beyond if need be. The Mustang is not the only Allied attack plane with long-range and heavy firepower. One of the Mustang's biggest competitors is the Lockheed P-38 Lightning, and this plane's combat history is as interesting as its design. The P-38 is known as the Fork-Tailed Devil because it has not one, but two water-cooled 16-cylinder inline engines. Supercharged, the two Allison V-1710s put the Lightning at the top of the list of the fastest fighters in the world. Its hydraulic boosted ailerons allow for power steering and immense acceleration during flight. It is also the first American fighter plane with a smooth, flush riveted metal skin. Its birthplace is the Skunk Works at Lockheed that responded to the U.S. Army Air Force's call for a powerful new interceptor. Back in 1937, as the war between Japan and China heated up, there was a rising fear in the U.S. that they would be vulnerable to attacks from long-range bombers. To combat this possibility, the top brass laid out some specifications. They wanted an interceptor able to climb to 6,000 meters in six minutes. In the late 1930s, that was a serious demand. But Lockheed successfully created the P-322, which was soon nicknamed the Lightning by the British, who showed interest in acquiring the plane. However, there were many problems and shortcomings plaguing the first models. The planes had a power to weight problem that became really apparent at higher altitudes in the cold climate of Northern Europe. There was also, strangely enough, a real lack of automization and pilot comfort. Strange, given that the P-38 is designed as a long range plane. In the US, it isn't until mid-1942 that the Lightning is deployed in combat. In its intended role, the Lightning is sent out to the Pacific Theater to combat the Japanese invasion of the Aleutian Islands. In general, the Lightning still performs much better in warmer climates, and its long range makes it a popular over-ocean aircraft. The two engines also give the pilots a feeling of safety. The P-38 has its heyday at Guadalcanal and over the Solomons and Rabaul, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best Japanese aircraft. It is the plane's superior acceleration that gives it the upper hand in dogfights and can quickly turn the hunted into the hunter. Its counter-rotating propellers allow for the P-38 to make tight turns, unexpected in such a large fighter. Famous is, of course, the in-air assassination of Isoroku Yamamoto, commander of the Japanese Combined Fleet. After flying 700 kilometers at wave-top height, a group of lightnings leap skyward and kill the most influential man in the Japanese Navy inside his plane. The lightning's firepower is truly devastating. Four 50 caliber machine guns patterned around a Hispano M1 20 millimeter cannon in the nose of the plane. These five guns are set in a tight circumference the size of a football, and they just shred any plane that they hit. The P-38 also has enough weight capacity to carry up to 2,000 kilos of bombs. This makes the Lightning a strong contender for the US AAF's primary fighter. If it wasn't for the many flaws that haunt it, like the compressibility stall. See, sometimes 
when the pilot puts the lightning into a very steep dive at high speed. The flight controls just lock up. Nothing can be done at this point, and sometimes it becomes so severe that the whole tail structure rips apart. Another flaw is the asymmetric power defect. This can happen on the runway, when suddenly one of the two engines stops and the P-38 flips over at full speed with disastrous consequences. These flaws overshadow the Lightning's great potential. Lockheed's engineers continuously work to solve the problems and make countless modifications to the P-38's design. The P-38J is maybe the best possible version of the Lightning. Lockheed boasts that nothing the Germans or Japanese have in their arsenals other than maybe experimental fighters like the ME-163 would come even close to competing with its speed and diving and climbing ability. Outfitted with a refined aileron boost, new compressibility dampening flaps, and the latest version of the Allison V-1710, the Lightning can produce 1,475 horsepowers at 9,100 meters. The modified P-38J25 can even reach a top speed of more than 675 kilometers per hour. Problem is, the P-38J is not ready in large numbers until this spring. And anyhow, with the massive Allied aerial advantage over the Luftwaffe and the Japanese, does the US AAF really need interceptors? This day may well be the last hurrah of the lightning as the world turns in favor of the Mustang. I suppose we'll see about that as the summer rolls on. But the day is rolling on and there are new developments. This hour, the electricity is restored in some parts of northern France, and the official news of the invasion and its scope reaches the French general public. But in terms of local developments, at 4.54 p.m., Rommel orders the immediate subordination of Panzerlea Division to 1st SS Panzerkorps and the immediate deployment of the 21st Panzer Division for counterattack. Speidel passes down the order to attack immediately without regard for arrival of reinforcements. I wonder how long it'll take for them to really get going. I imagine we'll find out soon enough. But we have de Gaulle's speech, some serious explosives, and a close-up of a battle in the Bocage when we return with Hour 18 of D-Day. Military observers in London said today that a general Russian offensive coordinated with the Anglo-American attack from the West may be launched within the next 48 hours and almost certainly will begin before the weekend. News of the Allied landing in France spread swiftly throughout Russia today and touched off enthusiastic demonstrations such as rarely have been seen since the war began. American war correspondents in Moscow were the first to break the news, and they were quickly surrounded by cheering crowds who rushed to shake their hands and to offer congratulations. Radio Moscow's chief announcer, who customarily reads only Premier Stalin's orders of the day, broadcasted General Dwight D. Eisenhower's special communique announcing the landing. He read the bulletin in a solemn and triumphant tone, rivaling his best performance for the Red Army's biggest victory announcement. Soviet war marches. Yankee Doodle and the triumphal music reserved for Stalin's victory orders followed the bulletin. For two weeks now, the Russian people have been expecting the invasion to begin at any moment. And the question on everyone's lips was, has it started? The Soviet people now are waiting for their own armies to strike from the east in the coordinated offensive mapped out at the Tehran conference. The German's Transocean News Agency said today that a battle was in progress in the English Channel north of La Havre between German naval units and Allied forces attempting to make a landing. It is 5 p.m. on D-Day, and there you have it. The die is cast in the Soviet Union, and the second part of the gigantic pincer movement to defeat Nazism is set to begin very soon. In Western Europe, uh, General de Gaulle, leader of the Free French, addresses the French people by radio. In the English-speaking world, of speech is broadcast with simultaneous translation. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we're informed that we can hear from General de Gaulle in London. So we switch you now to London for the address by General de Gaulle. Gagner chacune de nos victoires, c'est ainsi que nous gagnerons celle-là. En bon ordre. Pour nos armées de terre, de mer, de l'air, il n'y a point là de problème. Jamais elles ne furent plus ardentes, plus habiles, plus disciplinées. L'Afrique L'Italie, l'océan et le ciel ont vu 
leur force et leur gloire renaissante, la terre natale les verra demain pour la nation qui se bat. General de Gaulle says that never have France's forces of the air, sea and land had such a glorious opportunity to distinguish themselves. And he speaks of the glories which the French armies have just uh, achieved in the Italian campaign. La seconde est que l'action menée par nous sur les arrières de l'ennemi soit conjuguée aussi étroitement que possible avec celle que mènent de France les armées alliées. General de Gaulle says that the first order which he has to, which the French government has to give to the French forces, uh, will be followed exactly. De l'action des forces de la résistance doit durer pour aller sans plissant jusqu'au moment de la déroute allemande. La troisième condition est que tous ceux qui sont capables d'agir, soit par les armes, soit par les destructions, soit par le renseignement, General de Gaulle says that the action which the French armies will carry out with the, the Allies against the enemy will be exactly conjugated with those of the Allies. Ou à la déportation, quelles que soient les difficultés, tout vaut mieux. And with these actions, that of French resistance will also be combined. La bataille de France a commencé. Il n'y a plus dans la nation, dans l'Empire, dans les armées, qu'une seule et même volonté, qu'une seule et même espérance derrière le nuage. And General de Gaulle says it is absolutely necessary that all French patriots take both to act by arms and by refusing to work for the Germans should not allow themselves to be taken prisoner. Le français qui vous est parvenu de Londres. Nous vous retournons au studio de la Voix de l'Amérique à New York. And General de Gaulle said in concluding that the Battle of France has begun and there is no longer except a single and, and uh, sole will to conquer on the part of the French nation. You have just heard a speech by General Charles de Gaulle and its translation, a running translation of that speech by Beverly Thurman of Columbia's shortwave news staff. Now, that speech launches a patriotic frenzy in France. Colonel Zeller, a leader of the OERA, will note in August. The FFE, based on the directives given by General Koenig, launched full throttle into actions without restriction, impelled by a magnificent national uprising of the entire population in the rural areas and small towns. But in the minds of most of the participants, those actions were supposed to be short-lived, and the hope of an imminent landing in the southeast gladdened every heart. The FFE numbered 50,000 in January and has only grown marginally. By the end of June, they will field 100,000 men and women, and by liberation, their numbers will be 500,000. The unfortunate consequence today is that many resistance fighters think that invasion and liberation are the same thing. Rundstedt is already releasing Wehrmacht units to go down and fight the Maquis at Vercors that Sparty talked about earlier today. While the Allies might very well welcome the distraction of some German forces, it will inevitably lead to lots of suffering and many, many deaths. And although it stands in stark contrast to the willingness of the Allies to bomb France and French civilians in preparation for today, this tragedy is exactly what the Allied leaders wanted to avoid when they negated the resistance a place in today's operations. The preferred solution would be that resistance men are integrated into the fighting forces as the regions they are in. Are liberated. But it is not only in France that the invasion is awaited by many. Great Britain, where US troops have been amassing for over a year, has caught invasion fever. To look at that, we turn to Anna. Since at least the Allied landings in Italy in September of 1943, newspapers have been reporting on every piece of information they can find about a cross-channel invasion and a new front in Western Europe. 
Gossip begins flying at the end of that year about who will be its commander. Once the news breaks that it is Eisenhower, a new round of forecasting comes in on his plan. Military correspondents speculate on Hitler's expectation and his preparations to fight an invasion. There are reports that the BBC has been training staff in special equipment that allows them to report from the front line. When the invasion comes, the people will have front row seats. Of course, real news is difficult to come by. Aside from formal announcement and morale-boosting speeches, Allied leaders are staying very tight-lipped about their plans. Secrecy is everything. Even essential workers are kept in the dark. The ones making parts for Mulberry Harbors don't even know what they are building, although some can likely guess. So life goes on. But Britain's war economy is full steam ahead and it is impossible not to notice the military buildup. One of the most obvious indicators that something big is happening, exciting to some and, well, annoying to others, is the presence of American troops. On the eve of the invasion, over 1.5 million Americans are stationed in the United Kingdom. They aren't spread out in every corner of the country, but instead concentrated in specific areas. These are the west of England, East Anglia in the east of England, and the corridor in the northeast. The county of Suffolk has an estimated one GI for every six English civilians, and in Wiltshire there is maybe one Yang for every two Brits. British national attention is very much fixed on these little islands of America. Famed military historian Captain Liddell Hart offers his thoughts on his regular column for the Daily Mail. I have recently spent some time in occupied England. During it, I have seen cases of rude and inconsiderate behavior by American soldiers. I have not heard merely grumbling but spiteful criticism from English people. Yet, speaking as an historian, I cannot think of any case in history where relations have been so good. Still less can I recall any case where two great allied armies have got on so well together. But that might not mean much for those sacrificing their home and lands for the new arrivals. The government has taken a vast amount of land for the war effort. By now, 20% of the country's land areas is under some form of military control. Much of this is used for training American troops. The government does aim for a policy of dual usage between military and civilian interest. But this hardly leaves agricultural land untouched. One woman will remember how this affected her small farm in Berkshire. Unfortunately, they seldom warned me that they were coming, so sometimes we were at work, plowing, drilling, threshing and so on in their area, and had to abandon work and beat a hasty retreat to avoid the bullets and shells, all of which was very annoying and disorganizing. I don't know how many of their people got shot. It was a miracle they never shot any of us. I once saw them using a flamethrower, a ghastly weapon, and they completely burned up a little spinny with it. Some communities don't have to worry about interacting with Americans, but that's only because they've been forced to leave their homes. This has happened to those living inside an area of Devon that Americans want for training purposes. On November 12th and 13, after weeks of rumors, approximately 3,000 residents around Slapton Sands are told they must leave their homes by December 20th. The satisfaction and sadness at the news is widespread. Many older residents have never left the area before, and the US Consul reports rumors of suicides at the announcement, but everyone follows the order. The Bishop of Exeter writes a notice addressed to the new American inhabitants that is pinned up on every evacuated church. This church has stood for several hundred years. Around it has grown a community which has lived in these houses and tilled these fields ever since there was a church. This church this churchyard in which their loved ones lie at rest. These homes, these fields are as dear to those who have left them as they are the homes and graves which you, our allies, have left behind you. They hope to return one day as you hope to return to yours, to find them waiting to welcome them home. But not every interaction between Yank and Brit is a negative one. Many women are particularly excited about the new arrivals. In a world of blackouts and rationing, well-dressed and well-paid Americans add a touch 
of glamour. As one Roman will remember, we were captivated at once. With their smooth, beautifully tailored uniforms, one could hardly tell a private from a colonel. They swaggered, they boasted and they threw their money around. Even some of the Tommies admit that the Americans are taller, more handsome and overall more impressive than they are. It doesn't help that British pay is much less and their uniforms are thick and shapeless. But there's also, unsurprisingly, a lot of resentment. It's something journalists and commentators have picked up on, accusing the Americans of bringing sexual immorality with them. Of course, the real problem is that the English boys are not receiving the attention they think they should get. If they were, cries about morals probably wouldn't be so strong. But another clash is the racial segregation of the US military. There are around 130,000 black American troops stationed in the United Kingdom. Just like back home, they are segregated into their own units. Segregation is maintained off base as well. There are systems of rotating leave passes to ensure different off-duty times, and places in some towns are designated white only or black only. The United Kingdom is hardly a racial paradise, but the British public thinks that black and white have both come over to help win the war. Many shopkeepers and pub owners object to being told who they can and can't serve. There are also stories of bus conductors blocking white Americans from forcing black comrades to give up their seats. Reports record reactions ranging from confusion to disgust at Jim Crow segregation. Some even find black GIs more polite and better behaved than the white ones. One maybe mythical remark recorded by the Ministry of Information goes, I don't mind the Yanks, but I can't say I care much for the white chaps they've brought with them. The British are by no means immune to racial thinking, though. Tolerance for black GIs is based mainly on the understanding that they are temporarily visitors who will remain at a distance. Black troops are never placed in British family homes, and authorities specifically advise against interracial relations. Harsh punishments sometimes await the girls who don't listen. In January, two female factory workers are sentenced to three months of hard labor after being found sleeping in a hut where black GIs were stationed. While all this cultural exchange has gone on, the build-up has continued. It has taken on particular intensity in the spring. On April 1st, a 10-mile-deep visitor ban is introduced on English coast, running from Land's End in the west to the Wash in the east. The port towns in this zone are now hives of military activity. Harbors are packed with the ships to side to side. Rivers are filled with landing crafts and every roadside has parked tanks and trucks. Soldiers are camped on every spare piece of ground there. But it seems all the excitement is going to some people's heads. At least that is what Alexander Clifford thinks in his column for the Daily Mail. The British public is going through a bad case of invasionitis. At times, as reflected in the newspapers, it almost looks like hysteria. I don't mean for a minute that it is a question of jitters, but merely that the people are in the grip of a powerful interest which has been sustained for an unhealthy length of time. The zero hours set by most of the armchair strategists have come and gone. Enthusiasm and excitement come to the boil too soon. All the important things that can be said about the second front have already been said a hundred times over. And now, because interest is so intense, relatively insignificant aspects are being whipped up into an excessive importance. It is, of course, natural and inevitable. Intelligence staff are also getting nervous that the plans might leak out. It doesn't help that the Daily Telegraph keeps printing invasion code words in its crosswords. On May 2nd, one of the answers is Utah. Then on the 22nd, it is Omaha. Then on the 27th, there's Overlord. The 30th, Mulberry. And finally, on June 1st, it's Neptune. By this point, MI5 decides to bring the crossword writer in and interrogate him. Clearly, this is a method of passing intelligence to the enemy. 
But the conclusion is that it's all a coincidence and they let the writer go. He's a teacher at a school near a military base. Turns out he often asks his pupils for crossword suggestions. They give words they have heard when hanging around with the soldiers. Thanks to Operation Fortitude, Neptune's secret is safe, as Astrid, my mom, has also been showing you today. But though the plans remain secure, it is clear that the Americans are on the move. In May, roads become clogged with military traffic as men, trucks and tanks make their way down to the gathering camps and then the embarkation points. For many Brits, this is the last they'll see of the Yanks. As one woman will recall, I got off my bike and waved for a while. Now I'm older, I should probably cry with the realization. But then I just accepted they, they had not come to sit the whole war out. I had never failed to see an American in town each time I went to school or work. Now it seemed peculiarly empty. Next to the men and their leaders, these Brits are some of the first to know that something big is happening. The last sign comes the evening of June 5th, when aircraft fill the sky and shake the ground beneath their feet. The people of Portsmouth look on as the world's greatest armada passes them by. The last question is where all these men, boats and planes are going. That is answered just after 9.30 the next day, today, with a BBC News Bulletin. Early this morning, units of the Allied armies began landing on the coast of France. But the fighting on the ground in Normandy is far from over. At Gold, the fighting for Le Hamel has continued all day since the troops first hit Gold Beach this morning. But this hot spot finally falls to the first hamps at 5 p.m. They bring in the only surviving Churchill AVRE from the 82nd Assault Squadron, this one armed with a 290mm petard mortar that fires 40-pounder shots. This drives up to the rear of WN-37, right? And it sends one through the back door and it just demolishes the interior. Major Warren, remember him? Yeah, well, Major Warren and his C Company and five tanks of the Sherwood Rangers mop up as that Churchill blows down the rest of the sanatorium complex. Behind Omaha, fighting also continues. Clarence Hubner, commander of U.S. First Division, departs from USS Ancon and heads for Easy Red Beach. Here, he takes command from Willard Wyman, his assistant. Near the mouth of the Saint Laurent Draw, he establishes his headquarters and immediately links the 116th Infantry with the divisional artillery. Just about half an hour earlier, Charles Gerhardt did the same, setting up the new beach headquarters of his 29th Division. James Roberts, Giraud's aide, lands this hour too to set up 5th Corps headquarters north of Saint Laurent. Giraud is to arrive around 9 p.m. Together now, these guys can finally give 5th Corps command some reliable information about what is actually going on on and near Omaha Beach. So far, communications between the assault troops and command has been a massive failure. A lot of this is because of the many naval fire control parties who were killed on the beach during the attack. And after that, it's been difficult to establish a new line of communications in all the chaos of battle. This lack of timely intelligence about the actual locations and the progress of the men has led to a general lack of support from the warships offshore. There's barely been contact between the fighting men on the beaches and the naval spotters, whose job it is to maintain radio contact and direct the shell fire. Many spotters have just relied instead on shipboard visual observation when choosing targets for the bombardment. And this has led to inaccurate shelling and friendly fire. And even now, those naval spotters know nothing of what is going on beyond the bluffs and only see the high church steeples of Virville, Saint Laurent, and Colleville. At about 5.30 at Omaha, the first non-American unit of the day is landed here. This is 180 British men of the Royal Air Force's 15082 GCI radar unit, ground controlled interception. They're supposed to set up all their stuff between Virville and Le Moulin, and the plan is that they'll work with a fighter direction tender offshore. 
They don't land where they're supposed to, though, because of the current and the lack of clear paths through obstacles, touching down east of D3 and coming under fire. They very much do not expect this, and they lose a lot of their radar gear and will soon enough lose 26 out of 34 vehicles. They also will have the problem of being fired on by American troops because of their blue uniforms, which aren't all that different from the German field gray. It's funny how historiography pigeonholes the fighting and the need for simplification leads to misconceptions because Omaha is really not just a beach, it's the whole area behind it. That goes for all the beaches, of course. The same goes for San Maraglis. We looked at that together with Paul when we were in Normandy. So we are in Normandy on the Cotentin Peninsula with Paul Woodach. And right behind us here is a wonderful diorama showing how the 82nd Airborne came down here right behind us. Now, it looks very different, actually, from the, because of all the, obviously, you have all the water and stuff. Paul, can you tell us a little bit about what we're seeing? Yeah. So we're facing west. Cherbourg is about 20 miles uh, behind me. Utah Beach is nine miles ahead of us. And this is the Murder Ray River, which today is about 10 foot wide. Yeah. That's... But back in 1944, we're talking about the water starting just at the bottom of the slope there, going right over just before the chapel there, because this, this is the extended flooded area caused by the Germans playing around with the French uh, coastal defense system by closing all the lock gates. So from autumn 1943, right the way up to the spring of 44, water just cannot drain away in, into the sea. So you get this massive area of inundation. Uh, causing a huge problem for, for both sides, in fact, as the battle unfolded. And uh, uh, then this would be the point that you'd have to seize in order to effectively block or cross, depending yeah. on who you are. The, the problem with the floodings is the floodings has been, have been put there by the Germans to deter the Allies from landing here at all. But yeah. we've needed to come here because we need Cherbourg, the deep water harbour. The problem that the flooding has caused is for a point between north and south of 27 miles through the floods, there are only two viable crossing points. One is this bridge here at Lafayette, and the other is another bridge about half a mile down the river at Chef du Pont. So all of 7th Corps under Lawton Collins landing on Utah Beach is fighting their way inland towards these two incredibly tiny but incredibly important crossing points of the floods to yeah. push on to the other side of the Cotentin to trap the Germans all up in Cherbourg. So that little bridge that looks like it can't be in any way significant at all, at the time was one of the major objectives of 7th Corps to just force their way across the peninsula. So where, where did the landings actually take place? So we're in the middle of a triangle of drop zones. For the, the three drop zones for the 82nd, one is up there ahead of us and two are over there, so around the flooded area with the idea of, of seizing this causeway, and that's how I'm gonna to refer to this road now because with the floods either side, that's what it becomes. So seizing it from that end, seizing it from this end, and at the same time, holding the vital crossroads of Santa Maria Glees, which is a mile and a half back up that way, which is the big central communications point in the Cotentin route, uh, roads going to the Cherbourg, back towards Caen, and across the peninsula from what became Utah Beach to the other side of the peninsula. So you said St. Mary Lees, which is really an important point here, because to us standing here and to anybody seeing this, this looks like the countryside. But this yeah. is really part of the St. Mary Lees battle. This is possibly even the most extensive part of it. Why? Well, it's become, the St. Mary Lees battle has become focused on the tragic sideshow of what happened within Santa Maria Glees itself, where a couple of uh, sticks of paratroopers who had a navigation issue flew over Santa Maria Glees and dropped these paratroopers right over the city centre where there happened to be some Germans out there in the town square. There was a fire in town that was just completely one of those random things. And these paratroopers died in the, in the square there. And that has become the focal point for so many people's understanding of what happened here on June the 6th. But actually, it's a, it's a tragic sideshow. The job of the 82nd is to form a kind of protective cushion around this crossroads to provide this area that the 7th Corps from the beach can then move into with all these transport nodes, all these choke points, the bridges then seized to facilitate that push across the peninsula. So, yeah, another statement that keeps on being made all the time is that the 82nd and the 101st were dropped, I mean, I hear that all over the place, were dropped in because their mission was to hook up with the infantry that had landed on the beaches. That is exactly what I was going, <laughs> going yeah. to say, right? Why is that wrong? 
because the opposite, the, 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 the seventh corps from the beach are moving towards, the, towards where the paratroopers are. They're, they're, the paratroopers are not doing the moving. The beach forces right. who have the, the vehicles and the transport are moving towards the paratroopers. In the end, some of them did make their way towards the beach because of the mist drops, which is something else we're going to talk about in sure. a minute. But uh, no, the, the paratroopers are forming the, the carpet. Uh, we're going to kind of market garden analogies now, but they're okay. providing the carpet for then the, uh, the, the troops on the beach to move through towards to then reinforce right. and push on beyond that. I mean, that's interesting because, I mean, now we're talking about something that you've covered a lot on the Eastern Front as well and, and something that you covered in, in World War One and the Great War. And that is the change of how we're moving away from a static war towards a mobile war. And, and how does St. Mary Glees specifically fit into that? strategy take a crossroad and, and hold it why is it really essential if i put it that way yeah well it's because it's to to bring this mechanized army that's going to be landing on utah beach and allow it to spread out and move through this complicated area to navigate through which is these small lanes and tiny little hedgerow lanes and things you, you need you need some kind of focal point to then control to then direct things out and sam wrigley's being a crossroads town is that ability and it's just inland from Utah Beach to kind of then finger your way out like a spider's web and move across that peninsula. So it's vital to sort of have somewhere within sight of Utah Beach, because Santa Maria Glees is maybe five miles from the beach. So it's, it's, a, it's an achievable objective on that first day. And then from there, you've got options. And options are, are, are great, particularly with the fact that we're not certain, although there are planned drop zones, exactly who will be landing on where and what conditions will be happening and who, what the reaction will be to the, from the Germans to those drop zones. So having somewhere to focus on is, I think, a very good part of the plan. And how many focal points like that were there that were totally essential? Well, there's Samariglis, and then there are the four causeway through the floods that come off Utah Beach that rise, go through the floods and rise up to the 30 meter high ridge of high ground that is about a mile and a half, two miles inland from Utah Beach because these arteries coming off the beach, if they are not held at the high ground end, that means the invasion force is trapped on the beach here because they can't move through these single roads. Imagine a single road with all your armor and everything coming up it and Germans sitting over there ahead of you on the high ground. That's, right. they're, they're, that's a nightmare, that's a canalization. So holding these little villages at the top of these causeways is essential. That's the 101st job, they're closer to the, the beach. Then the 82nd are seizing the bridges over the river and also the, the high ground beyond, Hill 30 is over there, uh, Chef Dupont, Picoville are over there. These other potential areas where the Germans are then moving up towards the beachhead, so to protect that whole western flank of the invasion. And that was complicated because they landed all over the place, right? Well, they did and they didn't. I mean, it's one of the things that really annoys me, and it's kind of the myth-busting thing I like to do. Is this is my favorite part when he does this kind we're of stuff. We're talking, thank you very much, we're talking like <laughs> 13,500 paratroopers coming, paratroopers landing that morning, and we talk often about those that landed a long way away from their objectives. And yes, there are some cases of people landing 15 miles away from their drop zone, which is dramatic and not ideal. But by not talking about the men who did land close to their drop zone, we're not getting across that, that uh, basic point that a lot of the men were where they're supposed to be. Drop zone O up there just ahead of us, which is where the 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment landing. They had already worked in Italy, North Africa. They have worked with the troop carrier uh, units. So the pathfinders were in place on the drop zone, lighting the beacons, the Eureka sets brought them in. And you're talking about most men landing correctly on the drop zone. Okay. And even with the drop zones over there, N and T, yeah, 20 or 30% aren't on the drop zone, but 70% are probably within a mile or two of where they're supposed to land. Now, when you're talking about the 82nd or the 101st, let's talk the 101st, the 506, the famous unit that provided Band of Brothers. Those guys have been running Kurahi Mountain, you know, three miles up, three miles day, down every day before breakfast for, for, for months. A so mile, is it? <laughs> for, for them to just move their way a couple of miles to their drop zone, it's a, it's a piece of cake for them. The difficulty is navigation. That's one of the things I want to make it clear, that when they're coming down here that morning, you are in the middle of nowhere. There is no light here whatsoever. Yeah. So you've got, a, you've got a compass, you've got a map, and, but a, a compass is totally useless until you've worked out where you are. So you find out which way north is, but then where am I in relation to these other things on the map? So it's about finding that identifying feature. So we can see there, there's a church just over there, but in the middle of the night, is that visible? And with the high hedges and the trees around here, finding that first position, that first marker would take a bit of time. But the point is the paratroopers are beginning to land from not much 
uh, beyond midnight. The landings on the Utah beach aren't till sort of 6.30 in the morning. So they've got six and a half hours to get themselves sorted out. So even if they spend two hours finding out where they are, in the grand scheme of things, they've got, still got several hours to get to their objectives. And that's the thing that despite the misdrop of the paratroops, despite the fact it was never as many people in, in any place as it was supposed to be, they achieved pretty much 95% of all their objectives that morning. Right. So that is the Allied perspective. Most people landed where they were supposed to, some did not, it created a mess. But from the German perspective, what we've got is it's a it's raining men situation, uh, yeah. right? We've got the darkness and the difficulty of navigating on the Allied side. We got the overwhelming effect of over 30,000 people coming in from the sky and landing more or less on top of the Germans. What did that do? Well, I think had the landings occurred successfully, neatly, 100% in their drop zones, it would have been fantastic from the Allied point of view, but the Germans would have identified where those drop zones are almost oh, immediately, yeah. would have worked out, therefore, where they must be going immediately, and that would have been uh, a different situation. What happens here is, for example, in that set of farm buildings just down there were 22, 23 Germans that morning out on a no more, uh, water, uh, nighttime patrol, and they're going to be having information coming at them from pretty much every single one of the 360 degrees around them. There's paratroopers over there, there's paratroopers over there, there's some paratroopers over there, there's some paratroopers over there, there's two there, 10 there. Now, do you move out to meet a force of an unknown size, right. or do you tend to stay where you are and try and wait for a clearer picture to emerge? And what happens pretty much universally behind the Utah Beach with the American Airborne, and to some extent behind the sixth airborne areas in the east, you know, 70 miles away from here, is the Germans sort of stayed put and waited for someone further up the chain of command to give a clearer picture. And about three miles that way is the Chateau de Berneville, which was the headquarters of the 91st Luftlander Air Landing Division, whose commanding officer Wilhelm Falli is on his way back from going to the conference in Rennes, that is a big feature of the Longest Day film, folks, is he's on his way back there, but on the, on the way back to his chateau, to get to his command post, which had telephone exchange and radios, he's, people say ambushed, but ambushed to me implies prepare, some yeah, kind of preparation. Yeah. He bumps into a group of lost paratroopers who kill him uh, in his car. So the 91st Division is now a chicken without a head. They, yeah. they, the commander has told them he's coming back to tell them what to do. He doesn't turn up at the command post. So there's a div division that has been designed, and the air landing division has been conceived to be a mobile strike force to respond to an airborne landing. That's what they're trained in, and they have been cut out of the picture because their commanding officer hasn't arrived there. So the, the elite response unit, although I wouldn't really use the word elite, but you know what I'm suggesting yeah, yeah, sure. here, is incapacitated. And that is just one of those things as a knock-on effect of the paratroopers not landing in the right place. They are achieving their intended objectives, but they're achieving things that weren't on the list that helped immeasurably to, to secure the, 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 well, a greater area from our point of view, but to lay a huge amount of confusion on the Germans. And that lack of coordinated response by the Germans is, is absolutely vital as to why the 7th Corps progressed as well as they did on June the 6th. One of the overlooked part about this whole situation here <coughs> is how that influenced the total casualties on Utah. And can you talk a little bit about that? Well, yes. I mean, we, when we talk about the comparisons between the beaches, so the British sector, the Canadian sector, American sector, is when we talk about Omaha, we focus on those men that were killed on the beach there, who are part of the 5th Corps, so two divisions, the 1st and the 29th landing there, with an engineer brigade that is all making up that same unit there, and then everybody else who's part of it. 7th Corps on Utah Beach, which is the 4th Division, and then the night of coming ashore the next day, also includes the 82nd and the 101st. So if you want to make a fair comparison to Omaha and between Omaha and Utah beaches, you have to include the paratrooper losses that are inland from Utah Beach, but it's the same plan, but they don't get included. So when you add all those airborne guys killed on D-Day, and we do not, even 78 years later, have an exact number of how many men in the paratroopers died on June the 6th, because the data wasn't collected for the first day, only for the first 48 hours. So yeah. sometimes finding a dead body you know, in a bit of flooded area over there, and they're not sure, did he die on June the 6th, or did he die in an isolated bit of combat on June the 7th, or maybe even June the 8th? So we don't know those casualties, but it's hundreds killed or wounded uh, paratroopers on that first day. 
You know, something that struck me when you were... When, this is actually the reverse of mid-May 1940 when you're talking about losing a high officer leading to stagnation in terms of response, leading to your opponent managing to you know, make a breakthrough or advance and stuff. That was exactly the reverse we saw, which allowed, allowed a great deal of the, of the German blitzkrieg through France after the death of a French general. And we had that entire episode, the May 25th, 1940 episode, which was actually called the Allied Cluster and I'm sure you bleeped the middle of that. That's the actual name of the episode on our channel. But it's got asterisks because, you know, they can handle people dying, but they can't handle swear words, yeah, yeah. apparently. <laughs> but, uh, but it was full 48 hours that allowed, allowed panzers to cross France. Because, well, people were like, well, I, I don't know what to do. Who's what's going to do? Yeah. And here yeah. it's, it's compounded by two things, of course. We have Rommel, who has gone thinking the invasion isn't going to come. He's gone back to Stuttgart to celebrate his wife's 50th birthday. And uh, we've got... Hitler, who insists on taking all the decision when it comes to the Panzer and not allowing anybody. And now we've got commanders being knocked out. Yeah. You know, there's been a lot made about the confusion. Would you say that this is actually more important than the confusion, the lack of cohesive uh, command because of absences and deaths? I would say so, yeah. And, and I think to add a little bit of weight to that as well is when you talk about the airborne, who are disorganized, is that in many ways, they know that, they're, they're prepared for that. If you ask an, an, uh, an infantry division veteran, what unit were you with? He'll invariably say, I was with the 29th, I was with the 4th, I was with the, if they're British, I was with the 3rd Division. If you ask a paratrooper, who were you with? He'll, he'll give his regiment, or maybe even his battalion, as his, I was in 3rd Battalion 506th. Right. He may even say his company, because that's how they see. They see themselves as part of a small unit. So this idea of 18 or 19 men as a stick jumping out of an aircraft and only five or six of them actually being together on the ground and fighting, they're kind of prepared for that. That's what they've been told to do. It doesn't, you don't need to be part of a mass organized unit, especially given what they're doing here. These paratroopers just got on with stuff. It's like, is there a farm on that crossroads? Yeah, there is. I don't know where I am, but why don't I just occupy that farm and stop anything moving up that road in front of that farm? Uh, is there a telephone wire there? Yes, shall I cut it down so that, that inhibits German communication, yes, I'll do that. Is there a German over there? I'll kill him because he doesn't kill me. In fact, Don Baguette, A Company 506, great friend of mine, wrote Kurahi, a screaming eagle in Normandy. He just figured, is the guy wearing gray? Yes, I'll kill him. Uh, it's gonna help with the war. It's very basic. You know, you would say to him, what was the plan of the regiment on Didis? I don't care about that. They sure they had objectives, of course, whereas I was just there to kill the guys wearing gray. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, we've just seen in our, uh, main episode here for D-Day, how San Mary Glees becomes the first point to fall during the day to the Allies, that is at least an urban area, we have Pegasus Bridge before that, but this is really the first point that a village falls to the Allied side. But did it really fall? No, not really. A flag was raised over Santa Maria Glees, the very same stars and stripes that uh, had been raised over Naples uh, some months earlier, was raised over the flag at the town, I think at 6.30 in the morning, 7 o'clock, something like that. But the town was still under fire. It was, the Germans were hitting it with mortars. There was attempted attempts to move in. I mean, that's what the Germans are doing here. The Germans, as the day progressed, are assembling an independent uh, armoured units over there to push their way towards us here. In fact, it's shown on the uh, relief here, we can move it and show that footage in a second, of the tanks coming across here to get across that bridge. Because we're talking about it from the point of view of the Americans needing to go west to cut off the Cotentan. The Germans are seeing that bridge in a very different way. They're seeing it as the way to get to Santa Mary Glees to retake that network of roads and to push their way back towards the beach and throw the Allies back in the sea. So. This is one of the areas where Santa Maria Glees is being defended, along with Nervillo Plan, another very important action just north of town, where a half Choctaw, half Scottish lieutenant in D Company 505th called Turner Brashears Turnbull III from Oklahoma. Wow. With 30 guys, he's meant to have like a whole company there, and there's Marders and Stugs and all this crap coming down the road towards him from the north, independent units, and he's holding this line across this road there with Hawkins mines on bits of string run out there and 
you know, you name it, everything but the kitchen sink is there. And for an entire day, he holds Santa Mary Glees uh, from the north there. And then eventually, when he's out of ammo, he leads the survivors back uh, to Santa Mary Glees, where they kind of regroup under Colonel Vandervoort and, and, and Krauss and the others that evening. So the Battle of Santa Mary Glees goes all through June the 6th and really keeps on going until sometime like about early afternoon the 7th, when finally they hear the rumble of half tracks and, and Sherman tanks arrive from Utah Beach. So it's a flag has been raised, but liberated. If you were a French civilian living in San Mar yeah. Mary Glees that day, you didn't feel very liberated. When you went out to get your baguette from the boulangerie, it felt more like a war zone. And, and you've been working all night putting out- Putting out fire. fire. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. That had nothing yeah. to do with the war, but yeah. So, I mean, but it's interesting because this story breaks during the day as well. I mean, it breaks very early on in the news, worldwide news, San Mar Glees has been taken. I mean, and that kind of, shows us the dichotomy between what the world is seeing yeah, from yeah, this yeah. conflict yeah. and what's actually going on on the ground. And I think a lot of soldiers were quite upset about that as well. We talked about that before at Omaha mm. Beach. Oh, I think definitely. I think that, that paratroopers were told, you've seized this, this, and this. And they're kind of saying, well, it didn't feel very seized at the time. I mean, and it was, it was disorganized at the low level, and I'm talking about this from a historian's historiography point of view of 78 years of looking at it and understanding how the piece of the jigsaw put together. I mean, for example, up on the near exit one off Utah Beach, which is where Maxwell Taylor, commanding officer of the 101st, landed near there. And he, it ends up, just because of the way the jumps have gone, there's um, Kinnard is there, Ewell is there, Taylor is there. So these are senior officers and like about three privates. And the quote is, never was so a few led by so many. <laughs> so they reversed the whole Churchill 1940 thing. So that kind of thing wasn't supposed to happen, but they just got on with it. And, and it, it felt disorganized. It felt like that they weren't maybe achieving what they were supposed to do because they weren't necessarily on the, in the town on the map they'd been told to be at. But collectively, they were securing everything they needed to do and more. Um, and, um, and I think that should be the focus of our attention, not so much all these guys got misdropped miles away from their drop zone. Another thing I want to address while I've got you here and while I've got you here is this stupid idea of hundreds of guys dying in the floods that I hear repeated again and again and again, okay? Maybe a dozen, maybe two dozen maximum members of the 82nd and 101st drowned that morning because we're talking about water that isn't very deep. Okay. In most cases, the water is going to be, in, well, in Spartacus's case, up to his shins. In how <laughs> mortal cases, up to our knees. Yeah. So you know, you'd have to be really unlucky, even with the weight of your reserve parachute and your gear there, to, to drown in water that's that's a foot deep. What is the problem of the flooding? Is the lack of heavy equipment getting out of there? Uh, this is the case here at Lafayette of guys kind of wading out of that with a fighting knife between their teeth and that's all they've got. And in fact, this, this tableau here has the bit by my feet here where it's the, the sculptor has included the rigging lines cut through with his fighting knife because you're landing there, it's the middle of the night. Your sure. parachute is being pulled across that water by the wind that's blowing there. You want to be out of that quickly. So out comes a knife and the paratroopers have a knife up here in the collar of their jumpsuits, at least another one and, and the belt and maybe a bayonet and probably another one in a pocket there. They've got blades everywhere. Okay. Out comes a blade, straight through the rigging lines, off, that's the parachute out the way. But your leg bag, if for example, you've jumped with 50 pounds of gear in a leg bag, that's the first thing you cut away because that's, that's going to... Uh, uh, make it life difficult for you to get out of that water there. So very, very few paratroopers actually drowned. But landing in the water was an absolute pain in the ass because you're leaving behind the mortar bombs you wish you had later, uh, the, uh, the C2, the Hawkins mines, all that gear there. Uh, and by the way, the, the leg bag was not a bad design. Those who watched Band of Brothers and see your car with Lipton's and Bill Garnier's cursing this thing. The British have been using the leg bag since North Africa and Italy, it's fine providing you don't cram too much gear in it you, you, and you know what you're doing with it and you have enough altitude to, to pair out the rope and so and so. What's happening on D-Day is the aircraft are moving faster than was intended because they're taking on a flak. The intended jump speed was meant to be about 105 miles an hour. You bring the C-47 down to almost stalling speed and the slower the speed, the closer on the ground the men in the stick will land beside each other. Yeah. But if you're taking ground fire, 
you have a tendency to move a bit faster. And the other thing, that another myth that we're going to bust here is when people say, oh, those damn Ninth Air Force troop carrier pilots were flying too fast. They had to fly as fast as they did because every guy in the back, universally pretty much in 82nd and 101st, knows this is the big fight coming. They've done some training jumps. They've done all these training exercises. This is the one. You're going to be thrown out of an aircraft in the middle of nowhere in French countryside. So they've been squirreling away another couple of grenades in their footlocker and another pack of ammunition for your Thompson. So these guys are boarding the aircraft with 120, 130 pounds of gear, not the 60, 70 they would have had in training. So 20 guys in an aircraft, each with 40 or 50 pounds more in gear, and that yeah. was what was happening that morning, added so much overall weight to the aircraft. When the pilot hits, and you can see this again when we bring the camera in on this here, you can see the aircraft coming in <laughs> from the rear of the Cotentan to avoid coming over the channel, avoid coming over the fleet, they come in from the back there, is when the pilots hit that coast there and eased off the speed to gradually get towards the drop zones and get down to 105 miles an hour, they can't, it's so overloaded, the, the aircraft would fall out of the sky like a stone. So the only way you can avoid crashing is push back on that stick, up, you know, rev up the engines, try and regain that altitude you've lost when you've been plummeting. So a lot of guys are jumping out of an aircraft going 160, 170 miles an hour that morning, and they're lower because they've lost altitude trying to slow down. So, you know, you're counting your 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 check, and I know paratroopers have said they, they think their feet hit the ground as they said 3,000. Wow. So you've, you've had a few seconds in the air. And that's when the leg bags didn't work because right. you just haven't had time to go and they get broken off. And the, shock, the, 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 the jump shock, the rope just snapped. Yeah. So the, there's nothing on the leg bags. It was just that the, the way they were used on D-Day wasn't good. You pointed to it right now. I mean, this is really truly a wonderful memorial. It, it, it's very illustrative of what, what went on here. Could you... Walk us through a little bit what we're, what we're looking at here. So this nice bit here shows the whole Koten Tan Peninsula, showing Cherbourg at the top, 7th Corps landing on the east coast there to move their way across the west, across the flooded area here, to, 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 to trap the Germans up there. Then the whole 7th Corps can squeeze their way up. The Germans can't escape. The Germans can't reinforce. And you know, the intention was to get across the peninsula here in like two days. It ended up taking a couple of weeks. Then this central part of the, pla uh, of the memorial here shows the causeway with the floods either side. These are explosions in the water here. And these are German tanks. Anyone who understands, they're actually French tanks. The first one was a Panzer III, there was a couple of Renaults and Hotchkisses. And they're coming across there, and there's an American here with a bazooka by the corner of the bridge, valiantly defending this approach to San Maraglis, which is, as I said earlier, the whole point of this is keeping that crossroads in San Maraglis secure by a cushion of paratroopers around it. And these guys, these Germans who've got here, have already had to get past the 508th on Hill 30. They've had to get past the 507th over there. So each movement of Germans is already losing some of their number by a few paratroopers there, a few paratroopers there. So it's like, by the time they get here, they're already reduced in size and no, no armed German gets across this bridge during those first three days of invasion. This, wow. this approach to San Maragos is held secure. James Gavin, the assistant divisional commander, was here for most of that time. Major Kellum, uh, one of the commanding, commanding officers he, uh, of, the, of the battalion, he was here. And these guys hold this area here. Here is where the paratroopers are earning their jump pay. This is where they've come here to hold this job. This is protecting Utah Beach, which is in turn protecting the entire western flank of the June the 6th invasion. So I would make a very strong case that one of the most important battles on June the 6th is the, the, the one here on the afternoon of June the 6th at about 3 p.m. when they halted these German tanks coming towards us. Okay. There's a lot more going on. When we return for the 19th hour of D-Day, we'll have a closer look at deception, intelligence, and espionage. Can't wait. But before we do that, we will take a deep dive into the explosive devices the infantry is using today. One of the most steadfast tools of the modern infantryman is the hand grenade. The concentrated power of TNT from a man's fist trumps rifles and bayonets for clearing trenches and dugouts. Effective as both an offensive and a defensive weapon, grenades can be thrown over distances without the operator exposing himself. Usually filled with TNT or its equivalents, the exploding grenade can kill 
wound, or simply disorient whole groups of men with burning chemicals, deadly blast pressure, and fragments of razor-sharp metal pieces. On the American side, the main explosive item is the Mark II Rifle and Fragmentation Grenade, introduced back in 1918 and standardized in 1920. It's called the Pineapple because the grenade's body is made out of metal segments in six rows of five who look similar to a pineapple. Once the safety cotter pin is removed, the fuse primer is ignited and the wielder has four to five seconds to hurl the grenade towards the intended target. Containing two ounces, 57 grams, of TNT, the Mark II can be thrown around 30 meters or travel 140 meters if fired from a rifle. Like the British Mills grenade, the ignited charge then causes the grenade's body to shatter and the splintered fragments fly in all directions to cause maximum damage. This is especially effective in clearing out dugouts and bunkers here on Normandy's coastline. Of course, there is always the danger that the enemy will answer with a hail of grenades of their own. Every German point of resistance has several wooden boxes of grenades stored away, ready to be used by the defenders. The traditional German Stielhandgranate has retained its iconic look, which gave it the nickname the Potato Masher. Evolving from the trench clearer of the Great War, the Stick Grenade 43 is the Wehrmacht's universal infantry weapon on the battlefields of this day of days. It's basically a hollow wooden handle combined with a thin sheet metal head that contains a bursting charge of 165 grams of Donarit explosive. Both the friction igniter and detonator assembly are screwed onto the head of the grenade and connected with a double length cord to a porcelain bead at the lower end of the handle. To arm the grenade, the soldier unscrews the metal cap at its end, pulls the porcelain bead and throws it. The friction igniter then detonates the charge after four to five seconds of delay. To take out enemy strong points or vehicles, several steel hand granate can be formed into a bundle, the Gabalte Ladung. German hand grenade doctrines usually favor the explosive power of TNT over the fragmentation power of allied grenades. For example, the Steel Handgranate 24 holds about twice the amount of TNT as the oval British Mills grenade, which gives it a lethal blast radius of around three meters. There are, of course, many different grenades, each varying in shape, size, and intended purpose. One of the most interesting is the Gammon grenade in the British arsenal. This has been specially developed to give paratroopers an explosive charge strong enough to use against armored vehicles. The Gammon grenade is basically just a lump of plastic explosive stuffed in a stockinette bag, as John Keegan describes it. But its major selling point is its sticky exterior that adheres to armor plates. Filled with up to 900 grams of plastic explosive, the Gammon is strong enough to disable most German fighting vehicles one way or another. But even without specialized grenades, there are more ways than one to use something wrong enough until it goes boom, right? American airborne units are equipped with phosphorus grenades to produce smoke. But if phosphorus burns hot enough to produce smoke, then it burns hot enough to cause dangerous wounds to flesh as well. Paratrooper Frank Brumbaugh states, we were ordered not to shoot unless it was totally in self-defense. Since I couldn't make any noise, I tossed a white phosphorus grenade down at their feet through the hedgerow. It makes a small pop when it goes off. Very little noise. It will devastate anything in the area and it can't be put out. So it's best for the Germans to keep the allies outside of grenade throwing range. General Feldmarschall Erwin Rommel has long thought the fighting during the invasion would resemble a Great War type battlefield. The space between the waterline and, and the hinterland would become a new no man's land and the same tactics would apply to fight over it. Barbed wire and metal obstacles were all well and good, but what would really pay off would be landmines. By October 1943, German engineers had already laid more than two million anti-tank and anti-personnel mines all over the coastline. Rommel then doubled, then tripled that amount. In May 1944, there were over six and a half million mines on the coastlines. The Wehrmacht's engineers are trained to handle a whole arsenal of different mines, 
booby traps, IEDs, and field exploders, the most common anti-personnel mine is the S mine. These are laid in between other obstacles, often in three rows from high to low water marks. The cylindrical S mine is activated by applying direct pressure on the igniter in the head or by pulling a trip wire attached to it. Seven kilos of pressure is enough to set it off. Then a propellant inside the base of the cylinder projects the main mine into the air. Simultaneously, the powder at the bottom of the detonator tubes is ignited and the inner cylinder detonates, causing 360 pieces of scrap, steel balls, and rods to be flung around. There are other variants of the anti-personnel mines. The Schutzen Mine 42 is a cheaper alternative. Made out of impregnated plywood and hardened cardboard, the Shu 42 weighs only half a kilo, but 200 grams of that is TNT. Another is the Glass Mine 43. It takes nine kilos of pressure to break the hardened glass pressure plate and trigger the chemical igniter. Like the wooden mines, the glass mine is much harder to detect by allied mine clearing teams. There are also all kinds of fake trigger mechanisms and nasty anti-lifting igniters just to be as much of a pain for allied engineers as possible. For killing tanks and other vehicles, the Germans deploy the larger Teller Mine 43. This cylindric mine has a large mushroom head pressure plate screwed into its igniter socket. Since a strong spring must be overcome to depress the pressure plate, the Teller mine is not set off by the weight of regular infantrymen. The minimum pressure is 230 kilos. Once that happens, then the hexagonal cap descends and pushes the striker into the main body of the igniter and sets off five kilos of TNT. A single teller mine is usually enough to wreck a wheel and axle assembly and cause heavy damage to the chassis of unarmored vehicles like trucks. For anti-tank traps, the Germans often place double teller mines. A single teller mine will most likely break the track of a Sherman or other American tank, but not necessarily damage the bogey or the suspension. A double teller mine, though, will ensure that both track and bogey wheel are totally wrecked and if lucky, we'll even break the axle shaft. But breaking tanks with mines today is not just a German concern. Although a mine is traditionally the defender's weapon of choice, they can also be handy for offensive ambushes, especially by paratroopers. The British developed the Hawkins anti-tank mine in 1942, a derivation of their sticky bomb. The main selling point of the Hawkins is its versatility. It can quickly be turned from a mine to a controlled demolition charge to a throwable grenade. Once stepped on, the weight of the enemy deforms the surface of the Hawkins and ignites its 450 grams of TNT. In the remote control version, it's simply equipped with a demolition cord and triggered by an electrical impulse. But mines are not the only tools to seal off the battlefield. Barbed wire at the beach exits and seawalls could prevent allied troops from breaking out of the killing zones, but cutting through it with shears is both time consuming and dangerous. So another more effective, more immediate solution is needed. The Bangalore was invented by the British army in India all the way back in 1912. It was basically a piece of cylindrical tube made out of metal and filled with high explosives that could then be fitted to other similar cylinders until you have a long line of explosive tubes. Each part was one and a half meters long and carried nearly four kilos of TNT, enough to cause a blast radius of three meters. The Bangalore was then simply shoved into the belt of barbed wire and triggered by an electric detonator. Although the US is often skeptical of British wartime inventions, they readily deploy the Bangalore today to blast their way through the beach defenses. One major question for both sides when it comes to D-Day is the role of armor during the invasion. Is Allied aerial supremacy enough to make short work of the approaching German panzers before they get to the beaches? Will Allied Shermans and Cromwells find a watery grave at the bottom of the channel? Well, if the answer to either of those 
is no, then small arms will not be enough to stop the advancing machines protected by centimeters of armor. Anti-tank mines and grenades are great, but the infantry needs extra tank-killing capabilities in the field. The American problem solver is the bazooka. The M1A1 anti-tank rocket launcher is a shoulder-fired, breech-loading weapon developed in mid-1942. The 135-centimeter long tube weighs only 6 kilos and can be operated by a gunner and a loader. The weapon, fired by an electric impulse coming from two batteries in the grip, has a maximum range of around 270 meters. But although the M6 heat rockets can penetrate 7.5 centimeters of armor quite reliably, the gunner has to get uncomfortably close to the enemy to be effective. If they survive long enough, though, an experienced bazooka team can fire four rounds a minute, which is generally enough to stop German armor dead in its tracks. Literally. The bazooka is also very effective in demolishing German strongpoints. Sandbags and stone walls offer little protection against the explosive force of a well-placed rocket-propelled grenade. While I'm on the topic of blasting through defenses in France, I should point out that German anti-tank capabilities have always been somewhat lackluster. In France, and then especially the Soviet Union, they encountered heavy armor that seemed impossible to penetrate with anything but their heaviest caliber. A solution came with the introduction of the hollow charge, with which German engineers have been cracking fortifications ever since the beginning of the war. The hollow charge basically channels the explosive force towards a single point of penetration. Putting two and two together and getting four, they came up with an idea to simply shoulder fire such an armor-piercing shaped charge against enemy tanks. The Panzerfaust is the first of a series of different designs called the Faustpatronen. And these Faustpatronen are dangerous weapons indeed. But not just for the guys on the receiving end. Even without a grenade attached, the propellant charge is permanently set inside the discharger tube. Once triggered, the propellant's gases shoot out from both ends of the tube, releasing spurts of chemical flames. And these spurts are strong enough to tear off limbs or rip open stomachs. There have been many deadly accidents, and an Allied directive after today forbids any Allied soldiers from using one without prior training. The Panzerfaust is pretty effective, although limited in its usefulness. On the plus side, since it does not have to compensate for recoil, the shooter can fire it from any position as long as the rear of the tube has enough room to release the gases safely. On the minus side, its effective range is under 100 meters. After encountering bazookas in the field, the Germans began further experimenting and eventually developed the Panzerschreck, the terror of tanks. It works on the same principle as the bazooka or the British Piat, firing rocket-propelled grenades through a metal tube. The Panzerfaust 60 can fire a projectile filled with 1.3 kilograms of explosives at a speed of 45 meters per second. Something innovative is the metal shield at the site that gives the operator at least some protection from the dangerous propellants. But like the American and British equivalents, the short range and cumbersome reload does not make it a very attractive weapon. If the gunner manages to hit a tank, then he better kill it, because once fired, the Panzerschreck's smoke trail betrays its position immediately. The Panzerschreck man said, It's a Sherman. We can finish him. And before I could answer, he fired. The explosion wasn't large, but I saw many fragments of metal burst off the hull immediately, and the track stopped moving. I heard crackling noises, which sounded as if it was burning. This was an incredible success for us, to have hit two tanks with two shots. And I remember feeling a sensation of great pride in this achievement. But the second tank fired on us with high explosives. The Panzerschreck man was hit by shrapnel in the shoulder and neck and began bleeding heavily. He threw away his weapon and took a grenade from his boot, handing it to me. He told me we should blow ourselves up rather than be captured. He was either very fanatical or mentally unbalanced. Of course, we saw a successful Piat attack near the beginning of this series by Benouville Bridge. To combat German fortifications, the Allies deployed more than just grenades. From the beaches, American specialists carried the M2 flamethrower into battle to deliver deadly spurts of flames into bunkers and dugouts. 
but carrying two bottles of a gasoline oil mixture and a third bottle of nitrogen on your back is an uninviting job proposition. Not only do they weigh over 30 kilos total, but the tanks are also easily punctured and sometimes even ignited by enemy action. The operator needs room to use his weapon as well and naturally has to go in first and expose himself. But once the flamethrower is put into action, the enemy has reason to panic. The M2 can engulf a target in flames at a distance of around 20 meters for seven seconds straight. Just the appearance of flamethrowers in the vicinity is often enough to make the defenders throw down their weapons and surrender as no one wants to be cooked alive. At that point, there was almost a mutiny and some men started pulling the bolts out of their rifles. Just then, the man in the observation hatch shouted, my God, they're bringing up a flamethrower. We heard the woof of the flamethrower, but the flames couldn't get through the staggered sections of the ventilation shaft. Although it turned red hot before our eyes, now there was near panic. And last, but not least, and not just because I like talking about it, enter the Goliath, a remote controlled, cross country, self-destructing mini tank. The thinking behind this futuristic design is to combine the capabilities of a tracked vehicle with the destructive power of a remotely activated explosive charge. The Goliath 303 is supposed to be a battlefield assassin. With its low silhouette, this mini tank is to lie low in small dugouts among the dunes until it's activated. A three core cable around 600 meters long connects the machine with the operator's control panel. Powered by either an electric motor or a gasoline engine, it can reach a speed of around 9 to 10 kilometers per hour, at least on level ground. Carrying up to 100 kilos of explosive, the Goliath makes his way stealthily to the target, and once in position, the operator just hits the switch from a safe distance. The firing circuit is closed, the dry cell battery in the Goliath activated, and the machine self-destructs in the name of the fatherland. Pretty cool idea. But the results have been disappointing, at least from a historian's point of view. Allied bombardment has either wrecked the Goliaths or their control stations, and those that have survived are plagued by their design issues. They are much too heavy, and they get stuck on even minor obstacles in the field. <laughs>